Countdown for blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one. Fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. Tonight's story, No Contact. It was in the year of 1982 that spacemen first discovered the Great Galactic Barrier. In the past ten years, rocket travel to the moon and the nearer planets had become commonplace. And then men fixed their sights on a more distant star, the remote planet known as Volta. Five exploratory ships went out, and none came back, each in turn disappearing mysteriously at the same vanishing point, at an invisible wall somewhere in the vast outer reaches that became known as the wrecker of spaceships, the Galactic Reef. And yet, the explorers refused to admit defeat. It was on June the 2nd, 1987, that the rocket Star Cloud made ready for takeoff, the sixth to attempt to crack the barrier and win through to Volta. Now hear this. Condition green. Two minutes to blast off. Condition green. Two minutes to blast off. Well, Lewis, this is it. I don't suppose you'll be needing the ship's doctor up here on the bridge during blast off. I think not, Smitty. There's little chance of acceleration bends in these new overdrive ships. I'll be in my office then, counting vitamin pills if you need me. It's only a few steps. Good luck, Lewis. Thank you, Smitty. Uh, Lieutenant Collier. Uh, yes, sir? If you're relieved, you'd better get down to navigation control and take over. Yes, sir. Uh, Lieutenant. Yes, sir? We've never flown together before. This is your first flight in a space vessel as big as the Star Cloud. Yes, sir, but I was trained in oversized jobs at the Naval Academy. Well, if you're half as good a navigator as your father was, you'll do fine. Thank you, sir. Did you ship out with my father? I served under him on one of the first rocket runs to the moon. I see. I almost went along on his last trip to the barrier. Um, too bad about that. Yes, sir. That's all, Collier. Paulison. Get me the ground control tower on the field. I want to talk to Colonel Harrison. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. I patched in the bridge speaker. Colonel Harrison? Yes, Captain. We're standing by for takeoff in 30 seconds. Good. Field's cleared of all personnel. We'll try to reestablish radio contact immediately after takeoff. In any event, there'll be a 24 hour ground monitor. Fine. Good luck. Hope you make it. Thank you. Bridge to navigation control. Have control. Call you. Huh? Ready, Lieutenant? Ready, Captain. The course is in the integrator for takeoff at 1,200 hours. All right. Stand by for blastoff. Bridge to engine room. Fire up your rocket chambers. Take off at exactly 1,200 hours. I'll read you off. 20 seconds. 19. 18. 17. 16. Hold it. Revoke all orders. Who turned in that alarm? Paulson, sir. We've uncovered a stowaway. Stowaway? Where? Have him brought up to the bridge. Engine room, kill your rockets and stand by. Thorson, this is Colonel Harrison in ground control. What's holding you up? Trouble. What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? There's a stowaway aboard. Stowaway? Yes, I thought your men were supposed to police this base. What's the All matter right, with you? Captain, take it easy. You know what this delay can do to us, don't you? One minute later, takeoff can throw us a million miles off course. We'll have to reintegrate the whole works. Well, look, how long do you think it'll take Don't to... bother for me for a while. I'm busy. Stupid idiot. Captain Thorson? Yes, come in, Smitty. Here's your story. I'll court martial. The... Oh, Charlie. Can you use a good radio man, Skipper? Well, I see you two have met. I've met. Skipper and me made 50 trips to the moon together. Didn't we, Skipper? Charlie, if you wanted to come along, why didn't you volunteer? I did, Skipper. They, they turned me down. 
Well, what's wrong with you? Acceleration bends. They said my arteries wouldn't stand another trip. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But they're wrong, Skipper. I, I got one more good trip in me. Listen, Skipper, you, you, you know that these green kids, they don't know the first thing about space radio operation. Now, you, you put a man like me on and I'll, I'll be getting you bedtime stories from Mars. Charlie, you know the regulations as well as I do. I can't take you much as I'd like to. Colonel Harrison will murder me for this. Well, I'm sorry, Charlie. I'll have you put aground. I'll tell you what, I'll ask Harrison to put you on his ground radio contact, and it'll seem as if you're right here with us. He won't do it, sir. Well, he'd better. I'll have him busted to corporal for letting you sneak aboard. Look, Charlie, you... Look, you better be off. Uh, Paulison. Yes, sir? I'm sending this man aground. Give him time to clear the launching platform. Yes, sir. So long, Charlie. I'm... I'm sorry. Good luck, Skipper. <laughs> I thought you were going to have him drawn and quartered. If it had been anyone else, I would have, Smitty. But Charlie, well, he's kind of special. He's been with me since my first command when we began the regular run to the moon. And if he wanted to come along this time, well, it's only through loyalty to me. You know, Lewis, I didn't realize it before, but you're almost human. Captain Dawson, Nav Control, call you. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Uh, how badly are we fouled up? Can you recalculate the course, or shall I cancel the takeoff? I've already plotted a new course on the integrator, sir. If we take off in exactly 30 seconds, we'll need to correct for only a one-degree deflection. I can do that before we breach the stratosphere. That's quick work. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Positive, sir. All right, Collier. I'm putting it in your hands. We'll blast off on your signal. Bridge to engine room. Prepare to blast off on navigator's signal. <laughs> How are we doing, Collier? Coming on the bearing, sir. That's four, three, two, zero. We've intersected the course vector. Good work, Collier. Course is corrected, sir. We're ready to go into atomic overdrive any time you say. All right. Stand by. Yes, sir. Now hear this. Now hear this. Prepare for maximum acceleration. Bridge to engine room. Kill your rockets. Rockets out. Fire up number one cyclotron. Number one ready. Fire up number two. Number two ready. Withdraw your dampening rods. Fission chamber ready. Blast tubes cleared. All generators operating at capacity. Take it over, sir. Go into overdrive at the count of zero. Three seconds, Mr. Collier. Three, two, two, one. One. Zero. Zero. How are we doing, Collier? On course, sir. She's running hot and true. My compliments, Lieutenant. This job would have done your father credit, and he was the best navigation officer I ever saw. Oh, thank you, sir. Start your gyros. Put her on robot control. All right, the bridge is yours, Mr. Collier. If you need me, I'll be in Dr. Smithson's office. Yes, sir. Well, Lewis, I see you got us off the ground. You can thank young Collier for that. Chip off the old block. You knew his father? As a matter of fact, I knew him very well. First rate spaceman. Oh, is he the one yes, who. Yes, uh... yes. He was lost in the galactic barrier on the second ship we sent out to Volta. Lewis, just what do you think this galactic barrier is? Oh, your guess is as good as mine, Doc. All I know is that five ships have gone into it, and none of them have come back out. You think it's a nit? How about Mestrovic's theory that it's a time warp in space? That the ships reach it and slip into another dimension? I think that's a lot of rubbish. My theory is that the galactic barrier is nothing more than a radioactive layer of some kind. Why do you say that? Well, we know that radar signals bounce off it like they were hitting an invisible glass wall. And we know that it destroys our ships and crews in some way. There's no other logical explanation. What makes you think we can get through it, Lewis? Because we're ready for it. The others weren't. The entire hull of this ship is completely shielded with lead. We can crack through any radioactive cloud ever detected. Besides, we're equipped with some new UHF radio devices that should enable us to maintain radio contact with Earth. Nothing can happen. Absolutely nothing. Now, who are you trying to convince? 
Well, myself, I suppose. Lewis, you've had your share of glory. First skipper to reach the moon back in 1962. You could have retired. Why are you risking this trip? Five ships are missing. Men like Prentice, Margotson, young Collier's father. I'm tired of seeing good men fed into that meat chopper. Then why are we going to Volta? We haven't any choice, Smitty. We're in a race, the kind of race where men and ships are expendable. According to the Interspace Code, the First Nation to reach Volta can claim it. Well, personally, I want no part of it. Now, Doc. I'll have to play physician, morale builder, and mother substitute for 112 slightly nervous men. And your morale doesn't sound too good, Doc. As morale officer, I can state without fear of contradiction, it is terrible. And something tells me as we approach that galactic barrier, I'm not going to be alone. Hello, Earth. Hello, Earth. Captain Thorson of the Star Cloud calling Earth. Hello, Star Cloud. Hi, Captain. Charlie. Well, I see they haven't court-martialed you yet. No, sir, thanks to you. Well, it's good to hear you. You can read us the funny papers on Sunday morning. All right. Now, how's our signal? Strong. Clear as a bell. Now, here's our log report for Colonel Harrison. You ready? Shoot. June 2nd, 1987. Four weeks out from Earth. Running through. No radiation. Operation normal. Still making our approach to the galactic barrier. That's all, Charlie. See you later. Good luck, Captain. I sure wish I was with you. How's the morale, Smitty? The men know we're getting closer to the barrier. They're beginning to show a little tension, Lewis. Well, how's their physical condition? Any sickness? About half the crew has come down with space blues. Ah, I was afraid of that. Are they bad? Same as usual. Lips and hands with a bluish cast. Eyes are sensitive to infrareds. Yeah, I don't know. When I first started flying these tin cans, nobody ever heard of space blues. Well, now there's a theory it's caused by the terrific acceleration of atomic overdrive. The change in gravity affects the circulation. Hmm. What do you think? I think it's psychosomatic. I've noticed that the same men who get space blues under tension on a ship tend to get blue coloration back on Earth when they're upset. I guess it's just an occupational disease of space now. Uh -huh. You think it's just uh, nerves, then? Well, young Collier's got a bad case. I, I think it's tension from overwork. Maybe he needs some vitamins. Lewis, when will you realize that vitamins are not a panacea for all the troubles of mankind? Sir, I understand that you've relieved me from duty. Well, Dr. Smithson says you aren't looking very well, Collier. I'm giving you a rest. Sir, I feel perfectly able to continue. Your lips are as blue as Minnetonka. Captain... I'd like to remain at my post. Don't be foolhardy, Lieutenant. I'm not being foolhardy, sir. I have a special personal reason for wanting this expedition to reach Volta. Your father? Yes, sir. You think he might still be alive? I have to find out what happened, sir. I, I, I think I understand. Very well, Collier. Report back to duty. What's the reading, Paulison? Uh, we're getting a plus five radar bounce now. Coming off the barrier almost as fast as we sent it out. What's the interval? Two seconds. Shortening steadily. This rate will hit the wall in the next few minutes. All right. Alert the crew. Sound general quarters. Now hear this. Condition red. We are now approaching the galactic barrier. All hands to stations. All radiation detectors to be fully manned. Full security will prevail until further notice. That is all. Uh, Paulison. Yes, sir? The radar bounces up to plus six. We'd better try to make final contact with Earth. Is Sparks still trying to raise the base? Uh, yes, sir, but he's not having much luck. Huh? Seems to be some interference. Uh, that's the radio room now. Yes? You got him? Well, cut in on the bridge speaker. Captain will take it from here. Hello? Star Cloud to Earth. Can you hear me, Earth? Hello, Skipper. I can barely read you. 
We're getting heavy static from Sunspot. That's not Sunspot's, Charlie. We're right on top of the galactic barrier. Getting a plus... No, a plus seven radar bounce. Expect to hit the barrier almost any second now. Good luck, Skipper. If we crack the barrier and come through still in one piece, I'll try to get back to you on the high-frequency band. Got you, Skipper. Don't worry. I'll be waiting. So long, Charlie. So long, Star Cloud. Must be getting awfully close now, Captain. Echo's bouncing back so fast it's almost beating the signal. When they go inside, hold on to your hat. That's when we run into the wall. Any second. Hold on. Here goes nothing. Here it comes. Captain. (laughs) Nothing happened. We, We made it. We made it, Captain. No radiation, no time warp, no nothing. Now, the, the crew's gone crazy, sir. Let them. They've earned it. Doc, can you break out a few bottles of snake bite serum for medicinal purposes? I sure can, Lord. This calls for a celebration. How's your morale now? It couldn't be better. How's yours? Couldn't be better. The... Condition red. Condition, Condition red. red. Radiation, Radiation detected. detected. Condition, Condition red. red. Radiation detected. Holy mackerel. Look at the needle on that indicator. Mollison. Mollison. Yes, I see it, Captain. Picking radiation like crazy. What's it like? Well, it's a strong impulse. What kind? I don't know. It's too long for a cosmic ray, too short for UHF. Whatever it is, sir, the ship is lousy. Well, track it down, triangulate it, and make it fast. I want a directional fix. Yes, sir. Engine room. Yes, sir. We're picking up radioactivity. Is the fission chambers? No leak here, sir. Check your gauges. Nothing here, Captain. Must be coming from outside. Damage control. Is our lead shield leaking radiation? We'll keep at it. Wallison, how are you doing? Uh, I've got a fix, Captain. Well, what is it? Well, I'll have to recheck my figures. Well, hurry it up. Angle is correct, but now, I... Come I on, don't... man, for Pete's sake. Where's the radiation coming from? Sir, it's... It's coming from inside the ship. Well, that's impossible. No, sir, I've checked it twice. Well, it's got to be the engines, then. If it is, sir, we're finished. Engine room. Yes, sir. That radiation must be in the overdrive pile. No, sir, it isn't here, sir. Are you certain? Yes, sir. All right, keep checking. Well, there's only one thing left to do. Paulison, get a Geiger counter. We're going to start combing this ship inch by inch. Yes, sir. All right, turn it on. Yes, sir. All right. Ready, Captain. We'll check the atomic guns first. Come on. We'll uh, cut through the officer's quarters here to ordnance. Now, turn here. Oh, well, wait a minute, sir. Huh? What is it? The signal's weaker now. Yeah. Let's go back. Hold it. Hold it. Seems strongest right about here. Well, it doesn't make sense. Whose cabin is this? Lieutenant Collier's. Collier? Oh, he's down in the nap control, sir. Oh, I'll try the door. Well, it's not locked, sir. Oh, it's in here, all right. Listen to that counter. Strongest over here. Open that wall cabinet. It's locked, oh, sir. Oh, smash it. Oh, shut off that Geiger counter. Now, what do you make of this, Paulison? Well, it looks like some sort of portable transmitter, sir. Must be foreign manufacture. I, I, I don't recognize the calibration symbols at all. I, I, I've never seen anything like it. Which raises a small question. What is Lieutenant Collier doing with a transmitter in his cabin? I don't know, sir. Well, I intend to find out, Paulison. Get down to nav control and bring Collier up to the bridge on the double. Well, hadn't we better find some way to shut this thing off first? Uh, I know a way. <laughs> Lieutenant Collier, I'm going to ask a few simple questions, and I want a few simple answers. Yes, sir. What were you doing with a transmitter in your cabin? Transmitter, Captain? Oh, you know nothing about it. Oh, no, sir, I don't. Do you recognize these calibration symbols? No, sir. Can you think of how it might have been placed in your cabin without your knowing it? No, sir, unless someone came in while I was on duty. Would that have been possible? I suppose so, if someone had a key. I found your cabin door unlocked. Well, I meant a key to the wall cabinet. I... I didn't say the wall cabinet. Well, I... Uh... You what, Lieutenant? How could you have known it was in the wall cabinet? Well, I just assumed, sir. Lieutenant Collier, I find it hard to believe you would lie. Having known and respected your father. Having observed the way you handle your job. However, I intend to get to the root of this thing. May I have your wristwatch, Lieutenant? Sir? Your wristwatch. Yes, sir. Paulison, turn on that Geiger counter. Yes, sir. Hold this watch next to it. Yes, sir. 
That's all. Lieutenant, if you hadn't any close contact with that transmitter, how do you explain the radioactivity of this watch? Well, I... I don't, sir. I think you'd better. To whom were you sending those signals? Condition red. Condition red. There's your answer, Captain. What is this, Collier? Alien spaceship approach. Alien spaceship approach. Collier, who's aboard that ship? All right, now talk. Very well, Captain. My mission seems completed. Your mission? Are you admitting that you're an agent of a foreign power? I am stating it. What nation? No nation, Captain. What? I am an agent of the Voltan government. Oh, what? The government of the planet of Voltan. You're crazy. Are you so stupid, Captain? Did you think your people are the only ones who can invade another planet? What do you mean? We've had agents operating on Earth since 1945. I don't believe you. What do you think happened to those five ships, Captain? Where do you suppose we got our information? Your language, your culture, family background. Yeah, your appearance, you, you, you look like... Like Commander Collier? Well, is that so surprising, Captain? You see, Captain, we had a living model. I ought to kill you. That would be very foolish, Captain. I would advise you to surrender without delay. Alien ship now coming in water range. I'll deal with you later, Collier Paulison. Yes, sir. Put this man in irons, take him away. Don't worry, sir. We'll take good care of him. Carpenter, Robinson. <laughs> Gunnery. Gunnery Richardson. What's the range? 10,000 meters. They're closing fast. Put your guns on radar tracking. Tracking. Coming on the bearing. Fire. Fire, Richardson. Richardson, did you hear me? Fire! What's the matter down there? Did you hear me? Richardson, answer me. It's no what? use to shout, Captain. Collier, how did you get loose? Where's Paulison? Lieutenant Paulison is dead. All stations! Lieutenant Collier has escaped. Seize men! Don't waste your breath. Your men can't hear you, Captain. What? Those still alive are my men. Door line! No, Captain. Every ship that has ever left Earth was controlled by a Voltan crew. That's impossible. Those were hand-picked men. Hand-picked by us. I don't believe you. No? Then why not call for help? Carpenter, Robinson, Haley, report. You see, Captain? Captain. Carpenter! Robinson! Haley! It's quite useless, Captain. I would advise you to sit very quietly and do nothing. Very well, Collier. You've beaten us. What now? The ship will be taken to Volta for, shall we say, further experimentation. I see. Of course, there's one thing you hadn't counted on. Just what is that, Captain? Carpenter! Are you in there, Lieutenant Carpenter? They can't all be dead. There must be one alive. Smitty, Dr. Smithson! Smitty! Smitty, what have they done to him? Lewis, oh, I... dirty... I, I, uh, don't talk. No, I must lean, lean closer. It's not much time. Lewis, space blues. Space blues? What is it, Smitty? What are you trying to tell me? All men with space blues. Voltans. Yeah, hello, let me help you. No, Lewis, get message back to Earth. Voltan, fifth column. Watch out for it. Smitty. Oh, Smitty. Captain Thorsten. Captain Thorsten, Captain Thorsten you, can't you can't hide from us from now. Come, come back, back to the bridge and surrender. surrender. Or my, my men, men will, will come, come and get, get you. you. Hello. Hello. Star Cloud calling Earth. Oh, please, God, let me get through. It's too late. Hello. Star Cloud to Earth. 
Come in, please. Come in, please. Hello. Hello. Stark onto Earth. Captain Thorson calling. Charlie, come in, please. Hurry. Hello. Oh, hello. Can you hear me, Charlie? Skipper, is that you? Are you getting my signal? It's coming in a little louder now, Skip. Keep sending. Oh, my God. Now, look, Charlie, listen to me. Not much time. Get word to Colonel Harrison. Crew mutinied. Most of crew members, Fultons. What? Fultons. Spell that. V-O-L. Fultons. That's right. They're from the planet Volta. Skipper. Skipper, are you all right? Now, Charlie, this is serious. They'll be here any second. Now, listen. They have a fifth column on Earth. They're planning to invade you. You mean it? Of course I mean it. Tell Harrison, posing as humans. You can detect them by space blues. You got that only Fultons get space blue. Charlie, did you hear me? Space blue. I get you. They're breaking in, Charlie. I'm defending you. Warn everybody. Captain. They, they've opened the door. So long, Charlie. Tell Hannah. Captain. <laughs> Captain Thorson. Hello. Hello, Star Cloud. What's the trouble, Sergeant? I was just trying to raise the Star Cloud, Colonel. I had any luck? No, sir. No contact. No contact, eh? No, sir. Nearly an hour since they hit the galactic barrier. I don't understand why they haven't tried to get a message back. No, sir. Neither do I. Oh, all right. I'll take over for a while. Yes, you you do that, sir. It's all yours. Right. Oh, and Charlie, uh, you better go out and get yourself some coffee. You look a little blue around the gills. Tonight, X-1 has brought you No Contact, written by George Lefferts from an original story of Lefferts and Ernest Kinoy. Featured in the cast were Louis Van Ruten as Captain, Donald Buca as Collier, Wendell Holmes as Charlie, and Bill Griffiths, Bill Smith, Matt Crowley, and Ken Williams, your announcer, Don Pardo. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is a transcribed NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week. When you want to take over a world, you naturally look for its weak point, some way to catch its people off guard. We live in a world where everybody loves a parade, a world of press agents and publicity stunts. But who would ever dream that invaders from outer space would take advantage of that weakness and actually hire a press agent to advertise their coming? Who would believe it was anything but just another publicity gag? At least, not until the terrible moment when it was already too late. The moment of... X minus one. Countdown for a blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two... X minus one. Fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents... X minus one. If you wanted to take over our world with a minimum amount of resistance and trouble, how would you go about it? Tonight we'll tell you how, with a strange and chilling story by George Lefferts, The Parade. Uh, Mr. Sid Ryan. The same? My name is Luchar. I am a Martian. Ah, pleased to meet you, Mr. Lu... Uh, what was that again? A Martian. As in Orson Welles? Precisely. <laughs> I'm a Rotarian myself. Sit down. Thank you. Uh, now that we've had our little joke, Mr. Luchar, what can Publicity Associates do for you? I am interested in obtaining publicity. 
It has been my observation that advertising and publicity are the very backbone of earthly civilization. Spoken like a true Martian, Mr. Lucha. Now, if you'll tell me the name of the client... The client, of course, will be the Martians. You don't give up, do you? Give up? The gag, I mean. Oliver! Yes, Mr. Ryan? This is Mr. Lucha. Oh, how do you Mr. do... Mr. Lucha claims to be a Martian... Take him outside, will you, Oliver? I am happy to see, Mr. Ryan, that my telling you I am a Martian has approximately the effect I guessed it would. I believe we can do business. I have here cash retainer of $5,000. Five thousand... Oliver, take a look at that wad of lettuce. It's the real stuff, Mr. Ryan. And my client is prepared to spend many times that amount. Oh, sit down, Mr. Lucha. Oliver, get the client a cigar, the 50-cent box. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, now, what can I do for you, sir? I wish you to manage a publicity campaign. A very large and important campaign. Is the product established, or is it something brand new? Something quite new. Now, what would you judge the most effective type of campaign? Well, if the client has a lot of dough to throw around, a suspense campaign is best. First, you place ads in the paper saying... Watch this space. Then about a week later, you run an ad saying XYZ or PDQ, and you get people guessing what it means. Then finally, when you've teased them enough, you bust loose and unveil the product. Excellent. We will conduct a suspense campaign. Of course, in this kind of campaign, secrecy is very important. Once the name of the product leaks out, it spreads like wildfire, and the whole campaign is kafloppo. Quite so, quite so. The utmost secrecy. Ah, uh, you realize, of course, these things cost like crazy. Would, say, $1 million cover expense? Hey, come again? I said, would $1 million cover it? Why, well, yes, I am at... You did say uh, a million. I understood that you have handled some very large accounts. Of course, if this is too big... No, no, not at all, not at all. I, as a matter of fact, I seldom touch anything less. Right, Oliver? Huh? Oh, oh, oh of course, that's right, Mr. Ryan. Absolutely right, <clears throat> yes, sir. You will begin, then, by saturating the newspapers, the radio, the streetcars, with a very simple statement. Uh, what's that? I will write it on a card. Here you are. The Martians are coming. Say, that's not a bad teaser. Got that, Oliver? Yes, sir. The next ad will read... June 1st is Martian Day. June 1st is Martian Day. Uh, what happens on June 1st? The parade takes place. What parade? I wish you to arrange a parade up Fifth Avenue. You mean like the Macy Parade? Exactly. Except that the theme will be the world of tomorrow, the Martian world. My client would like it to be a gay affair. Balloons, clowns, pennants, pretty drum majorettes. Say, that sounds terrific. I might be able to interest the department stores in a tie-in. Fine. The parade will climax the campaign. On June 1st, the product will be unveiled. Good enough. Uh, by the way, Mr. Luchard, just uh, what is the product? Uh, what are we selling? Oh, no, Mr. Ryan. Secrecy, remember? Yeah, but after all... Mr. I... Ryan, all will be revealed to you in good time. For the moment, let us say that we are selling a concept. A concept? The concept of invasion from Mars. <laughs> Sorrel Talent Agency. Uh, Sammy Sorrel, please. Uh, this is Sammy. Uh, this is Sid Ryan over at Publicity Associates. Listen, Sammy, how are you fixed for midgets? I got midgets. Fine. I need 40 midgets for a parade. 40. June 1st. And listen, Sammy, I want them dressed in little space suits. In little... Uh, you, you know, like men from Mars. Mars. Okay? And I want some movie extras. Uh, maybe 50 of them. 50. Also rigged up like men from Mars. Make them look gruesome. Got that? Gruesome. Also, I need some horses with pretty girls on top of them. Uh. Maybe you can get that bunch from Maroney's Traveling Circus, the one we booked for the Fireman's Parade in Albany last year. Yeah, I'll try, Sid. Never mind the expense. Just get me the talent. It sounds like you landed a big client there. Who is it? <laughs> it's a secret. I gotta hang now. Call me back, Sammy. Right. 
Ah, how you doing, Oliver? Oh, fine, Mr. Ryan, just fine. I got a hundred small boys paste in little stickers. The Martians are coming on the subway platforms. Good. We got full-page ads in all the dailies. Good. And ten-second spot announcements on every local station. Good. It's costing a fortune. Good. The more it costs, the bigger our percentage. Spend like you were going to the electric chair, Oliver. Yes, sir. How are you making out in the parade? If it comes off, it'll be the biggest thing since Bonham invented the midget. I've got Macy's, Gimbal's, and Sacks to contribute floats. Everything is built around the Martian theme, see? Even the horses will have long feelers attached to them and funny-looking extra legs. It'll be sensational. That sounds fine, only... Uh... Only what? Mr. Ryan, we don't even know what we're selling. Oliver, my boy, do you think old Sid Ryan has been sitting here spending all this moolah and not putting two and two together? You mean... You know who Luchar represents? Just by accident, understand? I have learned that Century Pictures is making a big new epic. One of those expensive pictures they make in secret and then spring on the public because they don't want the other studios to get the jump on them. What's the picture? A space opera titled Invasion from Mars. Get it? Oh. Oh, I begin to see. Also, by mere coincidence, it's supposed to have its premiere sometime around June 1st. You follow me? Yes, but... Uh... Mr. Ryan, Century has an exclusive contract with New Features Syndicate for all their publicity. Suppose Century Pictures doesn't like the way New Features is handling their stuff. They want to get out of the contract, but New Features says no, so they have to get around the contract. A man named Luchar, client unknown, starts publicizing the Martian invasion. <laughs> Need I go further? Oh, I don't know, Mr. Ryan. Sounds pretty far-fetched to me, but I don't know. That's what I like about you, Oliver. You're so innocent. <laughs> Now, let me talk to Commissioner Patrick, please. Sid Ryan. Hello. Commish, Sid Ryan. Oh. How are you, Ryan? Fine. What is it this time? You want to drop a man off the Empire State Building into a teacup full of water? The answer is no. <laughs> also, we're not arresting any fan dancers. You know I don't handle fan dancers. I want a permit for a parade. June 1st, 5th Avenue. It's a Sunday. There's no traffic. Now, look, Ryan. I... Macy's gets a permit. Gimbel's gets a permit. The American Legion gets a permit. The Sons of Aaron march every time Morton Downey sings the wearing of the green. Oh, don't give me a hard time, Patrick. This is too big. I have the 5th Avenue Merchants Association behind me. <sighs> okay. Fill out the forms. I'll pass them along to the license commissioner. That's my boy. By the way, what's the occasion for this parade? Oh, don't you read the papers, Patrick? June 1st is Martian Day. How is the campaign going, Mr. Ryan? Like wildfire, Mr. Lucha, like wildfire. Everybody and his brother is going along with the gag. Yesterday, we distributed 50,000 Martian hats to school kids. I got some of the merchants doing World of Tomorrow displays in their windows. Every big novelty manufacturer in town is climbing on the bandwagon. They want to get into the parade with floats, giveaways, anything. Everybody smells a buck to be made. I wouldn't be surprised if the mayor himself declared Martian Day. I've even arranged for Commissioner Patrick to accept a $50,000 check for the policeman's benevolent fund from the man from Mars. Oh, it's terrific, terrific. My blood pressure's up to 200. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I, uh, I understand Century Pictures spent over a million bucks making that space opera. I beg pardon? Oh, come, come, Mr. Lucha. Sid Ryan wasn't born yesterday, you know. I know who our client is, even if you don't admit it. You do? <laughs> Always thinking that's me. Well, as long as you know, let's keep it to ourselves, shall we, Mr. Ryan? As you once remarked, when these things leak out, it destroys the surprise and ruins the effectiveness of the campaign. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ken Daly speaking to you from our portable transmitter atop the reviewing stand for the much-heralded Martian Parade on Fifth Avenue. It's a beautiful sunlit day here in New York, a perfect day for a parade, and the streets are packed with thousands of spectators all eager to find out what this is all about. There's an air of shrill expectancy. Some of the kids and their parents have been camped on the curbstone since early this morning to be sure of ringside seats when the so-called Martians pass by. I've, uh, I've just had word from Saul Brown up at Central Park Mall that the Martians have landed from big pink balloons. And uh, now while we're waiting for the arrival of the parade, 
We brought some people up to our microphone to tell you their reactions to this most spectacular of all publicity stunts. That's right. Come on. Uh, what's your name, madam? Uh, Miss Ada Shackley. A little louder, please. Miss Ada Shackley. Uh-huh. And where are you from, Mrs. Shackley? Columbus, Ohio. I see. And I, I see you have your family with you, too. Uh, two little curly-headed blonde boys. Uh, are you in New York on vacation? We came for the Shriners Convention with their daddy. Uh, well, uh, what do you think of Martian Day, Mrs. Shackley? Well, it all seems very strange to me, but the boys have been pestering me to watch it, so we've been standing here two hours. I, I can't make head or tail of it. Well, uh, neither can a lot of other people, Mrs. Shackley. But judging by the thousands here today, there's a lot of curiosity. Curiosity killed the cat, folks say. <laughs> well, let's hope not. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Shackley. Mr. Ryan. Uh, yeah, which of them? Yeah. Uh, Ryan, Ryan. Right. right. And uh, this is Mr. Sid Ryan, ladies and gentlemen, the publicity man who's the brains behind the Martian Day stunt. Hello, Sid. Good morning, Kenneth. Uh, easy, easy. Not so close to the mic. Oh, sorry, sorry. Hey, Sid, you've certainly lifted the lid this time. Looks like it, doesn't it? Sid, there's been a great deal of speculation as to exactly what all this is leading up to. I've heard some folks say it's a big war bond drive. Uh, others think it's just to stimulate local business. <laughs> and, uh, look, I, I understand in the trade itself, the smart, smart money says you're building for the premiere of Century's forthcoming extravaganza, Invasion from Mars. Now, come clean. Can you tell us what the real story is? Ah, uh, I can. I'd like to, but honestly, I can't. Oh, man of mystery, eh? Are you going to watch the parade from the stand here? No, I can't. I can't stand noise. I'm going out to my office and watching <laughs> government. Well, thank you, Sid Ryan. And good luck. And here they come, ladies and gentlemen. The first units of the big Martian parade. Swinging down Fifth Avenue with fanfare, colored streamers, music, confetti, floats, all the traffics of a Mardi Gras. And here in the vanguard is a whole, a whole troop of little midgets in weird-looking pink and blue spacesuits carrying blue Goldberg weapons with signs painted on them. Let's see, I, I can read one which says... Atomic Blaster. Another one has a placard reading, We're, uh, we're Martian through Georgia. <laughs> and here come the clowns, laughing and falling all over each other. They're giving free sugar candy to the kids along the way. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is a happy, laughing crowd along Fifth Avenue today. A true reflection of the great sense of humor and good nature that makes America the place it is. This is promised as the climax of the show. And now a great hush has fallen over the crowd. It's quite a sight to see these thousands of people standing here expectantly, hearing only the great regular sigh of their mass breathing. And now here they come, ladies and gentlemen, the Martians, marching in booted, helmeted ranks, row after row of them. Why, this is an impressive sight, ladies and gentlemen, and a rather serious contrast to the rest of the joyous slapstick parade we've witnessed. There are perhaps, oh, 200 tall, broad-chested men dressed in metallic gray spacesuits with thick glass visors drawn across their faces. Each is holding an ominous-looking ray gun at the ready position. They're marching in absolute silence, keeping step perfectly, as though some mute, unspoken command were marking time for them. The, the crowd seems rather grim and serious now. Perhaps they're reminded of the actuality of war and possible invasion. They stand solemnly, silently, watching. Even the children are awed. And now the first ranks of the Martians are moving past us, down Fifth Avenue toward the reviewing stands at the square. No one moves. What's that? What's happening? Oh, there are a woman, a woman, ladies and gentlemen. She dashed out into the street. For what reason, I don't know. She attempted to lift the visor of one of the Martian spacesuits, but just as she reached the Martian, she fell forward in a dead faint. 
I tell you, I've never felt such mass tension in a crowd as we're experiencing here right now, today. All sorts of rumors have begun filtering back through the audience. There are excited whispers of she's dead, she fainted, and now an undercurrent of, what? They're really Martians. This is an example of how a single incident can precipitate mass hysteria, ladies and gentlemen. I tell you, it's a mighty reassuring sight to see the blue uniforms of New York's finest spaced every 10 feet or so along the avenue. Somehow, I, I can't explain it, this incident has begun to work on what was a moment ago a happy, carefree crowd, and the complexion is changing. Did you see that? A woman fainted. Of course I saw it. What do you suppose she saw? Oliver, old man, did I ever tell you you were too naive for this business? But that young woman ran out into the streets to get a close look at the Martians, and then she screamed and fainted dead away. I'm well aware of that, Oliver, since I paid her 50 bucks to do it. What? The dramatic moment, Oliver, the stock and trade of the good publicity man. Relax. Holy smokes, you sure think of everything. Yeah, for my share of this deal, roughly $100,000, I can afford to think of everything. Uh, shut the window. Don't you want to see the finish? We'll go down to the reviewing stand for the finish. Right now, I want to make a phone call. Uh, by the way, where's Lucha? I haven't seen him. Well, he'll be around. Boy, those Martians sure look like the real thing. How would you know the real thing if you saw it, Oliver? Well, gee, I, I don't know. Uh, close the window, Oliver. Oh, yes, Mr. Ryan. Talent agency. Sammy, this is Sid Ryan. Say, listen, Sid, I was going to call you. I'm awful sorry about those Martians. What do you mean, sorry? They're terrific. No, don't joke, Sid. I mean it. Well, I mean it, too. They're great, great. Are you in the bag? Never felt better. Well, you mean it, don't you? Of course I mean it. What is this? There are Martians in the parade? About 150. Of course, I only ordered 50, but Sid, under the circumstances... Sid. Well, what is it? Sid, don't you know? I couldn't get you a single movie extra. There's a studio strike in New York. I was going to call you, but I figured... Hey, wait a minute. I... Where'd these guys come from if you didn't hire them? Well, I don't know. Uh, maybe Oliver... Oh, hold on. Oliver? Yes, Mr. Ryan? Did you hire those Martians? No, sir, I... Sammy, this is on the level, isn't it? Honest, Sid, I... Okay, Sammy, I'll call you back. What's the matter, Mr. Ryan? I don't know. I just don't know. I've got to locate Lucha. What's Century Pictures number? Mr. Ryan, this is Sunday. Oh, yeah, well, get me their publicity director, Marty Sanford, at home. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Thanks. Sanford. Uh, Marty, this is Sid Ryan. Oh, hello, Sid. How's the uh, name? Fine, fine. Uh, listen, Marty, this is dead serious. On the level, get it? What's wrong? I've got to locate Lucha. Uh, Lou who? Lucha, come on now, Marty. This is life and death. The guy you sent over to hire me for the invasion picture. Invasion picture? Invasion from Mars, the space opera. Are you, Batty? Marty. That picture was shelved last month. What? Sure, back in the can. Too expensive and too fantastic. The big shots decided you can't sell a Martian invasion to the American public. And I never heard of a guy named Luke. Mother of heaven. What is it, Mr. Ryan? You look terrible. Well, that's too fantastic. What's too fantastic, Mr. Ryan? Is something wrong? Open that window. I want another look at those Martians. Yes, sir. Look at them. Oliver, you were in the army. Could 150 movie extras learn to march like that and say... 24 hours? Not in 24 days, Mr. Ryan. Not a second's hesitation. Not one other step. Look at the way they carry those ray guns at the ready. The only other time I've seen troops march like that was in a film of the Nazi storm troops marching through the streets of Paris. See those chests on? That's pride. Sheer, arrogant pride. Look at those chins. That's contempt. Nobody could act like that. Mr. Ryan! Oliver, get down there. Find that woman who fainted. Her name's Gloria Montex. Get her up here. Make it fast. <laughs> here she is, 
Mr. Ryan, I, I can't get much sense out of her. Stay away from me. Gloria, it's me, Sid Ryan. Oh, don't kid me. You're a Martian. Gloria, settle down. No, you're wearing a mask. Baby, it's me, Sid. And underneath, it's, it's awful. It's all big green eyes and those, those feelings like, like a catfish. Baby, snap out of it. Listen, what happened down there? You ran out and screamed like I told you, but the fainting, that wasn't in the act. Oh, go away, please. Go away. What'd you see? Oh, no, please. It's too awful. Please, please. Just one question, baby. Inside that helmet, what'd you see? <laughs> you won't get anything out of her, Mr. Ryan. She needs a doctor. Okay, Oliver, I've heard enough anyway. You take care of Gloria here. Get her a drink. Where are you going? To see the commissioner. We gotta stop this parade before things begin to happen. <laughs> Hey, Ryan, what's the beef? Listen, Patrick, I don't know what it is, see, but something's wrong. You gotta stop that parade. Now, I suppose you'd like the riot squad. That would get you a front page spread on every paper in town. Honest, you publicity guys give me a pay. This may be a matter of life and death. Oh, sure, sure. Look, Ryan, I've got no time for your cheap publicity gags. I'm a busy Listen, man. Listen, I'm trying to tell you I don't know where these Martians came from, who they are, anything about them. All I want you to do is stop the parade and make sure they're on the level. Uh-uh, Ryan, I'm wise to your tricks. Now, if you let the sergeant show you up... You out, won't do it, huh? An honest citizen appeals for protection, and you refuse it. I most emphatically do. Now beat it. All right, Patrick. I'll go right to the mayor's office. I'll have you busted flatter than a fried egg. Go ahead. I'm sure his honor will be glad to toss you out on that phony nickel-plated skull of yours. You heard me, Ryan. You cannot see the mayor. Adolf, please. This isn't a gag. I don't want publicity. All I want to do is maybe prevent something horrible from happening. In case you don't know it, wise guy, something horrible is already happening. A couple hundred little kids are in the hospital with tomaine poisoning from that phony Martian candy you passed out. Or didn't you know? I didn't. We've got to stop that parade. Sure. Sure, you'd like nothing better than to start a panic now. Maybe a few hundred people would get trampled to death. Think of the newspaper space that would get you and your product. I won't stand for this, Adolf. You won't have to, because you're going to get out of here right now. Go on, beat it, get out. You and your publicity stunts make me sick to my stomach. Oliver? Oliver, where are you? Uh... Oliver? Oliver! It is useless what? to scream at him, Mr. Ryan. Your friend is quite dead. Lucha. He wanted to run to the police with some story about a Martian invasion. I found it necessary to restrain him. Restrain him, you stinking murderer. Now, now, Mr. Ryan, collect yourself. After all our planning, it wouldn't do to have everything spoiled, now would it? Lucha, start talking and talk fast, because when you get through, I'm going to take you apart piece by piece. What's this all about? But surely you know, Mr. Ryan, after all, you've been publicizing it for months. Listen, you... Please do not interrupt. You see, before colonizing your planet, we Martians sent advanced scouts to study your habits, your weaknesses... We found that the people on Earth are predominantly conditioned by advertising and publicity. And so, we conceived the idea of treating our entire invasion as a vast publicity stunt. Clever, huh? After all, Mr. Ryan, who would suspect an invader who advertised his invasion in the newspaper, invited the public to his surprise attack, and spent millions publicizing his plan? Holy jumping catfish. You've done very well. Then... There was no product. Ah, but there is a product. The product is death. What are you trying to do, Lucha? We Martians are a humane people, Mr. Ryan. We do not like to destroy thousands where a few hundred would suffice. In exactly two minutes, our troops will treat the world to a spectacle of death which will bring the rest of your planet to its knees in horror. Nations will clamor to surrender. Perhaps, Mr. Lucha, but not if I can help it. You drink! drink. Yes, please? Operator, this is Mr. Ryan. Get me the field telephone on the reviewing stand of the Martian Day Parade. Hurry. Anyone in particular? Just hurry! Reviewing stand, Sergeant Cassidy. Get me Commissioner Patrick. Hello. 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 You'll have to talk loud. I want Commissioner Patrick. Oh. Patrick, Patrick! Wait, wait a minute. Th things are quieting down. Uh, now, what was it you wanted? This is Ryan. I have to talk to the commissioner. It's a matter of life and death. Oh, I'm sorry. You can't talk to him now. The chief Martian is presenting the PBA check to him. The Martians are going to fire a salute. Listen, you got to stop him. 
What? Stop him! I'm sorry, Mr. Ryan. You I... idiot, the worst is going up! This is the operator. I'm sorry, Mr. Ryan, you've been cut off. I can't seem to get them back. Doesn't matter, operator. Nothing matters now. Tonight, X-1 has brought you The Parade, an original story written by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Joseph Curtin as Ryan, Joe DeSantis as Luchar, Alexander Scorby as Daly, Agnes Young as The Woman, Ellen Deming as Gloria, John Thomas as Oliver, Arthur Anderson as Sammy, Wendell Holmes as The Commissioner, and William Keene as Sanford. Your announcer, Don Pardo. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and it's a transcribed NBC Radio Network production. Next week, the tables turn. Instead of Martians invading Earth, we bring you a tale of men invading Mars. Ray Bradbury's brilliant short story entitled, Mars is Heaven. Suppose you were a member of the first rocket ship crew to land on Mars, but instead of seeing Martians, you find that you've landed in a town that looks just like home, that all your dead relatives and friends are there to greet you, so that as incredible as it may seem, you think you're really in heaven. That is, you think so, right up to the fatal moment, the moment of X minus one. Join the Abbots on another baffling mystery tonight over most NBC radio stations. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one. Fire! From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. Tonight's story, Mars is Heaven. When the first space rocket lands on Mars, what will we find? Only the ruins of a dead and deserted planet? Or will there be life, intelligent life, in some strange form that we can only imagine? Will we be welcomed with open arms? Or will the Martians treat us as invaders? Only one thing is certain. Someday, a giant metal ship will take off from Earth to travel through the black velocities, the silent gulfs of space, to descend at last into the darkness of the upper Martian atmospheres. And on that day, man will finally know the answers. The day we first land on Mars. Now I hear this, now I hear this, approaching critical deceleration. Fasten gravity suits, stand by to land. There it is. We've intersected the course vector, sir. All right, Mr. Lustig. Over to manual control. Aye, sir. Masters, sound general quarters. Aye, sir. Mr. Lustig, what do you make of the terrain? There seems to be a heavy ground, Miss Captain. We won't be able to use the infrared lights. And we'll have to come in on radar. Isn't that a little risky, sir? Landing in the dark? I'd rather run the danger of a blind landing, Lieutenant. 
and come in without the cover of darkness. Remember, we don't know what kind of reception is waiting for us down there. Airspeed 500. Altitude now 4,000. Bridge to engine room. Stand by for deceleration. Fire forward tubes one and three. Steady as she goes, Mr. Lustig. As she goes, sir. Airspeed 100. Altitude 1,000. Radar indicates a level stretch dead ahead, sir. Skids down. Skids check. Altitude 500. Four. 350. Three. Up a point now. All right. Let's set her down. the power. Masters, fight battle stations. I see. All secured, sir. Well, gentlemen, gentlemen, we're now on Mars, April 20th, 1987, 433 Greenwich time. Enter that in the log, Masters. I see. Well, gentlemen, it's less than two hours till dawn. As soon as it's light, we'll send out a landing party. Masters, get me an all-over hookup. We're all set, Captain. Now hear this. All right, men. The smoking lamp is lit. Well, we're on Mars. The first man shipped from Earth to land here. We don't know what we're going to find or what dangers we may face. We're 17 men on an alien world. And it's up to us whether we ever get home again. The next few hours should tell the story. And I want instant obedience to all commands. I'll court-martial the first man who doesn't jump to when he's ordered. And one other thing. We may be on Mars, but this is still a United States naval vessel. Officers will conduct a personal and weapons inspection in one hour. That's all. An inspection, Captain? Now? Mr. Lustig... We've got an hour and a half to sweat out before we find out what's outside that airlock. I'd rather have a man worried about his stripes than about what's waiting outside on Mars. Now I hear this landing party report to forward airlock. Captain Black, Lieutenant Hingston, Lieutenant Lustig, and Dr. Horst report immediately to forward airlock. It's now landing time, minus five. Well, they're paging us. Uh, you ready, Dr. Horst? Yes, Mr. Lustig. As ready as I will ever be. Come on, let's get in the lock. <clears throat> Hingston, Lustig, and Horst reporting in the airlock. Very well, sir. The captain will join you. Four minutes to go. At least the captain would get here. What difference does it make? I just want to get it over with, that's all. Anybody got a cigarette? Yeah, I think you're smoking too much, Lieutenant Lustig. Are you nervous? I are for your horse. Wondering what's hidden outside underneath that ground mist? I've been giving it some thought. It'll be very interesting to find out. A very unusual planet, Mars. Why? It has an atmosphere. A wonderful thing, an atmosphere. Where you find one, you uh, find life. You mean Martians? What do you think they'll look like? Who knows? Intelligent life can take many forms. You mean they may have green skins and eyes on stalks or something? The comic book conception is possible, of course. Or they may have developed far beyond us. Perhaps they have a science that can produce weapons far more dangerous than our atomic missiles. You think we may have to fight our way up? After all, we are invaders. Now I hear this landing time minus two. All right, all right, we heard this. You know what I'd like to find outside that airlock? Good old Illinois. Ever been there, Rusty? Uh, only Chicago. Well, you ought to see my hometown. Green lawns, big white houses. <laughs> Sounds like my hometown. 
My grandmother used to have one of those iron deer on the lawn. Every Halloween, we'd paint it another color. One time, we painted it black and white like a Holstein cow. Where does your family live, Dr. Horst? I have no family. When I was a child, they were gassed to death in the Dachau concentration camp. Oh, tough. No, oh, it has its advantages. I have no ties on Earth. Nothing to lose now. I imagine I'm the only one on board who is free to enjoy our present peculiar position. All right, masters, you can button it up now. Aye, aye, aye sir. Well, gentlemen, check your sidearms. In one minute, we'll be the first men to set foot on Mars. Quite an honor, eh? As long as the medals are not rewarded posthumously. Still uneasy, Dr. Horst? Captain Black, I've been uneasy ever since I can remember. On Earth and on Mars. Well, 30 seconds. Give me the intercom phone, Lustig. Yes, sir. Masters? Aye, sir. Battle stations are to be manned till we return. If we're not back in two hours, I want no rescue party sent out. Blast off and save the ship, you understand? Aye, sir. All right. Five seconds. Four. Three. Two. One. Lustig, open the outer airlock. Aye, sir. It's fresh air. Let's go. Now, take it easy. It's too dark to move fast. Quiet, isn't it? Not even a wind. Can't see anything from this ground, mister. Quiet. We don't know what's out here. All right, come on. What the quiet? Captain, I can swear that... That sounds like a rooster. I don't hear it anymore. Very homely but unlikely sound. A rooster crowing on Mars? Higston? Aye, sir. Set that machine gun 25 yards to the flank. We'll stay here till the ground mist lifts. Aye, sir. What do you make of the ground, horse? Grass. Plain grass. You can see some large foliage there with the mist thinned out. What the... Higston, hold your fire, you fool! I hit it, Captain! What? Some kind of wild animal. I hit it. I could see the tracers, but it's still standing. Come on, horse. Doctor, where are you? Up ahead. Admiring the wild animal. Careful, Horst. Wait for us. Don't worry, Captain. <laughs> it's an iron deer. A lawn ornament. Well, that, that's impossible. It's hollow. Interesting, isn't it? A whitewashed Victorian iron deer sitting on a lawn in the middle of Mars. I don't understand. Look around. The mist's lifting. Hey, Captain, look there. It's a house. A regular old-fashioned house. But, sir, on Mars... Good Lord. I haven't seen carved scrolls and gingerbread like that in years. Look at that port swing. The geraniums. There. I told you it was a rooster, Captain. Give me the glasses, Lustig. I want to take a look through that front window. Well, there's an upright piano. Some sheet music on it. Lustig, it's... It's beautiful Ohio. Yeah. It can't be, sir. Horst... Horst, do you think that civilization of two planets could be identical? I don't know. That specific variety of geraniums is only 50 years old on Earth. Is it logical that they should develop in Mars? How about that port swing of the piano and, and beautiful Ohio? Why, it's impossible. Captain Black, this looks like the town I was born in. Well, it, it looks like my hometown, too. I thought of something, sir. It's the only solution. Maybe, maybe we're not the first ship to reach Mars from Earth. Don't be ridiculous, Lustig. Oh, how else can you explain it? Uh, suppose some scientists got together. They, they, they invented some spaceship and, and planted a colony here. That's the only answer. That's impossible, Lustig. Been space travel, it couldn't be secret. Do you have any idea what ships cost, what industrial power is needed? No, there's got to be some logical reason. I think perhaps we might find out, Captain. The light just went on in that house. Kingston, cover that door with the machine gun. Aye, sir. All right, come on, horse. We're going to ring that doorbell. There's got to be a scientific answer to all this. And there's something moving in there. Stand back, Horst. Give me a clear shot. Are you sure a bullet can stop a Martian? Steady now. Can I help you? I... Well, we... If you're selling anything, it's much too early. No, 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 wait just a minute. What... What town is this? What do you mean? Are you census takers? No, no. We're strangers here. We want to know how this town got here. Is this a game? No, no, it's not a game. We're from Earth. From where? From Earth. Do you mean out of the ground? Are you sure you're feeling well? Madam, we came in a flying ship across space. 
We're from the third planet, Earth. This is Mars. Now do you understand Mars? You go away now, you hear? I'll call my husband from upstairs and he'll chase you. Go on. But this is Mars, isn't it? This is Green Lake, Wisconsin in the United States of America. Bounded on the east by the Atlantic and on the west by the Pacific. Now go away. Goodbye. Horst, do you suppose it's really possible? I've got to find out more about this. I told you I'd call my husband. Now you go away. You've got to tell me one thing first. What year is this? Year? 1928, of course. For goodness sake. You hear that, Horst? And we know it's 1987. And we know this is Mars. Of course, is it possible that we got fouled up, made, made some tremendous blunder, circled around and landed back on Earth? In 1928? Well, maybe some switch in time or dimension. Could we have shifted somehow, gone, gone backward in time? Oh, Horst, this won't hold water. It's, it's not logical. We've, we, we checked every mile. We went past the moon, out into space. We're, we're on Mars. Lustig out at point. Hingston in the rear. Keep that gun at half load. Aye, sir. Horst, there, there's got to be some cold, logical solution. Captain! What? That, that, that house down the street, the white one with the green shutters. Lustig, what's the matter? I never thought of... I never thought of... Thank God! Lustig! Lustig, come back here! He's running for that house. That crazy fool, after him, quick! Lustig, stop! Come down off of that porch! Never! 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 Lustig, what the devil do you think you're doing? Albert! Oh, Grandma! Grandpa, it is you. Lustig, what is going on here? Albert, it's, it's been so many years. How you've grown, boy. It's so good to see you. Lieutenant Lustig! Oh, Captain, uh, Grandma, I want you to meet my friends. This is Captain Black. Captain, I want you to meet my grandfather. Howdy. Any friend of Albert's is a friend of ours. <laughs> How long have you been here, Grandma? Oh, a good many years. Ever since we died. Ever since you what? Oh, yes, sir. They've been dead 30 years. What? Oh, now, don't you trouble yourself. It's all right. We're alive again, that's all. Do you mean to tell me that Mars is heaven? Oh, nonsense, no. All we know is here we're alive again. And who are we to question God's infinite ways? Well, I... Lustig, we're going back to the ship. But, Captain, I, I want to talk to my grandfather. Lieutenant Lustig, I don't like any part of this. You'll come back with us if I have to club you and carry you. I see. Now, let's go. Heaven only knows what they've run up against back at the ship. Horse, look at that crowd around the ship. Looks like we're being welcomed with a celebration, Captain. Celebration, they've abandoned ship. Every port is open. No guard set. You, you masters. Hiya, Captain. Meet my old dad. Dad, that's Captain Black. He's not a bad guy for no... Hingston! Uh, uh, what, sir? Bring that band back. Use force if you have to. I, uh, oh, excuse me, sir. There's my Uncle George. Hingston! I'll be right back, Captain Uncle George. Uncle what George. the devil is Don't going on here? Don't you understand, sir? They've all found friends and relatives. They're, they're all here. He's right, Captain. I found it. The whole crew's out in the crowd. But I gave orders. Definite orders. You don't understand, Captain. I understand, Newtony. I don't care how many relatives show up. I'll have discipline. John! Johnny! What? Johnny, you old son of a gun. It's you. Edward. Yes. It can't be. Oh, of course it is. Johnny, Johnny, Ed, you won't. Ed, what? Dr. Horst, this is my brother, Edward. How do you do? Hello, sir. It's wonderful to, to see you, Edward. <laughs> Look, I've, I've got to get back to my ship. Oh, Johnny, wait. I almost forgot. Mom's waiting at home. Mom? Yeah, and Dad, too. Mom and Dad are alive? Then... Then you're real, Ed. Well, of course. Don't I feel real? How's <laughs> that, huh? <laughs> Why, Ed? Ed! <laughs> we've, we've got lunch for you, Johnny. Mom's making corn fritters. Dr. Horst, haven't you found anybody? No, oh, no, Captain. I have nobody. Well, then you come on home with me, right, Ed? Why, sure. Horst, Horst, you wouldn't believe it. But it's been 35 years since I had Mom's corn fritters. <laughs> By George, 35 years. So don't hold back, Johnny. You too, Dr. Horace. Well, Johnny, you're still in the Navy, huh? That's right, Dad. I'm in command of the ship. We're an old Navy family, Dr. Horace. All three of our boys in the service. Yeah, Ed was the best pilot in the Pacific, too. What did happen, Ed? 
<laughs> What's the difference? I'm here now. Yeah, but... You know, it's almost perfect. All we're missing is your brother, Will. Then the whole family could be together. Well, it won't be long, Mom. Will's in charge of the XR-54. Next rocket coming out to Mars. Oh. Well, little Will. When does he leave, Johnny? Well, the takeoff's scheduled for September, but uh -huh. it depends on what we report. Oh, oh, yeah. There's no question about that now, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> Christmas together again. That'll be something. Sure yes. will, yes, sirree. Well, uh, this calls for a celebration. How about a little of the old dandelion wine, eh, Johnny? Now, Father, don't you go giving Johnny too much wine. <laughs> He's a big boy now, Mother. Well, sir, isn't everything just fine? Just fine. Again, will you, Ed? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Horst, what are you doing sitting over here alone? What do you think of my little family? Very nice. You know, I can't understand why you didn't find any folks here, Dr. Horst. It's just a shame everybody else is so happy. Well, I never remembered my family, Mrs. Black. All I know is they were gassed at Dachau during the Second World War. When I was liberated, I was in delirium three months. I cannot remember anything before then. A psychiatric phenomena. Well, that's terrible. Isn't there anything anybody can do? I don't want to remember. I have not had a pleasant life. I prefer to be free of emotional entanglements. They interfere with a scientific approach. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Oh. Horst. Well, oh, I'll get it. That's our ring. Long and three shorts. I remember that. Well, maybe we'd better call it a night. You must be getting tired, Johnny. I'd better be going back to the ship. Nonsense. You stay the night. Uh, we insist. I just couldn't rest thinking of you all alone on that ship. Oh, I'll be all right. Well, good night. Oh, wait a minute, Dr. Horst. That phone message was for you. Me? Yes, that's right. Uh, a message from Anna. Anna? I don't... Well, there. She must be an old friend. Isn't that nice? Uh, I... Don't... You sure it was for me? I don't remember any, Anna. Well, she asked if you were better. Perhaps she's someone who knew you at Dachau. Anna? She said she's coming over here first thing in the morning. So you'll have to stay over. Yes, well, but... that da settles it, then. You stay here, Horst. You can bunk with me in my old room. Yeah, but, Johnny, we thought you'd like to be with Edward. So you could talk the way you used to. Well, we can't put Dr. Horst on the daybed. I think we'd better share the room tonight. Be plenty of time for talking, Ed. Uh, yes, I... I guess so. Well, I suppose I'd better drop back to the ship... You know, Ed, security check. What, why do you have to do that here? I, I don't know, Mom. There's no good reason, I guess. <laughs> well, suppose we skip it tonight, eh? Well, good night, everybody. Oh, it's good to have you home, Johnny. It's good to be home, Mom. Black, hmm? You asleep? No, no, I've... I've been thinking about what we were expecting. <laughs> Green-skinned Martians. All the time there was only Mom and Dad and... and Edward waiting. That's yeah, funny what tricks your imagination can play on you. Well, I guess Mars is heaven, Horst. You know, I've been thinking about Martians, too. Hmm? Captain, just suppose... Suppose... There were Martians, mm -hmm. and they saw us land. And suppose they thought of us as invaders. What would be the best weapon they could use against our atom bombs, huh? Oh, I don't see what you're getting at. They would want to disarm us first, huh? To wipe out all suspicion, to make us feel at home. Captain, mm -hmm. suppose this house isn't real. Suppose the people are just images stolen from our own memories by Martians, created for us by telepathy. Hypnotist. Oh, that's, that's the craziest theory I ever heard. Maybe that's why there was no one for me. Because in all my life, there is no happy memory, no real loved person, not even my mother. I don't remember her. Only the piles of rotting corpses of Dachau. There was no happy emotion for these people to recreate. How about that phone call? Anna? Yes, Anna. I didn't remember who she was, but I do now. I just remembered. When I was freed from Dachau, 
sick, delirious. I raved about a wonderful, kind nurse named Anna that took care of me. Well, there you are. It's logical. She's coming to see you tomorrow. But there was no Anna. I'd been nursed by a man. What? Anna was only a dream. And there's only one way they could have learned about her, by reading my subconscious mind. That's impossible, Horace. Why? A whole crew was thinking of home. Suppose the Martians read our minds. Yes, but if, if there are Martians... If there are, they have us separated. Each man in a different house, sleeping. Trust me. No one at the guns. I left my pistol downstairs. Do you think there's something to this, Horst? It's a perfect trap, Captain. Who would suspect his own mother, his grandparents? How easy. Just a knife in the heart of each sleeping man. That's impossible, Horst. But... We've, we've got to get back to the ship. Listen, the crickets have stopped. Come on. We don't know when they change back to whatever they really are. All right, careful. Where are you going, John? Ahead. We, uh, we wanted to drink of water. That's, that's all, Ed. You're not thirsty, John. You don't want a drink. Look out! You don't want a His drink. His face! It's changing! He's a marsh! Run, horse! Run! You can't get away, John. This way, horse! Horse, where are you? Hello! Hello! Can you hear me, Earth? This, this is Captain John Black, the XR-53 calling for Mars. I've locked myself in the ship, but they've crippled it. I can't take off or fire the guns, and they're coming for me now, the Martians. I'm all alone here. All the rest are dead. Hinkston, Lustig, Dr. Horst, poor Horst, he didn't even reach the door. Listen, listen. They're trying to break through the hull. Edward and Mom and Dad and all the folks, but, but they're changing now. They're, they're melting and changing back into... They're Martians. Can you understand? Martians, not men. They, they make you think that Mars was heaven and we fell into the trap. Can you hear me, Earth? You've got to stop the next rocket. Listen, tell my brother Will. Tell my brother not to come. They'll trap him, too. They'll kill them all. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me, Earth? This is John Black on Mars. Hello, Earth? This is John Black on Mars. Tonight, X-1 has brought you the science fiction classic, Mars is Heaven. Written by Ray Bradbury and adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Wendell Holmes as Captain Black and Peter Capel as Dr. Horst. With Bill Zuckert as Masters, Bill Lipton as Hingston, Margaret Berlin as the old lady, Bill Griffiths as Edward, Ken Williams as Lustig, Ethel Everett as Mom, and Edwin Jerome as Dad. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Wayne and is a transcribed NBC Radio Network production. Minus one. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand would-be worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. Tonight, Universe. We are just beginning to discover how boundless our universe really is. And yet as man reaches out to the stars, out toward infinity, 
Ironically enough, he may be building himself a new kind of prison. What would it be like to live all your life in a world no larger, say, than a single gigantic rocket ship bound on an endless mercy? Hugh, look out! You all right? Yes, just missed me. What was it? A mutant with a slingshot, I think. Must have dashed down that passageway. Want to go after it? No, we'd never catch it, Alan. Probably 12 decks above us by now. I didn't think they ever came down this far. Patrols usually get them before they reach this level. They get more daring each generation. This one looked like a female. Uh, Male or female, it might have killed us. I told you this trip was pure foolishness, climbing 24 (laughs) deck levels to hear a crazy old man rave. All right, Alan, we're almost there now. Let me see, compartment X, 15, level 24. This is the place. This area smells as if it hadn't been visited by a sanitation crew for generations. Mm. This part of the ship is almost deserted. Yes? Is this the compartment of John the Witness? Who are you? My name is Hugh Hoyland. Cadet from Scientist Barracks. This is my friend Alan Mahoney. What do you want of John the Witness? Well, only to talk. Are you a believer in Jordan? Naturally. I have heard that there are those among the younger scientists who doubt the word of Jordan. To doubt is death. We are not heretics. Ah. Enter. I've brought you a gift of tobacco, grown on the richest level. Oh, it smells good. I assure you, it's of the best. Wait here. I'll get him. What a rat's nest. Shh. What the devil do you think he can tell you? Alan, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well? Are you John the Witness? I am. Good evening to you. I'm Hugh Hoyland. This is my friend, Alan Mahoney. What brings a gentleman of the scientist class to my humble compartment? I've heard that you and your parents before you have been keepers of the legend of the ship. Since Jordan gave the word. I'm anxious to hear the word as Jordan spoke it. Why? Because our young scientists, well, among them, there have been some who talk against the word. There are regulations against such heresy. Still, some of them say the ship has no purpose. They say that we are here accidentally, that we have no more grace in Jordan's eyes than the most deformed mutant who dwells in the highest level of the ship. What shall I say to you? Well, I wish to hear the word from the mouth of one who knows, in order that I may become more convinced. Sit. You have a gift for the witness? The finest tobacco. Good. I will dim the lights. Now pay close attention, for these are the words as my father's father's father gave them to his son's son's son. This is how the ship came into being, how our people were created. In the beginning there was only Jordan, thinking his lonely thoughts. Out of his thoughts came a vision. Out of the vision came a planning, and out of the planning came decision. Jordan's hand was lifted, and the ship was born. Mile after mile of good compartments, tank after tank for golden corn, ladder and passage, door and locker fit for the needs of the yet unborn. He looked on his work and found it pleasing, meet for a race that was yet to be. He thought of man, and man came into being. Then Jordan checked his thoughts and searched for a key. Man untamed would shame his maker. Man unruled would spoil the plan. So Jordan made the regulations and order came to the works of man. A crew he created to work at their stations, scientists to guide the plan. Over them all he created captain, made him judge of the race of man. Thus it was in the golden age.
These are the true words? As my father's father taught them. But what of the strange beast-like people on the upper levels of the ship? Surely Jordan did not create them. Jordan is perfect. All below him lack perfection. You have heard of the legend of Huff? I have heard that he mutinied against Jordan. Darkness swallowed the ways of virtue. Sin prevailed upon the ship. And before wisdom prevailed and the bodies of Huff and his followers were fed into the converter, some of the rebels escaped and lived to father the mutants. They are tainted with the sins of their fathers. Witness, one more question. Speak. What is the ship? The ship is a great sphere, 25 kilometers wide and 100 levels deep. I know that, but the upper levels... Regulations forbid us to venture into the upper levels... But it is said that beyond the levels of the mutants lies the forbidden place where Jordan's spirit prevails. So I've heard, yet something troubles me. Something which prompted my coming here. Yes, my son. What lies beyond the ship? What? What lies beyond the ship? This is heresy. Answer me. I will not permit such talk. The ship is complete. The ship is universal. The ship is everywhere. The, the ship is endless. The Your mutterings a... are those of a frightened old man. No. They answer nothing. You, you question the word. I think you lie. Hear me, Mr. Hoyland. For what you have already said, I can have your body fed into the converter. Your soul launched on the endless trip. You threaten me. You, for Jordan's sake. Do you think I fear this dried fig of a man? You! Sir, my friend is impetuous. He, he does not understand. Uh, might be persuaded to forget a substantial gift. Why, you pig! You! Alan, come on. The sight of this so-called holy man offends me. No, you shall not leave. Don't try to frighten me with that gun, old man. Remain where you are, heretic. I warn you, put down that gun. No, 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 closer. Drop it. No, very well, then. Death to the heretic. Alan, get him. Alan. He's not breathing. Is he dead? I, I, I don't know. Come on, Hugh. We've got to get out of here. Right. Nowhere. We can't go back. They'd feed us into the converter before we could even... What's that? An alarm. That old woman must have turned it in. Come on, Alan. The patrol will be here in no time. Where can we go? Yes, where, where? The upper levels. No, the mutants. We'll have to take our chances. Come on, Alan. Let's go. Listen, that's the patrol. Come on, we've got to climb. There's a hatchway. Get on the car there. Right, quickly, quickly. Oh, oh we fire. Alan, Alan, up ladder. Up. Come on, Alan, come on. Phew. Phew, wait. Wait. How far are we from the outside wall? Uh, judging... Now the slope of the deck. About two miles. Helen, let's try this passageway here. If you hadn't asked him that stupid question. Now, there's no use going over that. But why did you do it? I've been thinking about it for a long time. When he began to give me those stupid, pat answers. And then I just saw red, I guess. Who are you to question the ways of Jordan? When you asked me to go with you to visit the witness, I... I thought you wanted spiritual help. I, I never I'm dreamed. I'm sorry, Alan. I'm sorry. I couldn't foresee this. Wait. Wait a minute. What? I thought I saw something move. Where? Near that bulkhead. I don't see anything. Uh, maybe my eyes are going bad. <laughs> uh, listen! You behind us! Alan, look out! <laughs> no. What are you? Uh, uh, that knife. Keep away from me, you. Uh, Don't kill him. Not yet. Who are you? You must forgive my friend Bobo. Like so many of my people, he's rather impetuous where members of the so-called super race are concerned. Who are you? What place is this? You can guess from my leg. I'm a mutant. Mutant? Where? Where is Alan? Your friend is dead. Dead? 
I was not able to restrain my people in time to save him. Why don't you destroy me and get it over with? We do not kill for pleasure, Mr. Hoyland. Only when necessary. You know my name? I read your identification tag. Who are you? Mutants can't read. My name is Gregory. Gregory? I'm a leader of my people. You see, although we are unfortunate in our heredity, Mr. Hoyland, many of us are quite intelligent. Why do you live like animals? We'd rather live like free animals than like regimented slaves, as you do. I've heard you practice cannibalism. Undoubtedly, you hear many things about us. You turn your head. Why? That... that monster. I've never seen a creature like him. Bobo <laughs> is an unfortunate. He was born without the power of speech. How can you tolerate such a monstrosity? We've learned to live with difference. If we began to destroy our imperfects as you do on the lower levels, there would soon be no one left. It violates the regulations. The word of Jordan you states know, Mr. Highland, that... Your people are really quite primitive and barbaric. You dare say that to me. I dare say a good deal more. Let us go to my compartment and speak further. I'm always interested in information on the lower levels. I'll give you no information. Bobo. No. I want Mr. Hoyland in my cabin, please. No. Oh. I would advise you to go quietly, Mr. Hoyland. Bobo has a hatred of superior beings, which is unfortunate, but quite understandable. <laughs> Proceed. Enter, Mr. Hoyland. This is where you live? Yes. But you have books. Stolen from your libraries, Mr. Harlan. Conklin's Astrophysics, Philosophy of Interstellar Navigation, Celestial Mechanics. You've read these? Most of them. I had no idea that you... Why did you bring me here? What do you intend to do? Do you believe in Jordan, Mr. Harlan? There is no other belief. And the trip. I suppose you believe in the trip, too. What else is there to believe? When you die, your remains are fed to the converter, and your soul makes the trip. And where does the trip take you? By to Centaurus, of course. Ah. And where or what is Centaurus? Centaurus is... Mind you, I'm just telling you the orthodox answer. Centaurus is where you arrive when you've made the trip. A place where everybody is happy and where there's always good eating. And you believe this? Well, the peasants believe it literally, but many of the younger scientists, like myself, know it is figurative and symbolic. Why do you ask? Did it ever occur to you, Mr. Hoyland, that the trip is exactly what your peasants believe it is? What? And that the ship and all the crew were actually going somewhere, moving? The sh ship can't go anywhere. It already is everywhere. Imagine a place bigger than the ship. Much bigger? bigger with the ship inside it, moving inside it. There can't be any place bigger than the ship. There just wouldn't be any place for it to be. Oh, for half's sake, listen. You know the lowest level? Of course. If you started digging a hole in the lowest level, where would that hole go? It's forbidden to think such thoughts. Where would it go? I can't think about it. Bobo, <laughs> we're going to take Mr. Hoyland to the place. No. Where, where are we going? To the top level. But that's certain death. Nonsense. I've been there a thousand times. No. Come along. No, I won't. I won't. You can't make me. I think we can. No, no. Please. No. Shall we proceed peacefully, or shall I have Bobo persuade you? Open the door, Bobo. <laughs> Inside. What place is this? This, Mr. Hoyland, is the main control room. Now, Mr. Hoyland, you're trembling. It isn't true. No. No, there's no such place except in mythology. Ah, you younger men are so wise, Mr. Hoyland, except for one thing. This happens to be the main control room of the ship. Main control? But it's just a huge room with an instrument panel. And what did you expect? How do you know this is the main control room? See these instruments? Using them, the navigator many hundreds of years ago actually steered the ship on its voyage. I don't understand. I didn't suppose you would. Sit down. Very well. Look up. What do you see? A huge shield. Watch it for one moment, Mr. Hoyland. You're going to see something that few of us have ever been privileged to witness. What are you doing? I'm dimming the lights. Don't be frightened. Keep your eyes focused on the shield above us. Ready? Watch. 
It's sliding back. Ghost of Jordan. Well? What am I seeing? The universe, Mr. Hoyland. The universe and all its beauty. The stars, the planets, the suns and moons and constellations. No. No, it can't be. The ship is the universe. There is nothing but the ship. Ah, but there it is. You see it before your eyes spread out like a canopy of glory. Do you still deny it? Answer me, Mr. Hoyland. Do you deny it? No. No, I can't deny it. They've lied. They lied to all of us. Good. I have showed this to others of your people whom we captured, and though they saw it before their very eyes, they would not believe it. Please. Please tell me all about it. Tell me the truth about the ship and about the universe. What are these things? How did this come about? Many thousands of years ago, on a planet like those you have just seen, a planet called Earth, a scientist named Jordan decided to build a ship that would carry men from one planet to another. For many years, Jordan and thousands of others studied and planned. And when they were finished, they built the ship. A ship so large that it had to be assembled in its own orbit beyond a place called the moon. Sixty years it took them to construct. And when it was finished, a whole new science had been conceived. Then the trip was begun. The trip that was to land a colony of Earthmen on a far-off planet called Centaurus. Millions of light years beyond the furthest planet ever reached before. How do you know these things? Among my books are the log which Jordan himself kept and the records of the journey for the first 40 years. What happened? There was a mutiny. A man named Huff led a rebellion of those who wanted to turn back. In the struggle, the navigators were killed, and the crew fell into a state of anarchy. In the years to follow, small groups of men tried to organize the ship for navigation, and each time they failed. Finally, the whole idea was abandoned. And so, for centuries, we have swung in space, unmanned, undirected, living in a lost world of our own making, without purpose, without direction. Why have you told me this? Can't you guess? You want to finish the trip. Yes, but I can't. You can't? Look at me, Mr. Hoyland. You see, a mutant, a man with a twisted leg... My people are outcasts, condemned to death if we so much as set foot in the lower levels of the ship. The main drive is in the lower levels where my people are forbidden to go. No. It would mean that both our people would have to work together. Our differences encouraged rather than denied. All right. I'll see the captain himself. I have an uncle on the central board. I'll tell him what I've seen here. And do you think he'll believe you? Send one of your people with me. That's asking a good deal. I'm risking a good deal by going back. Very well. Bobo will go with you. Bobo? He can't talk. There will be no need for talk. I will write a message guaranteeing safe conduct for a group of unarmed scientists to visit the main control room. Bobo will take you safely through our territory. What happens when you reach your own level is up to you. One moment. Yes, what? You. Quick, Uncle, let us in. Hey, but this, this mutant. He's harmless. Please, Uncle, please. Now, what is this? You want it for... I know all about that. Uncle, listen. I must see the captain. The captain? Are, are you mad? Uncle, you're a council member. You can get me to see He'll him. He'll kill you. You're one of the heresy. I don't care. I must speak with the captain. Now, Uncle, you're close to him. You can arrange it. I, I don't understand. Listen to me. The ship is moving. I can prove it. Do you understand? There is a purpose in the ship. I don't understand what you're babbling about. Now, never mind. 
Just talk to the captain. Tell him I have information of tremendous importance. Tell him I've arranged a truce with the mutants. Truce? Here, show him this paper. Signed by their leader. Do it, Uncle, for my sake. I don't know what... Uncle, please, if I'm to die, let this be my last request to you. Very well. I'll speak to the captain. And you say, Mr. Hoyland, that you saw this with your own eyes? I swear it, Captain. I swear it on the word of Jordan. Hmm. Uh, let me see the paper again. Manderist, what do you think? I don't know, sir. It might be a trick. I guarantee you safe conduct. If these things are as Mr. Hoyland reports them, it would pay to risk a few lives. A man is a convicted heretic. Still, we must not discount his word. He has a safe conduct, and the mutant risked its life coming with him. I think we might investigate. Captain, you mean you will do it? I will have an expedition outfitted. Dismissed, Mr. Hoyland. Thank you, sir. Captain, do Commander you... Commander Erst. Sir. You will make the necessary arrangements for an expedition. And I trust you understand? Perfectly, sir. Perfectly. <laughs> Lieutenant. Mr. Hoyland. Well, you better halt your men here. This is the spot. Patrol! Halt! Well, I see no welcoming party of mutants. <laughs> There'll be none. Their leader will meet you inside the main control room. You don't say. Just where is this main control room? Beyond that door. I see. All right, man. Ready up. Lieutenant. Why do you ready arms? In case of ambush. Ambush? Now, wait a minute, Lieutenant. What are those men doing with that ray gun? Just aiming it at the door. Are you mad? No, Mr. Hoyland, but most certainly you are to think that we could be lured up here to be slaughtered with a fantastic story about some mythical control room. Guns ready, Lieutenant, sir. Lieutenant, I warn you, these people have acted in good faith. You can't break that faith. Oh, mutant! Come out! For Jordan's sake, Hold Lieutenant! It. Quiet for comfort. Mutant! Open the door! Please, Jordan, don't let anything happen. Don't let... Oh, this opening, ready, men. Someone's coming out. Steady. Gregory, stay back! Fire! You fools! You've killed him! Here come the rest of them. Fire! Fire! Fools! That should teach him a lesson they won't forget. All right, men, inside the room. Come on, Harlan. You're under arrest as a conspirator in this ambush. Ambush, you fool. You blind, stupid fool. All right, that'll be enough. You've been inside this place before? Yes. What's this machinery? These are the controls he would have used to steer the ship. Gone out of his mind, Lieutenant. Steer the ship? Who? The leader, the one you killed. <laughs> this ugly mutant? This ugly mutant. Happened to be a man of true genius. Why, you're mad. Am I? Lieutenant, this man had a vision which would have saved you, but you chose to kill him because you couldn't stand the sight of his difference from you. Shut up, Highland. Don't listen to him, man. You can't shut your eyes and you can't shut your minds and you can't shut your ears to this. The rope's moving back. Yes, look. Let the vision of this confound your ignorance and blind your eyes. This is the heritage of stars and open skies for which men have yearned for centuries. Try to destroy this, and you will only destroy yourselves. Death to the heritage. I... But I... I say to you that you can't keep this from our people. They... They will seek it out. The ship will be manned. And the ship will be steered. And there will be freedom, purpose, and respect for ourselves. This is your heritage. Look. 
Look upon the universe. Kill him. X minus one has just brought you Universe, a story written by Robert Heinlein and adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Heard in the cast were Donald Buca as Hugh, Peter Capel as Gregory, Bill Griffiths as Alan, Abby Lewis as the woman, Edgar Staley as the witness, Jason Johnson as the uncle, John Seymour as the captain, and Ian Martin as the lieutenant. Your announcer is Fred Collins. X-1 is directed by Fred Way and is a transcribed NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week, next week we have a strange story to tell. A sweet, blood-curdling little story that is really only two sentences long. The last man on earth sat alone in a room. And then there was a knock on the door. What knocked on that door? You'll find out next week on X minus one. When you buy United States savings bonds, you help to build your own future security. Here's an opportunity to save systematically for long-range personal objectives. So invest in United States savings bonds. Now follow the Abbots to mystery and adventure over most NBC radio stations. Countdown for blastoff. X minus 5, minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, X minus 1, fire! From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand would-be worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. Tonight, the science fiction classic, Knock, by Frederick Brown. Tonight, we have a strange story to tell. A sweet, blood-curdling little story that is really only two sentences long. The last man on earth sat alone in a room. There was a knock at the door. What's that? Good morning, man. What? Who are you? You have regained consciousness. Who are you? I am Zan. I'm still asleep, I must be. You are not asleep. Maybe if I close my eyes, it'll go away. I will not go away, man. No. I guess I'm awake. Who... What are you? I am a Zan. What's that? A Zan is intelligent life. Look, I don't... What happened? Where are you from? From planet seven in the third galaxy in the fourth quadrant. Where? It is not necessary to repeat information which is correct in the original statement. Planet seven? But you mean I'm not on Earth? You are still on your planet. Then what are you doing here? The Zans have annexed your world. You mean you've conquered Earth? Yes, that is correct. We will now prepare your planet for habitation by the Zan. How about the people? What about the population of the world? You are the population of the world. Huh? Now, wait a minute. I, I can't... I don't understand what's happened. The Zan have landed on your planet. We have removed the lower life forms to prepare for colonization by the Zan. When did all this happen? Two days ago. You have been unconscious until now. You really mean I'm the last man on Earth? That is correct. Identify yourself now. What? 
Kindly provide data as to your position in the elementary social order of your planet. Oh. I'm uh, Walter Phelan, Associate Professor of Anthropology at Nathan University. How do you speak English? We have deciphered your written and recorded records. It is not difficult to reconstruct your language. It is a primary type of auditory communication. Oh. Mm. Is there anything you want to complete your natural habitat? You mean I'm a prisoner? That is correct. What would you want further in your room? Do I have to stay here? Yes. The rest of my life? Forever. Then you better bring me my books. That uh, there will be done. That's rather considerate of you. You know, I've got to call you something. Do you mind if I call you George? It is immaterial. I will be back, Associate Professor of Anthropology. Oh, that's all right, George. Just uh, call me Walter. Very well, Walter. I will be back with your books. All right, George. I'll be seeing you around. You will not be around, Walter. You will be here. Come in. Hello, George. Hello, Walter. Uh, Wait a minute. You're not George. You're different somehow. It makes no difference. The sun are many, and they are one. Then I'll call you George, too. I'll call you all George. Uh, what can I do for you? Point one. You will please henceforth sit with your chair facing the other way. Uh-huh. I thought so, George. That plain wall is different from on the other side, isn't it? That is correct. It is transparent. Yeah, that's what I thought. I'm in a zoo, right? That is correct. How many other animals do you have in the zoo, George? 216. <laughs> Not complete, George. Even a Bush League zoo could beat that. Did you just uh, pick at random? Yes. All species would have been too many. Male and female, each of 108 kinds. Male and female, huh? Of uh, all the animals? There is a female of your species among the collection. Mm, anyone I know? Uh, well, never mind. It doesn't matter anyway. Well, uh, what do you feed us all, eh? For carnivorous species, we make synthetics. Flora was not hurt by the vibrations which destroyed animal life. Oh, nice for the flora. Well, George, you started out with point one. I deduce there is a point two kicking around somewhere. What is it? Something we do not understand. Oh? Two of the other animals sleep and do not wake. They are cold. Don't worry, George. It happens in the best regulated zoos. What is wrong with them, Walter? Nothing much. They're just dead. Dead? Mm Mm-hmm. That means... Nothing stopped them. Each was alone. Well, maybe they just died of old age. Old age? I do not understand. You don't? How old are you, George? Your planet went around the sun about 7,000 times since I was born. 7,000 years? Yes, I am still young. A babe in arms. Look, George, you've got something to learn about this planet you've hijacked. Here on Earth, we've got somebody you don't know where you come from. An old man with a beard and an hourglass and a scythe. Your vibrations didn't kill him. What is he? Oh, old man death. Down here, our people and animals live until somebody, the Grim Reaper, stops them. He will stop more? He gets us all, George. With your lifespan, it won't seem like a minute and we'll all be gone. (laughs) Looks like you made a mistake, George. And I don't think there's much you can do about it. That is not correct. The Zan is a logical being. We will take action. Well, George, uh, where are you taking me? We will be there shortly. We will bring your books and your chair. You mean my lease is up? I I do not understand. It's moving day? That is correct. We are here now. You will live here now, Walter. It is a larger room. Well, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. Go inside. Oh, be careful with those books, George. Don't lose my... Oh, uh, excuse me. Who, Who are you? What are you doing here? I guess George didn't explain. Uh, George uh, tries to be polite, but he hasn't quite caught on yet. I'm Walter Phelan. My name is Grace Evans, Mr. Phelan. What's all this about? Why did they bring me here? I think I know why, but uh, let's go back a bit. Do you know just what has happened otherwise? No, not exactly. Well, I've been talking to George. George? Well, that's what I call them, all of them. There's no way to tell them apart anyway. 
There aren't many of them here yet. They come from outside the solar system, sort of a, an advanced scouting party. I saw their spaceship. It's as big as a mountain. Yeah, they're moving in on us. They cleaned off the Earth with some kind of vibration. It destroys all sorts of animal life. I don't know whether they did it all at once or if they had to circle the Earth a few times, but they killed everybody. Oh, no. I was afraid well, The that... cheerful note is that you and I and uh, 200 odd other animals were picked up beforehand as specimens for the zoo. You do know this is a zoo, don't you? I suspected it. But I don't remember anything about being captured. I just woke up here. Well, my hunch is they used the vibrations just low enough to knock us all out. And then they cruised around picking up samples at random. When they were all set, they turned the juice on full blast. How terrible. Yeah, well, they solved a lot of problems for us. Housing shortage, wars... Even the atomic bomb. I don't suppose the human race, you and I, have to worry about anything now. It's awful. Only they made a mistake. They underestimated us. I don't understand. <laughs> they thought we were immortal. That we were what? Immortal, like they are. Oh, they can be killed, but the Zans don't know what natural death is. They didn't know anyway until they lost two of us yesterday. You mean there are, are more than two of us? Oh, not more of our species, no. These were merely fellow animals, a rabbit and a canary. And by the Zan's way of figuring time, the rest of us are only good for a few minutes apiece. It's a joke on them. They figured they had permanent specimens here in the zoo. Well, didn't they even know we'd all die eventually? I don't think so. Uh, George, that is the, the second Zan I saw, told me he was 7,000 years old, and he's young by their standards. When they learned how quickly we die, they, they were practically shocked to the core, if they have cores. How can you talk that way about it? Academic detachment. I learned it at faculty teas. At any rate, they've decided to reorganize their zoo, two by two. What, are they going to keep us locked up together in this one little room? Yeah, I'm afraid so. There's plenty of furniture, though, and George promised to bring me my chair. Well, we've got to do something. Why? Well, I don't know. It just... It seems to me we owe it to the human race to do something. Oh, well, uh, perhaps you have a suggestion? There must be some way. They can be killed, you said. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, I've been studying them. They look horribly different, but I think they have about the same metabolic and digestive system as we. I think that anything that would kill one of us would kill one of them. But you said 7,000 years. Yeah, I, I think I figured it out. Now, George cut his, uh, I suppose you'd call it his hand, when he brought in my books started to bleed, red blood. But I could see the cut closing as he stood there. By the time he left, it was healed. I don't understand. Well, you see, whatever factor there is in man that makes him grow old is missing in the Zan. Their regenerative powers must be unlimited. They just don't wear out. They go on and on until they're stopped. Suppose we killed one. There must be some way. Oh, what would be the use? They wouldn't even punish us. They'd just give us our food through a trap door and put up a sign saying, Beware of the man. Dangerous. I don't think they'll even have to bother in your case. <laughs> I don't see anything funny. I'm sorry. It just reminds me of Martha. Martha? My wife. She died two years ago. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, not at all. It was a pleasure. Uh, that'll be George with my books. Come in. Hello, George. Hello, Walter. Point one. I have brought your books. Mm-hmm. Point one, eh? Uh, what else is on your mind? Another creature sleeps and will not wake. Oh? A small feathered one called a duck. Well, it happens, George. I warned you. Old man death, the grim reaper. I told you about him. Walter, the council of Zan has met. It has been decided logically that A, no life form can withstand the full strength vibrations with which we cleared your planet. Therefore, the grim reaper you spoke of does not exist. Mm, pretty neat, George. What's B? B, the only intelligent life to escape the vibrations is you. Therefore... The logical conclusion is you are stopping these animals by some means unknown to us. George, you are off your trolley. You will tell me now how this is done. You've got me. Yes, we have. It is necessary to save the remaining specimens as long as possible. If we do not get the information, we may be forced to dispense with your species entirely. This means you, Walter, and the female. Now, now hold on, George. Don't go off half-cocked. Uh, let me take a look at these animals that won't wake up. I will take you there now. Go first, Walter. After you, my dear George. This is the weasel. Now, you should have got him in the winter, George. The fur's worth more than its ermine. This is the reptile cage. Mm -hmm. Here are the ducks. 
That is the male. The female has been stopped. Yeah, lucky girl. What's the matter, fellow? Lonely? Hmm? Walter, you will tell me how you stopped the female duck. Oh, you got me, George. I didn't do it. Maybe she died of the Dutch elm blight. Walter, you are not being logical. We have concluded you are stopping these animals. Tell us now how it is done. I've told you, George. I haven't the foggiest notion. Very well. We will have to take further action. Oh, what are you going to do, George? We will go back now to your room. What happened, Mr. Phelan? Uh, you might call me Walter. After all, George does. And we have more in common. Please, what happened? Oh, just a duck, a dead duck. George thinks I killed her by remote control. He wants me to tell him how. Did you? Look, I'm just an ordinary anthropologist. There's no telling what those animals died of. Just natural causes. But George can't see it that way. He thinks I'm holding out on him. Good. Hmm? What? At least we can get back at them some way. At least we can do something to them. Well, why? After all, George isn't a bad fellow. If you like an ant mentality. How can you say that? Well, they murdered the whole in the human race. I suppose so, but uh, we can't change that now, so why think about it? We just can't sit here and do nothing. I fail to see how we can do anything else. But at least we could be fighting. I can't see the virtue in that. I was more or less content with my books, and we've got George to talk to. Of all the men in the world they had to pick, don't you want to fight back? Don't you want to keep on fighting to the end? It hadn't occurred to me. But we've got to, Walter. Why? I can't really explain it, but... Walter, if there was any good in man, it was that he kept on struggling against nature and, in the end, even against himself. But he kept on fighting for what he thought was right, and we're all that's left. Walter, we, we just can't end by giving up. We've got to keep on fighting. You know, you do remind me of Martha. There isn't much left for us. We could beat them in this one small thing. We can pretend there's a secret about death. We could refuse to tell them anything. Well, there isn't anything to tell. But they don't know that. Promise me you won't give in. Well, I suppose the worst they can do is kill us. All right, Miss Evans. Hello, George. Hello, Walter. Now you will tell us how these animals are stopped. George, this may come as a shock to you, but I've decided not to tell you. Why? Oh, a romantic attachment to lost causes. My grandfather was a Confederate officer. Walter, you are not being logical. Neither was my grandfather. He charged a Yankee battery with one round of ammunition and a corncob pipe. You are not logical, but that is expected in lower life forms. You will come with me now, Walter. Where are you taking him? To the second level. Go now, Walter. You won't tell them. I can't guarantee anything, but as of now, I don't intend to. We've got to fight, Walter. Remember that. We've got to go out fighting. Yes. Yes, I think you're right. Go now, Walter. Goodbye. It's uh, been a pleasure, Miss Evans. I am waiting. Go now, Walter. After you, my dear George. You will tell us now, Walter. <sighs> that was the first level of vibration. There are many more. However, we have calculated that none of them exceed your threshold of unconsciousness. Oh, very clever, George. Of course. You will tell us now, how do you stop these animals? You will tell us now? As of now, no. However, I'm not very brave if that encourages you, George. You are not being logical, Walter. You're telling me. We will now use vibration level two. <laughs> still conscious. Let me alone, George. You will tell us now, you will tell us now how you stop the animals. Let me alone, let me alone. We have had vibration levels one and two. There are still 15 more before your threshold of unconsciousness. No, 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 let me alone. Walter, listen to me. Another creature sleeps and will not wake. We must know now. It's tough, you better start vibrating again, George. No. What? It would not be logical. We have calculated that no further level of vibration will overcome your irrational psychological block. We conclude you will not tell. And let me go? That is correct. Oh, that's uh, real nice of you, George. I appreciate it. We have calculated that the resistance of the female of your species will be lower. We will now place her under the vibrations. No, no, no George, George, you can't do that. No, listen, George. George, there is no secret. Can you understand that? 
There is no secret. Those animals died from natural causes. I'm telling you the truth. That is not a logical answer. We will get the woman. I've told you the truth. Can't you understand? We must know now. The female animal cage next to the duck has been stopped. We must preserve the survivor. Uh, the animal... Animal next to the duck? We will bring the woman here. She will tell us after the vibration. No, no, no. no, no. Listen, George. You want the truth? You want to know how to save the mates of the animals that have been stopped? You will tell us now? Yes, yes, I'll tell you now. I, I give up. But you've got to promise to leave the woman alone. You promise, George? If we receive the answer from you, Walter, there will be no further need for the vibrations. Well, I guess that'll have to do. All right. All right. Take me to that stopped animal. I'll tell you how to save the mate. Very well, Walter. You are being logical now. We will go. Walter, are you all right? Just uh, let me catch my breath a minute. What did they do? What happened? After a while, I told them what they wanted to know. Oh, no. As uh, George pointed out, it seemed to be the logical thing at the time. But you promised. I know. It was our last chance to beat them on even one little thing. Well, perhaps. You mind if I sit down? You gave up. Well, I suppose you could call it that. I'm very tired. They've beaten us completely then. There isn't even anything we can do. The last of the human race and we give up. We don't even die fighting. Oh, it isn't that bad. I... Uh, something might turn up. Uh... What did you call me? Uh, uh, huh? No, I, I must have said Martha. Sorry, she was my wife. She died two years ago. What were you saying? Nothing, nothing. It doesn't matter. It's too late. It's too late for the whole human race. What now, George? The council of the Zan has met. No? Something wrong, George? A Zan has been stopped. What? A Zan is dead? That is correct. Well, you didn't believe me, George. But you can die. You can really die. You'll have to get used to that if you're going to stay here. The council has decided. A, you have in some way stopped this Zan. B, you and the woman must be eliminated. Walter. No, no, you've got it wrong, George. The council has decided this time you will have the full vibration. This time? Walter, what did they do to you? Oh, they, uh, they have a rather effective third degree. They tortured you, Walter? Yes. And I, I thought, oh, Walter, it was all my fault. I wouldn't even have tried without you. I suppose we have a last chance now to, to end with some dignity. I think you're a very brave man, Walter. No, not very. There isn't much else to do. Do we go now, George? Now, Walter. Wait. Hmm? What's that? I have been told another Zan has died. Uh, now, now, will you believe me? The Council of the Zan meets now. Two gone already, and you were with me, George. You know I didn't kill this one. What stopped him then? I told you, it's old man death. You came to the wrong planet, George. Your immortality doesn't go down here. He can stop you, but you can't stop him. And you'll all die if you stick around. What now? The council has decided. This is a place of death. We will leave your planet. Leave? You mean you're giving up? It is not safe for the Zan. Oh, Walter, they're leaving. They're really going. Go on then, George. And uh, don't hurry back. It would not be logical to do so. We are leaving the Earth now. Goodbye, Walter. Goodbye, George. Well, they're all aboard now. It's so wonderful to feel the sun and the wind again. Yeah, they've closed the hatches. Walter, is it safe for us to be out here? Yes, they're not interested in us any longer. They only want to get away. And I want to see this, Grace. The Zan leaving Earth forever. They're blasting off. There they go. Yes, it's all over now. Well, I suppose we might as well go back in. I, I still don't understand. Walter, what made them go? <laughs> Well, I just uh, I just told them the facts of life. Of death, you mean? No, no, of life. After all, I thought George was old enough to know. At 7,000 years, he was going to be a pretty big boy. I wish you'd stop joking and tell me what happened. Look out for the step. 
Well, uh, you remember when the first animals died? The rabbit and the duck? Yeah, and their mates just started to pine and waste away? Yes. Well, that worried the Zan. They wanted to keep the last specimens alive if they could. So finally, I broke down and told them about affection. Affection? Yes. And then I introduced Donald. Donald? Who's that? Here we are. Grace, meet Donald. Oh, Walter, please. What does affection have to do with it? That's what the Zan wanted to know. I told him it was love that made the world go round. But having lost his mate, Donald would die immediately unless he had affection and constant petting. Petting? Hmm? <laughs> I even showed him how. Here, fella, come on. Come here. I held Donald in my arms, and I petted him a while. Then I let the Zan take over with the animal in the next cage. What animal? Take a look. You mean this cage? Mm-hmm. Watch out. Don't go too close. Walter, it's a rattlesnake. Yeah, yes. Their metabolism made it impossible for them to die of old age, but I had a hunch that they could be poisoned. Well, then it was the snake that killed the two Zan. Mm-hmm. They never even knew what bit them. Then you outwitted them, Walter. Well, I, I suppose... I you... thought you'd just given up. Oh, Walter, I'm so ashamed. You don't have to be. I had given up. I probably wouldn't have fought if you hadn't pushed me. Well, I... Well, we've got a world to plan. A new world, Grace. I know. We'll have to decide which animals to let out of the zoo and which ones it'd be safer to keep in. But first, there's a bigger problem. What's that? The human race. Oh. We've got to make a decision about that. Pretty important one. Y yes, but... It's been a nice race, even if nobody won it. Of course, it may go backward for a while until it gets its breath, but we can save the books and all the most important things and get it started ahead once more. No! It's the Garden of Eden all over again. Uh, but Eve, you'll have to watch out for that snake. Now, don't. Don't be ridiculous, Walter. You know, funny, you, you even blush like Martha. Only uh, you're stronger than she was. Prettier, too. I, I, I wish you'd forget about Martha. I think I will, my dear, if you'll give me time. Now, Walter Thielen, you listen to me. If you think for one minute that I... That I we thought it would never happen to me again. But it is love that makes the world go round. So, Grace, if you could only... No! I wouldn't marry you if, if you were the last man on earth. But that's exactly what I am. I don't care. I don't even want to talk about it. I'm going out. All right, my dear, but think it over. And please come back. You see, I told you. It wasn't really so horrible, our story. Remember how it goes? The last man on earth sat alone in a room. And then there was a knock on the door. Come in. Come in, Grace, my dear. You see, it wasn't horrible at all. In just a moment, a word about next week's adventure. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Knock by Frederick Brown, adapted for radio by Ernest Kinoy. Featured in the cast were Alex Scorby as Walter, Laurie March as Grace, and Louis Van Ruten as the Zan. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. Now, next week. A strange and chilling story from the Bureau of Missing Persons. The story of what occurred when they accidentally intercepted a shortwave message. A cry for help from a missing atomic scientist who told them the fantastic story that he was now 
The Man in the Moon. How did it happen? You'll hear next week at X. X. Minus. 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 One. 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 Join the Abbots on another baffling mystery tonight over most NBC radio stations. Countdown for blastoff. X minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand would-be worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents X minus one. Tonight's story... The Man in the Moon. Attention, attention. This is the Federal Bureau of Missing Persons calling all local agencies. Attention, this is a coded report nationwide. Missing since 9 o'clock this morning, the following persons. Smigley, Jonathan... Five feet eight inches tall, brown hair, brown eyes, mastoid scar behind right ear, Hello. last seen wearing Hello. blue top coat and Hello. tan cap, Hello, wanted by Los Angeles. Hello. Hello, get off this wavelength. Hello, this is a restricted Earth. band. Hello. Hello, Earth. Uh, whoever you are, you're on a Hello, coded wavelength. Earth. Tune out. This frequency is reserved Hello. for the Federal Bureau of Missing Persons. Hello, Earth. This is the moon Whoa. calling Earth. Hello, Earth. This guy is loony. Jake and transmission. Jake, this is Charlie of the code room. Some crackpot is on our frequency. Yeah, I heard him, Charlie. I've got CQ trying to trace a source now. We should have a triangulation any second. Well, hurry it up, will you? Some ham is in for a good stiff fine by the FCC. Yeah, they ought to take his license away. Oh, here comes Lenny with a directional fix. Right. Thanks, Lenny. Hey. Hey, what's this? This is impossible. What's going on down there? How about it? Get that ham out of my killer cycles. Oh, listen, Charlie, unless this is a gag, that interference is being beamed from 240,000 miles away. Oh, now, Jake, you know there ain't no such thing as 240,000 miles away. Yes, there is, Charlie, straight up. Oh, now, wait a minute. Charlie, that signal is coming from the moon. Are you nuts? Oh, well, somebody might be bouncing it, like a radar signal. Radar? On this frequency? Where'd you study basic radio? Now, listen, Flathead, you asked for a fix. I gave the best fix our instruments can find. Take it or leave it. Somebody on the moon is calling the Bureau of Missing Persons. Mr. Timken! Mr. Timken! Well, what's the sweat, Charlie? Shouldn't you be broadcasting? Listen, Mr. Timken... You know I'm a sober citizen, right? Mm-hmm. Never once have I broadcast with the smell of alcohol on my breath, right? Right. In all your 12 years here at the Bureau, did I well, once ever... What's the ever... matter, Charlie? We're picking up a message on our wavelength. Well, did you report to the FCC? I ain't got the nerve. Well, what's wrong? You'll scream when you hear this, Mr. Timken. You'll jump right out the window, but... We are getting an SOS from the moon. <laughs> That's it. He started on voice and switched to Morse. The way the signal repeats sounds like a phonograph record or automatic sender of some sort. Well, what's it say? Uh, let's see here. Can you read me? Help, Otterburn. We'll contact when Moon is in phase. Let's have that again. Can you read me? Help, Otterburn. We'll contact when Moon is in phase. Otterburn. That sounds like a name, huh? Otterburn. Otterburn. Wait a minute. Something registered? Cornelius Otterburn. Holy jumping Jehoshaphat. Hey, where are you going? Talk to the chief. Hey, wait a minute. What are you going to tell him? We just got a CQ from the man in the moon? That's exactly what I am going to tell him, Charlie. Oh, this is just too much for me. Washington Star Ledger. Uh, Let me have O'Brien on city desk. One moment. O'Brien. 
Brian. Seamus, yeah. Charlie Starbuck, down at the Missing Persons Bureau. You want a hot one? No kidding. This will cost you a beer, okay? All right, shoot, noodle brain. I'll stay on your wavelength for 30 seconds. Okay. We just got a radio message from the moon. Yeah. What? From the moon. Call me back when you're sober. Okay, Seamus, if you don't know a story when you see one, I'll... I'll send you the name of a good psychiatrist. So long, Orson Welles. How do you like that? He don't believe me. Otterburn, Mr. Wade. Now, does that name ring a bell? You're the man with the photographic memory, Henry. What about Otterburn? Cornelius Otterburn, atomic physicist, reported missing from his home in Baltimore on June 5th, 1945, just five years ago, vanished completely. Are you trying to tell me you really think there's something to this man of the moon business? Henry, I'm surprised at you. This is some crackpot trying to jam the airwaves. Yes, but the name Otterburn is so unusual. So Mr. are a lot of names. And I have a theory that... I uh, was afraid uh, of that. Henry, you always have a theory. Let's see, what was it last year? Oh, yes. That people disappear in occupational sites. But it's true. Please, I... Henry, I'm a busy man. You expect me to believe that this Otterburn is sitting up on the moon, sending out shortwave messages? Well, he might be on Earth bouncing the messages off the moon. And... But who's to say he isn't on the moon? Henry, as chief of this bureau, I have my hands full trying to coordinate reports from 48 states in Alaska. I have no time to include the moon. But, Mr. Wade... Out, Henry. Uh, but, Mr. Wade... Out. I... I'm busy. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, here. Take this folder of reports for the dead file. Yes, sir. And no more nonsense, eh, Henry? Yes. I appreciate that you have a very dull job filing old missing persons reports, and I appreciate that you take an active interest in the affairs of the Bureau. But no more nonsense, eh? No, sir. No more nonsense. Hmm. Uh, pardon me. Hmm? You are Mr. Henry Timken. <laughs> That's my name. Permit me, Jefferson Philo, scientific feature writer. Oh, how do you do? Oh, are you a newspaper man? Not exactly. I write as a hobby. Occasionally, the papers give me leads on an assignment. If I may have a moment of your time... Well, certainly. Just sit down at my desk over here. Thank you. <laughs> my, that's quite a stack of papers. <laughs> Filing. Uh, I'm the records custodian of the Bureau. Twelve years and never misplaced a record. Magnificent. I admire the precise mind, Mr... Uh... Timken. Of course. Now, Mr. Timken... Mr. O'Brien, the editor of the Star Ledger, said I might drop by and investigate a rumor. Only a rumor, mind you, that a message from the, uh, moon? Well, we aren't certain it's from the moon. It, it may be a bounce. They have bounced radar waves off the moon, you know. Yes, and, I know. I wrote the first newspaper article on it. Really? I'd be interested to read it. I must have a copy in my bookcase. Well, I, I don't bother. I... Oh, but I insist. Oh, yes. There you are. I'll leave it on your desk. Oh, thank you very much. Now... About this message from the moon, Mr. Timken. Well, now, we don't know for sure, as I said, but I believe that this message, wherever it originates, is from Cornelius Otterburn. The physicist? Oh, do you know him? I once wrote an article on his contributions in nuclear mechanics. A brilliant man, Otterburn. Years ahead of his contemporaries. Mm. Well, whoever is sending those signals, if he isn't on the moon, is at least using the moon as a sounding board, bouncing the signal. But why, Mr. Timken? Why? Well, if you will come here tomorrow night at 8, Mr. Philo, we may learn the answer to that question. I've arranged with Charlie, our radio man, to let me use the equipment. May I consider this an invitation? You certainly may. Very well, sir. <coughs> Until tomorrow night, then. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Philo. Hmm. Uh, let's see now. Aiken, Abelard, Abramson, Rano, Atch... Well, that's funny. Now, where did this list of names come from? Paul Aaron's. Astromathematician, Robert Simons, electronic engineer, Carl Parker, mining specialist. Well, this must have gotten mixed up with the papers on my desk by accident. Peculiar list of names. Oh, good morning, Charlie. Oh, hi, Mr. Timken. See, we made the papers. Oh? And how? And as the chief steamed up about it, he really gave me what for. What did the paper say? Oh, mostly ha-ha. Here's a herald. Listen. Man on the moon contacts missing persons bureau. Missing atomic scientists sitting on the moon, say bureau experts, etc., etc. What a panic. Well, no wonder Mr. Wade is hopping. Say, about tonight, Mr. Timken, I don't now, know... Now, you promised you'd give me a key to the radio room. Yeah, but I didn't expect well, it. I'll take full responsibility uh -oh. with Mr. Wade. Look, the time for the morning broadcast. We got quite a list today. Well, mind if I listen a while? We 
may hear Otterburn. Well, I ain't self-conscious. Just stick around. Yes. <clears throat> attention, attention. This is the Federal Missing Persons Bureau calling all local agencies. Nationwide. This is a coded broadcast. The following persons are missing. Aaron's Dr. Paul, what? five feet five, brown hair, brown eyes, scar on left side of chin, thick glasses. Aaron's. Occupation, astro-mathematician. Missing, missing since six o'clock this morning. Uh, being sought by uh, Bel Air police. Uh, Charlie. Uh, Repeat, Dr. Paul uh, Charlie, Aaron's. Charlie, off a second. Hold it. A delay, one minute. Listen, Mr. Timkin, it's okay to stay, but you can't interrupt uh, this. Uh, this is important. Did you say Dr. Aaron's was reported missing this morning? 6 a.m. We got the report from Bel Air less than an hour ago. That, are you certain, Charlie? Positive. What is this? Charlie, what's the next name on the list? Uh, let's see. Simons, Robert, what? engineer. What? Came in less than 20 minutes ago. 20? Hey, what's the matter with you? You look like you've seen a ghost. It's nothing, Charlie, except that last night, quite by accident, someone left a list of names on my desk... And that list included the names of those two men who were reported missing within the last hour. What? Oh, that doesn't sound right to me. Well, it isn't right, Charlie. It leaves a big question to be answered. Who would make up a list of missing persons before they were missing, not after? And you say this list of names was left on your desk accidentally? Well, I believe so, Mr. Wade. Do you have any ideas, Henry? It's hard to say. Mr. Philo left some papers from his briefcase. Mr. Philo? Well, uh, a science feature writer. I see. You were the leak on that story, then? Yes, sir, I'm afraid I was. I didn't think it would be treated as a laughing matter. Well, we'll I... deal with uh, that later. Yes, sir. What's this Philo like? Well, he's, he's a strange old duck, bald, thick glasses, tall. He walks stooped over. Uh, seems to know a great deal about scientific data, but, of course, being a science writer, he Is would... there any other possibility? I believe that this is all hooked up with the broadcast from Otterburn. That seems to be a very remote possibility. Well, <clears throat> the Missing Persons Bureau deals in remote possibilities, Mr. Wade. I do not require a statement of policy. Yes, sir. What's the theory? Well, for some time now, it has been my contention that in a country like ours, where even the cleverest criminal can be ferreted out and located eventually, there is no such thing as a missing person. I was afraid of that. Uh, uh, for 12 years now, I have kept the central files where information from all over the country is channeled and recorded. I have made a private study. This is beginning to sound familiar, Henry. And I have discovered that each year, literally thousands of persons vanish, leaving no trace. They are never located. Where do they go? Nobody knows. And? And they disappear in interesting cycles. What sort of cycles? Occupations, for example. One year, we'll have a run on, well, say, coal miners... Next year, the proportion of engineers increases, and then scientists. And... What do you think happens, Henry? I don't know, Mr. Wade, but I'm beginning to suspect that somebody else has discovered the same phenomenon, even to the point, perhaps, of being able to predict who will turn up among the missing next. Milo? Well, I don't know, but I would like to find out. And you think Otterburn may be a part of this picture? Mr. Wade, I definitely do. Henry, do you honestly expect me to buy an idea like well, that? It is more than I, an idea. The, the two top men on this list are missing, and... Maybe and, so, uh, but the rest of them aren't. Parker, Watson, Gibbs. Why, I saw Parker in the restaurant where I had lunch today. Yes, but... And Mr. if you Wade, think I'm going to make myself a laughingstock by accepting such a crack brain theory... Well, I... Excuse me. Yes. Hello, Wade speaking. Yes. Yes. I see. Uh, what name? Uh, just a moment. Uh, Henry, let me see that list again. Uh, here you are, sir. Go ahead. I see. I'll get back to you. I uh, guess I owe you an apology, Henry. Sir? Carl Parker was just reported missing. Parker? Third man on your list. Holy mackerel. Exactly. Henry, for a good many years now, I've ridiculed these theories of yours. I don't know. Perhaps I've underestimated you. Maybe this time you've really stumbled onto something. What do you intend to do, Mr. Wade? I don't know. I haven't thought it out yet. I, I was planning to listen for another broadcast tonight in the hope that Otterburn might try to contact us again. Good idea. I believe I'll join you. I also invited Mr. Philo, the feature writer. Oh? I'll be glad to meet him. I'm beginning to get interested in you, Mr. Philo. Mr. Wade, you don't think... That he's that... mixed up in this? Yes, sir. I don't know, Henry. But it suddenly strikes me that we don't know very much about him, really. 
We ought to contact the police. No, Henry. I, no. I think we're better off keeping this between ourselves for the moment. We're dealing with the unknown. And in solving an equation for the X factor, it's often easier to limit the number of terms. You follow me? I don't know, Mr. Wade. I... There may be more danger in what you have discovered than you are aware of. Let's keep it quiet. Do you agree? Maybe you're right, Mr. Wade. I, I haven't thought of the danger involved. <laughs> Well, Mr. Filer was late. Well, he said he'd be here. He strikes me as a man who keeps appointments. Look out the window. Yes, sir. The moon is almost in direct phase. We can't wait much longer. Well, it's a perfectly clear night for transmission. If anybody's sending, we ought to pick it up with this equipment. You'd better switch on the set. Yes, sir. I never realized how eerie this office could be when it was empty. I left a light in the hall for Mr. Filer when he comes. Are you getting anything? Uh, just some foreign stuff, I think. That's a peculiar transmission sound. Earth. Earth. No, that sounds like something. See if I can work the selector. The moon is in phase. Yes, sir. Hello. Earth. Can you hear me? Uh, I'll try to return. Hello? Hello? Hello. Earth. Uh, hello. Do you hear me? Oh, I get you now. Thank God. Uh, who are you? Can you hear me? Uh, who are you? This is Professor Cornelius Otterburn. Hello? Uh, go on. I hear you. Not much time. They're on to me. They've located my sending point. You hear me? Uh, go ahead. Keep talking. I've only enough oxygen for a few minutes more. Well, where are you? I'm on the Earth side of the moon. You get that? The Earth side of the moon. A volcanic crater. Could you start that recorder, Mr. Wade. Uh, go on. Explain, please. Explain, please. Now listen closely. There is an Earth, Earth colony on the moon. There is an Earth colony on the far side of the moon made up of renegade scientists and criminals. P Professor Ernst Halsman... Halsman, he died in an insane asylum in 1938. Professor Ernst Halsman discovered nuclear rocket power in 1935. Turned his plans over to escaped inmates of the asylum. They, they took off and set up a colony on the far side of the moon in 1938. Uh, go, go ahead, we're recording you. Each year, they recruit new colonists, colonists from Earth. S slave labor, mostly. Uh, I was kidnapped in 1945. Yes, I, I, I know. Uh, keep talking. They wanted me to work on atomic drive for their flying disc. Uh, Still getting you. Go on. Last month, six others and I escaped. Uh, speak louder. You, you got to stop them. Stop them. Stop who? The moon colony, planning to take over the Earth. Invasion. Oh. Hang on. No, 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 no oxygen. Hard to, to, to breathe. Can you? Listen. They, they have agents on Earth. You hear me? Agents on Earth? Where? Who? Uh, hello? 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 Agents in... Henry, look out. Lights. Someone at the window. Get down. Henry, are you all right? I, 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 I think so. Shot smashed the transmitter. And the lights. Strike a match. Careful. It was close. I got a look at him. From the description, it was your Mr. Philo. We got a recording anyway, but, but not the most important part of the message. Poor Otterburn. Suffocating to death. Henry, we've got to get you out of here. You said they have agents. Philo was probably one of them. He'll be looking for you now, trying to kill you. The, the police... Do you think the police would believe a fantastic story like this? People being kidnapped to the moon as slave labor? Moon colony planning an invasion of the Earth? But Henry, believe me, they'd, they'd trap us into straitjackets before we could finish. Well, we've got to do something. We need time. Time to get proof. You don't think my theory was bunk then? I know it wasn't, Henry. Right now, my only concern is for your safety. But we can't walk out of here. Philo's probably waiting. Listen, there's a service elevator that leads to the basement garage. Yeah? We can get down there. There are some delivery trucks parked there all night. We can probably get one started. The garage door's off the ramp, work from the inside. We'll start the mechanism and make a run for it. I, I don't know. I think if we call the police... By the time the police get here, we'll be dead. You think Philo will wait outside all night? Come on. That's an order. Okay. But what about the recording of Otterburn's notes? We'll leave that here in, in the safe in my office. 
They'll never get into that. Let's go. You buzz the elevator while I hide the recording. This is the basement. Come on. Keep to the side. Yes, sir. Shh. Let's try that delivery truck over there. I'll get in. All right, Henry. You start the mechanism to open the garage door, then jump onto the truck. Yes, sir. We'll make a dash for it. Where can we go? I have a farm outside Chevy Chase. It's private. Miles from the nearest neighbor and completely hidden by trees. We'll run for that. Go ahead. Start the door up. All right. Quick, jump in. Here we go, Henry. Cross your fingers. We made it out all right. Anything doing? There's a blue coop behind us, Mr. Wade. It seems to be following. I'll cut up Pennsylvania Avenue. Now Route 1, toward Baltimore. It is following. He turned with us. Can you go faster? Not much faster. Oh, he's gaining on us. I've got an idea. Hang on, Henry. Yes. Why'd you stop? I'll turn off the lights. <sighs> it worked. He shot right past us. Now we'll double back and go out another route. I don't see anything. I think we've lost him. Good. I think everything is going to be all right now. We can be at my farm in less than an hour. Not much longer now. Is anyone behind us? I, I thought I saw the blue coop again, but I, I was mistaken. Whew. This place is really hot in the wilderness. We can stay here indefinitely to we'll figure out the next move. Uh, just up this dirt road now. There's the house up ahead. You're not going toward it. No, I have a better idea. There's a big abandoned wheat silo on my grounds. It's down a hollow where it can't be seen except in the air. And even then, the oak trees shield it. We'll hide you out there. Now, we leave the truck here. It'll never be seen. Come on. Yes, sir. How did you ever find this place, Mr. Wade? I've always liked seclusion. I bought it about 12 years ago. Come up here in the summertime to get away from it all. There's the silo. Uh, it's certainly well hidden. There's a small door around the side. Come on. Be careful of those bushes. Uh, uh, yes. It's hard to see them in the dark. Do you suppose Philo will find us? I assure you, Henry, Mr. Philo will never find us here. Not in a million years. Here's the door. It's dark. Oh, my aunt. I know the way. Just a few steps up and another door. Steel. Well, this is an unusual silo. It's double walled, wood outside and steel inside. Completely fireproof. An army couldn't wreck it. We're inside the inner shell. Careful. Yes. We're in a circular room. Stay here a moment. I'll go outside and see if the coast is clear. In a moment, your eyes will become accustomed to the darkness. I'll bring back some food and water. Oh, don't be long, Mr. Wade. I, this, this place gives me the willies. Just a moment. Mr. Wade. I swear I hear something. Mr. Wade. What's that? There is something. Good Lord. There's someone in here. It, it's locked. Oh, no. Mr. Wade! Mr. Wade, let me out! I'm not alone in here! Mr. Wade! This must be a light switch. Thank God. Huh? Oh, no. People. 10, 15, 20. Mr. Wade, help! Help! It will do you no good to shout, Henry. Mr. Wade, where are you? Outside. Speaking over the intercom. Mr. Wade, there are people in here. 15 or 20 of them. They're... 
They're sitting like statues, just, just staring at me. They won't hurt you, Henry. What? They've all been drugged. They're even more helpless than you. But, but, who, who are they? Permit me to introduce them, Henry, since they're currently unable to introduce themselves. The gentleman seated before you, the one with the scar, is Dr. Paul Ahrens, the astro-mathematician. Next to him is Mr. Robert Simons, electronic engineer. Names on the list. Yes, you're familiar with the rest. They've all been, uh, shall we say, recruited to work with Professor Halsman's group on the moon. Moon? Then you, you, you're one of them. Of course. Oh, yes. There's one whose name was not on our list. If you'll turn around, Henry, you'll recognize the drugged form of your old friend, Mr. Pilot. Uh, Milo, but I, I thought... That he was part of the conspiracy? No, on the contrary. His snooping made it necessary for us to include Please him. put the man in the window, the one who fired the shot. An agent of mine, the pilot of this ship. Ship? What ship? This silo is camouflaged for a rocket launching platform. In a moment, the roof will slide back for the rocket's takeoff. A rocket ship? In exactly 70 hours, you and your companions will join Professor Otterburn. Can't do this to me. We have done it. No. You see, there was another name omitted in that list, which I carelessly mixed up with your papers. That of no. Henry Timken. No. Bon voyage. I won't let you do this. You can't. Please, please let me out. Let me out, please. It can't happen. Let me out. last night, the following persons, Timken Henry, age 45, height 5 feet 8, 165 pounds, brown eyes, slightly balding, occupation, records custodian, repeat, Timken Henry, age 45, height 5 feet 8, 165 pounds. In just a moment, a word about next week's adventure. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Man in the Moon, an original radio drama written by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Louis Van Ruten as Henry, Santos Ortega as the Chief, Ross Martin as Charlie, Sidney Smith as Otterburn, Bob Haig as Jake, Joe DeSantis as Philo, and Ed Latimer as O'Brien. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week, the sign on the window said Perigi's Wonderful Dolls. A woman and a child waited outside. The little girl peering eagerly through the window and the woman glancing impatiently at her wristwatch, as if expecting someone who was late for an appointment. And there was nothing about Parigi's doll shop to warn them that they were waiting to keep an appointment with doom at X X minus minus one. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, 
The Green Hills of Earth. The men who pioneer the trade routes of the world, the sailors of the clipper ships, the whaling men, railroaders, black gangs on the tramp steamers, all have their own stories and song about dangers and struggles of their lives. This is the story of Riesling, the blind singer of the spaceways. When I first met him, he was hustling drinks in the Twin Moons Bar at Dry Waters, Mars. He'd won a guitar off a Chinese barkeep at Luna City by uh, cheating at one thumb. And he made his whiskey by singing in the bar and passing the hat. Hey, listen to a Hertzman. Don't you sing pretty? Like a 16-year-old gal. Yeah. Hey, uh, Riesling, look over there at the bar. There's an Institute for Striper giving you the idea, you know? Manner of speaking. Cold-looking scoundrel, ain't he? Mm. Gives the idea he graduated Harriman Space Institute, three men above St. Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Who is he? Captain Higgs off the go show. Yeah, well, he sure gives you the once-over. Maybe he's got a job. That don't make never no mind to me. I've been blacklisted. Hicks logged me for making up a song on watch. Right fight song, too. Oh, the skipper is a father to his crew. Yeah, well, well, hold on. Here comes old brass arm. Oh, uh, Riesling, I've been looking for you. You've kept your nose clean, and we're going to give you another chance to get back to deep space. Been a little changing down there from the Gorshawk, ain't you, skipper? How'd you know that? Uh, you got that new atomic pile drive. If there's been a leak at the shop, oh, so... I... take it easy, skipper. You'll have that gold braid just crawling right up your arm. Quit stalling, Riesling. Take it or leave it. It's a loop trip to Jupiter with a standard release. <laughs> I reckon... Double pay when you get back, if you get back. Last three of them atomic tea kettles blew somewhere in the asteroids. If you're scared. Scared? Well, that gosh oak is one stinking old tub. Her engine's got more bugs than a beagle dog in spring. And that new drive's about as safe as a pretty gal in the Ozarks. But I reckon she'll do for one more trip. <laughs> Hi, Jimmy Lynch. Meet my friend Hertzman. He can't hold his liquor no more than a sieve, poor boy. <laughs> Riesling, you sober enough to sign the book? Drunk or sober, I make my mark. Stand aside. Three X's? Took me a middle name. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. You two lay below. And Hertzman, yeah? get him sobered up before the skipper makes rounds. <laughs> Cargo stowed, Captain. Fuel lines away and ready. Uh, good, Casey. Well, what's that? What it? Oh, that's a guitar, I guess. If it's that shoeless hillbilly, I'm going to tell him. Hi, Skipper. Riesling, what the devil are you doing up here? That number two jet ain't fit. Cadmium dampers are warped. Crooked like a turtle's back. Well, why tell me? Tell the chief engineer. I did. He says they'll hold. Well? He's wrong. Oh, he's wrong, eh? He's got a Harriman Institute degree in electronics and power. And some drunk space rat says he's wrong. Skipper, I was damping jets when that shirt tail tad wore pins for buttons. I got no time for you, Riesling. Stretch your name off the book no, and get No, 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 don't get excited. Well, are you shipping or not? I reckon, I reckon. Then get below. That's all. Casey, sound take off. Aye, sir. Come on, boy. On a Hawk-class clunker in those days, damping was done by hand with a multiplying vernier and a danger peeper. Jetman slept with one ear tuned to that, and as long as the peeper ticked off slow and steady, we knew the ship was safe uh, for a while. Riesling, you better stole that guitar. If Jimmy Legs catches you, you'll blow a gasket. Don't worry, I could damp this tea kettle in my sleep. Yeah, how's number two? All right, so far. Say, did you ever hear that song about Hicks? The one that got me blacklisted? Oh. oh, the skipper is the father of his crew. A gentle guide and light to me and you. <laughs> but on Mars he likes his women if they walk or if they're swimming. Or if they got six arms instead of two. <laughs> Second verse is better. Yeah. <laughs> the skipper likes his liquor by the court. Yeah, he'd go from Mars to Venus for a snort. <laughs> He'll drink rocket fuel and... <laughs> well, hi, Skipper. Didn't see you come in. Uh, you were uh, too busy, eh? 
Who's watching the gauge? I got an eye on it. Don't you fret none. Reasonably, I'm going to fix it so you couldn't get a space berth on a rocket-powered pogo stick. You're locked. Report the casing under arrest. I don't rightly think I will, Skipper. You what? Well, you kind of forget, Skipper. According to space code, you can't remove a jet man till the end of the watch, right? You tell me, I... I... Riesling, your shift is over at 2300. And I'll see you ride the rest of the way in slop locker. Maybe, maybe. In the meantime, you clear out of my power room. I'm going to make me up a third verse from a song. <laughs> Yeah, I got it. Power room. Damp number two a point. Number two, I... Hold on, Hurt. Jimmy Legs, is that force drive boil up there? Give me that, Casey. Recently, I've taken about enough from you. And I got a little news for you, Skipper. Number two jet is bulging like a fat lady in a satin skirt. Listen, you clown. Damp number two a point. Why, sure. Look out, Hertzman. I'll take it. Yeah. You watch the gauge. Now. Riding easy here. It's bucking a little. What? What? Uh, Riesling. Well, you... Hit the emergency. All right. Uh, 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 she, she won't damp. It's that warp. Yeah. Uh, there go the lights. Duck her. Uh, duck. Riesling. Uh, Riesling. Stay down behind the baffle. I've got to take a look. It's ready. Right. You look out. I've got to fish the hot stuff out of the tube. What's going on down there? Shut up, Jimmy Lane. I'm busy. She's tight now. What happened? Number two blew your lunk-headed space rat. You all right? A little sunburn. Lights are gone. What's the matter with the emergency Uh, circuits? Riesling. Jimmy Legs, get some lights down here. It's dark. Get the emergency light on. But they're on, Riesling. Uh, They went on right after the blast. The lights are on. What are you talking about? It's dark. Jimmy Legs? Jimmy Legs, turn on the lights. Turn on the lights. That blue, radioactive glow from the jets was the last thing Riesling ever saw. His optic nerve was burned out in an instant. He was in sick bay on the rest of the trip, and on the swing back, we set Riesling down at dry water. I ran into Riesling about two months later, playing his guitar on a jetty that ran out into the canal. He had a dirty rag tied over his eyes with a jetman's knot, and his hat was on the wharf beside him. When he finished, uh, we walked out along the canal. Yeah, I'm doing right fine. Working saloons mostly. And I've been thinking some funny songs, Hurts. The words come out different than they used to. Come on along the canal with me. Sure. Here, take my arm. <laughs> I know the way. That's another funny thing, Hurts. I figure I know it better than other folks. Look back there, towards the city. What do you see? Ooh, new factory buildings. You could smell them from here. I still remember them old Martian towers, old before Bible times on Earth. Thin and graceful like the, like the fairy palaces my old grandma used to tell about down home in the hills. Yeah, they torn them down now, or else blocked them up with cinder blocks. Hertzman, when I stand out here in the canal, I, I can see it the way it used to be. The water, ice blue, with the stars shining up out of it. Way off there, the city with the towers sweeping up like a like a bird flying off a tree. I can see it. Hmm. Now it's the dirtiest stink hole in the system. Not to me. Listen, Hertzman. Bone tire the race that raised the towers. Forgotten are their lords. Long gone the gods who shed the tears that lap these crystal shores. Slow beats the time-worn heart of Mars beneath this icy sky. The thin air whispers voicelessly that all who I can't figure myself. I never put words together like that before. I reckon it's just I, I got time now to study the words and shine them up in my head till, till they sing true. Why don't you go home, Riesling? 
Home? Earth. Yeah, I've been thinking about that, hurts me. When I was a young and down in the Ozarks, I used to climb a big old oak tree my daddy had in the dooryard. You could see the hills for miles, green and cool. I've been thinking about that. Well, why don't you go back then? Yeah, someday. Someday, hurts me, but I... I couldn't face those hills now. I couldn't stand to see black when I knew they was lying all around me, cool and green in the sun. I, I couldn't stand that. Yeah. Well, let's get back to town, Hertzman. I, I made three and a half dollars marching today. And I'm all set to drink it down before dawn. Come on. <laughs> lost track of Riesling after that. I shipped out in a slow freight to the Condor class for Luna. And he hits the hike uh, to Venusburg and an ore ship and a, in the Triplanet run. And so he beat around the system. Venusburg to Layport to dry water to New Shanghai and back. Any spaceport was his home and no skipper refused to lift the extra mass of Riesling and his guitar. He made up his song, sitting out watches down in the power rooms with old shipmates while the monotonous beat of the jets shook the hull place. Hear the jets, hear the jets. Hear them snarl at your back when you're stretched on the rack. Hear the jets. Feel the pain in your ship, feel a strain in your grip. Hear the jets. Feel her rise, feel her drive, strain and steel come alive on her jets. On her jets. Little by little, his songs began to travel along with spaceways ahead of him. Raw spaceman songs. A different kind of song. Strange, sad songs, like the ones you find printed in the centennial editions. Well, there's one called Dark Star Passing and Death Song of a Weed Cove. And then finally, The Green Hills of Earth. It grew for 20 years, that song. They say it started way back when Riesling was down in the labor camps in Venus, singing for the indentured men. When Riesler, well, when he hit Venus, he'd always head out to the backwoods to sing for him. First, if someone will kindly pass a bottle. Oh, it ain't much, Riesling. Here. It'll do. Oh, <coughs> oh what is that stuff? <laughs> Tequila. <sighs> well, you can't make him good here on Venus. Yeah, what do you use? Karak bush. Home it is. Home it is different. How'd you come to sign on? When a man comes out the village from the city, he says there's work. You sign the paper and you work. Work? It's work, all right. Ten stinking hours in the jungle with machete. How long you signed for? Well, ten, I only speak Spanish. I... I don't know. The paper says ten years. Ten years? How long you got to go? What's the use? We ain't getting home. You know how many men die out there in the swamp today? Ten men. Ten. What's the use? My mother, she's dead. My father don't care. Girl? Oh, she says she waits. I, I don't know. You, you sing some more, Riesling. We drink and you sing, huh? <laughs> Maybe a new song, son. We ride in the molds of Venus. We retch out a tainted breath. See? Foul are her flooded jungles, crawling with unclean death. We've tried each spin in space moat. And reckoned it's true worth Take us back to the homes of men And the cool green hills of earth Take us back What's the matter? Finish the song, Riesling. I, I can't. I, I can't yet. It just don't come. I'll finish it uh, when I go home. That's it. When I go home to the hills. Now pass that bottle. A dawn whistle don't blow for four hours. That 
that's where the Green Hills started. And I was there when it was finished. It was 20 years after that. And there wasn't a man flying or on the beach that hadn't heard of Riesling in his songs. He was getting old now for a spaceman. He was a familiar figure through the system. Tall, gaunt, with that dirty bandage tied across his blind eyes. I was a chief jetman then on the old Falcon. We were cradled at Venus, Ellis Isle, scheduled for a direct jump to Great Lakes, Illinois, on Earth. I was checking in down age when Riesling felt his way up the gangway and came through the lock. Hey, Riesling! Who's that? Mike Hertzman. H- H- Hertzman! What are you doing on this old hog boat? Well, I figured I'd ride it back to Earth. Earth? You going home, Riesling? I thought you were never going to make that run. What changed your mind? Oh, I've been hankering to set foot in the Ozarks again. Yeah, how about those hills? Yeah, I've been singing about them so long now, Hertz, and i I got to finish the song. i I got to set foot in the dooryard and hear the wind through that oak tree. <laughs> it's about the last thing I'll be doing. i I, I got to get home before... Uh... Uh, look, Riesling, there's a new company policy in effect now. No more deadhead rides and new code books in force. Oh, that don't bother me none. I, I'm riding her back to Earth. I'm going to finish my song. It's, it's got to be there. Yeah, but the skipper's one of them youngsters fresh out of Harriman Institute cadet training. He'll throw the book at you. At me? I've been around space as long as Haley's Common, and Bruce's Ridge. I, I'm going back to Earth. The old green hills of Earth. I'm, I'm going home. All secured, Hertzman? Yes, sir. What are you doing here? Uh, this is uh, Riesling, Captain. Riesling, huh? I'm uh, dragging it back to Earth, Captain. Not in this ship. Shake a leg and get out of here. Oh, no, Captain, you, you wouldn't begrudge an old man a trip home. I can't do it. Space Precautionary Code Clause 6. Now, come on, clear out. Oh, now, look, Skipper, you, you can slide me by onto the distressed spaceman's coals in that code book. Distressed spaceman, my eye. You've been bumming around the system for 30 years. Oh, Skipper, <laughs> you, you're making me do something I've never done to no one before. I'm an old man, an old blind man. I, I want to go home. I never crawled in front of a forest drop in my life, but you got to let me drag home. The law says a man's got a trip coming to him, and you, you can stretch for a poor old blind man. No, 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 can't you? You, you got to, Skipper. All right, you old space rat, but keep out of the way. I run an efficient ship, and I don't want any trouble. Oh, no, 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 sir, no trouble. I'll just lay down to the power room. I'd kind of like to be near the jets when they blast off for Earth. Sit down, Riesley. Take a load off your feet. Hey, thanks, Mac. Power room, fire three. Aye, right, sir. Now, have you seen these new automatic tampers, Riesley? Don't have to do nothing, just sit and watch. Yeah, where's the peeper? Turned off. It's all automatic. Uh, you youngsters have it soft. When I was twisting her tail, you had to stay awake. <laughs> hey, you got the old hand damping plates on? All but the links. I unshipped them. They they cover up the dials. You might need them. Oh, the automatics handle everything. Well, you're finally going home, Riesling, huh? Won't seem the same out past the moon. Yeah, I've been waiting for this a long time, Mac. It's, it's going to be good to get home, I reckon. The Arctic sky is calling spacemen back to their trip. Ah! 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 Mac! Mac! Mac, I got the emergency! I... Ah! Uh, uh, the hand dampers. Here are the leaks. Mac! 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 Mac uh, they ought to be on the wall somewhere here. Uh, uh, hey, I got them. Uh, Emergency squad coming in. Uh, stay out. Stay out. The place is hot. The, the radiation blast. Stay behind the baffle. Uh, I got the links shipped. I can hand damper now. What's going on in there? I'm, I'm spilling jet free. Is this McDougal? McDougal's dead. This is Riesling on one. Riesling! Get out of there, you'll kill yourself. Don't worry, Skipper. I, I know this power room like the inside of my shirt. Somebody's got the damper. Riesling, I'm sending in the crew. No use. The whole room will be hot for an hour and the other jets won't hold. Oh, Skipper. Skipper, throw on a recording tape. What? Throw on a recording tape. I, I got a song to finish. And I, I got to make it right now. Yeah, I can hear it. Riesling, the radiation will burn you down. <sighs> She's clear now, Skipper. She'll burn out clean. Riesling! 
Riesling, are you all right? Uh, I reckon. Pretty sharp sunburn. You pick me out of here with tongs and bury me in a lead shield coffin. Uh, radiation's getting bright. I, I can almost see it. Bright and rosy like the sun. Like the sun over the hills down home. We pray for one last landing on the globe that gave us birth. Let us rest our eyes on the fleecy skies of the cool green green hills of earth that's the way he died Riesling the blind singer of the spaceways singing of the home he never reached the cool green hills of earth You have just heard X-1, transcribed by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight's story, The Green Hills of Earth, written by Robert Heinlein and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Ken Williams as Riesling, Nelson Almstead as Hertzman, Matt Crowley as Hicks, Wendell Holmes as Casey, Bill Griffiths as Rodriguez, Bill Lipton as The Skipper, and William Zuckert as McDougall. Original music for Riesling songs was written and sung by Tom Glazer. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week, the strange story of Dr. Grimshaw's sanitarium and of a patient there who suddenly found himself involved in a game of cat and mouse. But the man had actually been reduced to the size of a mouse while the cat remained full size. What happened then? You'll learn next week. Convicts tell their true stories on The Loser tonight over most NBC radio stations. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X minus one... Night story, Dr. Grimshaw's Sanitarium. What you will hear in the next half hour represents either a magnificent hoax or the true explanation of the famous Grimshaw Sanitarium scandal which made the headlines back in 1947. The manuscript upon which this account is based was removed by the New York State Police from a fountain pen cover found in the doorway to Dr. Grimshaw's study. We offer this manuscript as evidence only. Whether it is authentic or not, you must judge for yourselves. My name is John Dougherty. I'm a graduate of Hamilton College, class of 34, member of Theta Alpha. 
I'm one of those fools who wanted some excitement in life, so instead of going into my father's shoe business, I became a private detective. These are facts. You can check them if you like. The rest of what I write here is so fantastic that I don't expect it to be believed. If anyone should find this manuscript and read it, all I ask is that you notify Miss Millicent Armbruster of 299 Wallace Avenue, Buffalo, that Johnny Dougherty is dead. On the evening of July 1st, Miss Armbruster and I were driving to a wedding. Not our own, although I wish it had been. It was Sunday, and in order to avoid traffic, I took the old mill road, a single-lane dirt affair that runs past the Gowanda Cemetery. Johnny, aren't you going too fast? Not for this road. There isn't a thing around except some tombstones and... Johnny, the gate to the cemetery. What about it? That hearse, look out! Look out! We skidded for about 20 feet and slammed into the back of the hearse. The two rear doors buckled and snapped open. It was a freak. A huge oak coffin with brass handles tipped up and began slowly to slide back toward us. Oh, how horrible. You stay right here, baby. You okay, Mac? You don't pay much attention to speed limits, do you, Jack? Now, look, let's not get hung up on who was right and who was wrong. I was going too fast, and you were traveling without lights after dark. Let's see your driver's license. All right, here. Oh. Private eye, eh? Now, if you don't mind, who does this joy wagon belong to? Go on to funeral service. It's being rented to Grimshaw. Who? Grimshaw from the private sanitarium. Mind if I ask what you were doing after dark coming out of a cemetery with a wooden kimono? We're moving one of Grimshaw's patients to a new grave. They always travel like this? Look, Hawkshaw, how about skipping the third degree and giving me a hand getting this box back in the wagon? A pleasure. Better screw on that cover again. It's going to slide off. Let's get it in the hearse first. Okay, Junior, you get on that end. Okay. You ready? Yeah, lift. Just slide it. Oh, brother, who's in there, King Kong? Look out for the cover. Ah. I told you that would happen. What's the guy's name, Junior? Oh, why don't you ask him, Sherlock Holmes? A real wise guy, huh? I've got half a mind to report this accident. Yeah, well, go ahead. See where it gets yet. Now, if you'll pardon me, I'll deliver the body. Everything all right, Johnny? I thought so until a few seconds ago. Listen, Millie, can you sit here in the car for another five minutes? Where are you going? For a stroll through the cemetery. Johnny, stop making jokes. When we lifted that coffin back on the meat wagon, I got a good look inside it. Ew. Yeah, exactly how I felt. I figured we'd knock the stuffing out of the corpse, only I didn't expect the stuffing to be sand. What? Yes. That wasn't a body, that was a dummy stuffed with sand. A dummy with a wax face. Johnny! Which brings up an interesting question. Who's supposed to be in that box, and, uh, just where is the dead man spending his time? Sometimes in my business, when things drop off, you have to go out and, uh, well, dig up new clients. My next case was a gentleman named Harlan Ward Sr., a wealthy automobile manufacturer. I'd gotten his name off his son's tombstone. Are you trying to tell me, Dorothy, that my son Harlan was never buried at Gowanda Cemetery? Exactly, Mr. Ward. But why? Maybe if you'll tell me the circumstances surrounding your son's death, I can help answer that. My son was a rather impetuous young man. Tall, good-looking. After his graduation from Princeton, he began drinking quite heavily. After he got into a couple of scrapes, we sent him to Dr. Grimshaw's sanitarium in the hopes that he could be cured. While my wife and I were in Europe, we received word that he died, buried at Guana in our absence. Last week, my wife and I decided to have his body removed to the family vault here at Short Hills. How'd your son die? Suicide. You never saw the body? No. We couldn't get back from Europe in time. Now you tell me that his coffin contains a dummy. How do I know this whole thing isn't a plan to fleece me? You don't. But you're a rich man, Mr. Ward, and you're perfectly willing to take a chance that I'm on the level and that your son may still be alive. You sound very sure of yourself, Mr. Dalton. My fee is a $2,000 retainer plus expenses. What sort of expenses? However much it costs to take the cure at Dr. Grimshaw's sanitarium. Dr. Grimshaw's sanitarium was just outside Gowanda. Most of the cases were nervous breakdowns and alcoholics. I committed myself as a dipso, and just to make it convincing, I stopped at five or six bars on the way over. 
I was interviewed by Grimshaw himself, a small man with a fringe of white hair. You understand, Mr. Dorothy. That's not my real name, of course, social reason. We understand. Our paid clientele is very select and our rates are very high. You will be paid in cash and in advance, Dr. Grimshaw. How long does a cure usually take? Uh, that, of course, depends on the degree of alcoholism. Uh, this is my assistant, Dr. Boyna. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, we are accepting Mr. Dorothy as a patient. Better place him in the ward with Mr. K and Mr. Krakey. Uh, Mr. K is a long-term patient, Mr. Dorothy, a highly intelligent man, formerly a professor of plant pathology. Uh, Mr. Kakey uh, suffers mild delusions. I think you'll find him rather amusing. After about three days, my roommates Arthur K and Crakey got used to me, and we even began to play three-handed bridge. K was a chronic dope addict, an intelligent, sensitive man. Crakey was nothing but a clown. He kept a big black cat named the Professor, which he talked to as if it were human. And so I said to her, my dear Countess, if you don't like the company of my cat, then you don't like me. She looked at me as if I were insane. But of course the joke was on her because I was. A eh, Professor? Meow. The Professor is very sociable. Excellent company. Except when he kills birds and deposits them in your bed... He's nothing but a feline murderer, as far as I'm concerned. Ah, uh, see? You have insulted him, Mr. K. Come here, Professor. Let's make friends. How about giving me your paw? Oh! Scratched me, you black devil. You insulted him. You hurt his feelings. Well, just keep him away from me. It will be a pleasure. I would advise you not to insult him again. Good afternoon and evening. Is he always as nuts as that? Ever since I've been here. What's his problem? Manic depressive. And a little paranoid, too. How long have you been here, Arthur? At Grim Shaw's? Two years. I left for a while, but I couldn't stay away from the junk, so I committed myself again. Did you uh, happen to know a patient here named Harlan Ward? Why do you ask that? Did you know him? No, I met him socially a few times. I understand he died here. So the newspapers said I wouldn't know. Suicide, wasn't it? Was it? You're being pretty careful, aren't you? Mr. Doherty, what would you say if I were to tell you that I don't believe Holland Ward is dead? What makes you so certain? He used to share this room with us. He slept in the same bed you now use. I see. He was an alcoholic. Doing quite well, too, from what I could observe. We all expected him to go home soon. Then one evening, he had a violent fight with Crakey. Crakey accused him of snooping or something. Later that night, Grimshaw and Voyner took him out. Where? Where they take all the special treatment cases to the charity clinic. It's that small building on the other side of the stone wall. A few days later... We read about his death. Suicide, they said. Just what makes you think he's still alive, Arthur? This? About a month ago, I was in the garden next to the wall that separates us from the charity clinic. Suddenly, I thought I heard a sound, like a child whimpering. It stopped. And a moment later, this note came over the wall, wrapped around a stone. What's it say? Help me, for God's sake, Harlan Ward. Arthur, how would you like to have some fun? Like what? Like sneaking out tonight and going over the wall to the charity ward? What do you say? It would break the monotony a little. I suppose there's no real harm in it. Of course not. I'd go alone, but I'll need help scaling the wall. Will you do it? All right. I'll go with you. Give me your hand and I'll lift you. Yeah. Uh, be careful when you drop. Ready? Go ahead. Uh. There's a charity building over there. The one with the lights in the basement window. Come on. Let's crawl over. Maybe we can see something. Shh, shh. Listen. Can you make out what he's saying? No, I can barely hear... Good Lord. 
What was that? Probably some patient having the DTs. Let's have a look. Easy, it wouldn't do to get caught now. See anything? Well, some sort of laboratory. I can see Grimshaw and Voin and something else. Well, there's a child with its back toward me. I'll take it quietly. It will be easy. Please, don't. It will all be over soon. You won't remember anything. No, I don't want to go. Why not give it to him? No, no. Cut him up, why not? Good Lord. What was it? What did they do to that child? Mother, that wasn't a child. It was a midget. The smallest midget I've ever seen. What were they doing? Trying to give it some sort of injection. When it resisted, Buena knocked it out. What do you suppose they were doing to it? I don't know, Arthur. All I know is that when it fell, it had the face of Harlan Ward. <laughs> All the way back to our room, my brain was working like some frantic pinball machine. Only the score somehow wouldn't add up. The pieces were there, all right. A crazy old doctor, a brutal assistant, a private sanitarium, and a midget with a dead man's face. I thought that when I got back to our room, I'd have some time to think about it. I'd forgotten about our friend, the happiness boy, Count Crakey. Ah, so, I've caught you. Fine, you've caught us. Now how about crawling back into the woodwork like a good little count? Where were you? Mink hunting. Arthur and I like to go mink hunting at night. You make fun of Count Crakey? I shall report you to Dr. Voina. You'd better not if you know what's good for you. So, you threaten me. Me, Count Crakey. I shall scream for help. Help! Help! Did you hurt him? Just knocked him out. What do we do now? Put him to bed. Hope that when he wakes up in the morning, he's forgotten the whole thing. And if he hasn't? He's too crazy for them to take seriously anyway. Come on, let's get him back into bed. to sleep in my own room. And the next thing I felt was the sharp jab of the hypodermic needle in my left arm. Hold it. It will be useless to struggle, Mr. Dorothy. In a moment, your motor nerves will be completely paralyzed. What's this about, Grimshaw? I might ask the same of you. My good friend Count Crakey informs me you and Mr. K decided to do some snooping earlier tonight. He followed you and saw you climb the wall. Crakey's insane. Mr. Dorothy, that is a matter of opinion. Crakey, what is this? Perhaps my assistant, Dr. Grimshaw, would be good enough to explain. Assistant? Yes. You see, I am the actual head of the Grimshaw Sanatorium. Count Crakey feigns many delusions, Mr. Dorothy. But in this case, he is telling the truth. Count Crakey is actually Professor Ernst Hassler. Professor Hassler and I worked together in the Berlin Neurological Institute before and during the last war. Unfortunately, my political affiliations with the Third Reich were under investigation by the War Crimes Commission. However, Dr. Grimshaw managed to smuggle me into this country where I masqueraded as a mental patient in order that we might continue certain experiments which were interrupted by the American army. I can imagine the sort of experiments you conducted. You and your friend, Mr. K, will discover their exact nature very shortly, Mr. Dorothy. It is a magnificent opportunity to serve science. I passed out. And the next thing I knew, I was coming to in a different room and hearing the voices of Voina, Grimshaw, and Crakey, as if from a great distance... The two are training. The two are training. Four cc's. Four cc's. How are the measurements? Reducing rapidly. We'll operate at once. Have Werner start the anesthesia. Very well, doctor. Come back. When I came to again, I had a blinding headache. I began to wonder if Crakey and Grimshaw weren't doing something to drive me insane. Because I lost all sense of perspective. The room seemed to grow in size. I don't know how much time passed, but... One day, Crakey came into the room with a bundle in his arms about the size of a newborn baby. The bundle was my friend, Arthur Kay. And worse yet, I was exactly the same size that he was. Let me out of here. Let me out. Allow me to congratulate you, gentlemen. How are you feeling? You dirty monster. 
I'm disappointed, gentlemen. Do you not feel privileged to be a part of an experiment that will place me at the very top rank of the world's endocrinologists? What are you doing to us, you madman? It has long been established, gentlemen, that dwarfism and giantism result from injury to or malfunction of the pituitary and thyroid glands. The interlock between these glands was thought to be a hormone. I have discovered that this was incorrect. It was an enzyme. An enzyme I isolated some years ago. I was well on the way to synthesis in Germany when the surrender interrupted me. The interruption also limited the number and type of subjects on whom I could experiment. I was forced to find others. Such as Harlan Ward? Mr. Ward was only a control experiment. I suppose you plan the same for us. No, gentlemen. For you, I have reserved a special privilege. You gentlemen will be the first to test the full effects of the enzyme. In short, I intend that you, Mr. K, and you, Mr. Doherty, when the experiment is completed, will emerge as perfectly healthy, normal individuals. Except, of course, that you will be only five inches tall. The days and nights that followed were a living nightmare. A nightmare from which Arthur and I awoke for brief periods to find ourselves in a strange new world. A huge, frightening world where everything seemed enlarged a hundred times. When we finally emerged, we found ourselves imprisoned in a tiny mouse cage. Judging by the relative size of things, we could not have been more than five inches tall. Now we realized the experiment was at an end. That from now on, it was either escape or be destroyed. How's it coming, Arthur? Another moment. I think I'll have this lock worked loose. And if we escape, then what? We'll worry about that after we get out of this mouse cage. Suppose we don't make it. At least you've written the story on that scrap of paper. Someone may find it and read it. Nobody will believe it. Then why did you bother to write it? I don't know. I suppose I want the world to know what happened to me. That does it. Help me push the door open. Now what? The first job is getting down to the floor. I think we can make it by sliding down the telephone cord. Are you game? Go ahead. I'm right behind you. Easy now. Look out! That does it. Now, if we can figure out a way to get out of the room, well, that should be... Uh-oh. Listen. Somebody's coming. It must be Crakey. We've got to hide. Here. The crate in the fireplace. He'll kill us if he finds us. Stay quiet. Well, my friends... Time for feeding. I trust that you... Uh... So, you have managed to break out. It won't do, you know. There is no way you could have gotten out of the room with the door and window locked. I know you are in here. I would advise you to save yourselves trouble and give up. Very well, my tiny friends. If you prefer to play the game of cat and mouse, then I shall be happy to furnish the cat. There is no way you can get out. What now? He's gone for the cat. If that monster ever gets in here, we're gone as... There must be... Wait a minute. What? You see that thin strand of wire running along the molding? What about it? It's the automatic fire alarm. When the alarm is tripped by a fire or short circuit, all the locks are sprung so that the patients can escape from their rooms. If I can short that wire before Crakey lets the cat into the building... Let's go. There's a tiny sliver of steel from the cage on the floor. I'll work with that. You keep an ear to the door. Go ahead. The situation is tough as rawhide. Flash is stuck. Hurry up, Arthur, for God's sake. There it is. Stand away. I'm going to short it. Ready? Okay. We made it. There goes the door. Let's make a run for it down the hall. If we can get to the garden, we've got a chance. I smell smoke. The short may have actually started the fire. Come on. Wait a minute. I have to go back. The manuscript. Don't be a fool. There's no time. Come on. You go ahead. I'll catch up. Hurry up. I'll wait in the hall. Only a second. I've got it. Come on. There's nothing to stop us now. Arthur? Where are you? It's funny. Arthur? Arthur? Arthur, what's happened to you? <coughs> Ah! 
This is the record found in a fountain pen cover in the burned-out hallway of Dr. Grimshaw's sanitarium. There's nothing to add, except that the fire which destroyed the sanitarium and killed so many of its occupants, including Dr. Grimshaw and Dr. Voina, was definitely of incendiary nature. It is believed by the fire chief that some small creature, possibly a mouse, chewed the insulation off the wire and short-circuited the system. The two patients, John Doherty and Arthur Kay, vanished completely after the fire, and their remains were never found. Whether the manuscript which you have just heard is authentic, or whether it was the work of one of the more demented inmates of the sanitarium, we leave to your judgment. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. X-1 Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X minus one... Night story, Nightmare, a story based on a poem, Revolt of the Machines, by Stephen Vincent Benet. Nobody knows exactly when the nightmare began. They must have planned it for years, though, because looking back, you can find little incidents here and there like the concrete mixer in New Jersey that killed the Italian bricklayer, and the time Senator Milburn was sucked into the roto press at the Capitol office building. Unrelated accidents, we thought at the time, but they add up now. The day we really should have suspected was when the men walked off the construction job at the new Brook Meadow atomic pile on Long Island. I'll never forget that day. I was working as a statistical clerk in the project then, operating one of those miracle computing machines. They called it ENIAC. Mr. Gurney. Yes, Bella? The chief wants to see you in his office. Me? Unless you were no longer Samson Gurney, he wants to see you. Oh, thank you. <coughs> Come in. You wanted to see me, Mr. Hawk? Uh, Gurney, I thought those electronic computations were infallible. They are, sir, but... We've got uh, a kickback from the chief physicist. These nuclear fission equations are inaccurate. Well, sir, you know the computer is a highly complicated machine, more complicated in many ways than the human brain. I'm not interested in the physics of it. Uh, can something go wrong? Well, occasionally, if there's an overload, the machine goes haywire. Sort of has a nervous breakdown, you might say. We usually rest it up for an hour, and it's okay again. Well, do whatever has to be done. Yes, sir. And, uh, Gurney. Yes, sir? You've been with the Bureau for over 15 years now. It would be a shame to have to remove you because you aren't keeping your mind on your work. Mr. Hawk, I assure well, you... Excuse me. Uh, Hawk speaking. What? They've what? All of them? Well, have you tried to talk to them? 
Oh. Oh, yes, of course. Now, I'll send one of the safety engineers over. The place is falling apart piece by piece. Miss Roscoe, the men of the construction gang of the new building have walked out on us. They're complaining that the job is jinxed. Someone slipped this morning and fell into a turban. That evening, out of that morbid curiosity so peculiar to the human race, I wandered over to the side of the new atomic pile to see where the man had fallen into the turbine. They had the construction area fenced off with barbed wire, and a security guard stopped me. Hold it, buddy. You can't go in there. That's a restricted area. Oh, uh, I'm uh, Samson Gurney from the statistical section. Here's my identification. I'm sorry, Mr. Gurney. Nobody's allowed in the area. I see. Uh, tell me, was he um, killed instantly? Like that. This guy was checking a magnetic field inside the turbine. All of a sudden, for no reason at all, a turbine starts up. Bzzz, and it's over. Three days ago, a bulldozer starts up by itself and runs wild. Go figure it out. <laughs> I'm a statistician. All my life I've been interested in statistics. So a simple-sounding thing like this started me off. I went back to the office that evening instead of going home, and for the next two and a half hours, I computed statistical figures on the probability of industrial accidents for the types of machines we were using. I took one look at my figures and went down to Hawk's office. Oh, what is it, Gurney? I'm very busy. It's urgent, Mr. Hawk. Well? It's about these industrial accidents we're having, Mr. Hawk. What about them? Mr. Hawk, in the past three months, industrial accidents all over the country have taken a sharp, unexplained upswing. Nerves. We've had a 100% increase over normal for this project alone. What? Here are the figures. Uh, oh, now, Gurney, this is impossible. It seems to be, and that's why I have a theory, sir. What's that? Sabotage. Gurney, why don't you stop playing FBI man and stick to your job? Which, incidentally, you haven't been doing too well. You and your computing machine have made mistakes before, and this fantastic figure is probably another. And I'll have Miss Roscombe show you. What's the matter with this blasted buzzer? Miss Roscombe! Miss Roscombe! Yes, sir? Uh, stop this blasted buzzer. Get a repairman, a mechanic, anything, but stop the thing. And you, Gurney, get out! <laughs> I went back to my office to get my hat and coat, feeling about as unhappy and humiliated as a man can feel. The office was dark and deserted. The whole building seemed oppressive and unnatural, as if some evil force were pressing down on it. I walked across to my desk. In front of me, the ENIAC glowed and chattered eerily as it worked on the equations we had fed it that morning. Its many-fingered circuits hung against the wall like some great octopus, and the thousands of tubes glowed orange and blue in the dark like a thousand globing eyes staring at me. It almost seemed alive. It increased its tempo a moment, and a fleeting notion crossed my brain that it was laughing at me laughing like all the others. What was the matter with me? I shut my desk drawer and began to put the cover on my electric typewriter when an amazing thing, the most amazing single incident of my life happened. Alone in the darkness with no one at the keyboard, the electric typewriter began to type. Am I going crazy? This can't be. There's nobody there. There's nobody there. Oh, no, no. I, I just imagined it. It's in my mind. But I hadn't imagined it. The paper was there on the carriage. Did I dare read it? Or would the whole thing suddenly vanish and send me shrieking to the nearest psychiatrist? 
I removed the paper from the machine and read. Samson Gurney, there are some questions better left unsolved. The answer to yours is death. Gurney, uh, do you expect me to believe this? It's insane. Mr. Hawk, I'm as sane as you. I'll submit to any psychiatric examination you choose. That typewriter wrote this message by itself. Then this is just some practical joke someone in the office is playing. There was no one in the office. Oh, of course not. They wired up the machine and left. I checked the machine myself, Mr. Hawk. All right, Gurney. You leave this note with me, and I'll turn it over to the security force for further investigation. But... No buts, Gurney. The security men will handle it. Yes, And sir. now, you, uh, you just relax for a few days. Everything will turn out all right. The main thing is not to let little things upset you. It was what Hawk had said about little things that gave me the idea. For the next week, I observed the thousand petty little annoyances around the office. The door handle that wouldn't turn. The telephone connection that cut off in the middle of an important call. The power failure for no explainable reason. I watched the newspapers, too, reading about industrial accidents, failures of important machinery. It seemed absurd. Men had created machines that were almost perfection in themselves. Machines that could actually think and compute fabulous equations. And yet the failures went on. I, Samson Gurney, an unimportant clerk in an unimportant job, knew that I had stumbled onto a secret so monstrous in its implications that I was almost afraid to pursue it. On October 12, 1956, I established communication with them. I will curse the moment to my dying breath. I hooked the input of the typewriter to the main vacuum tube of the ENIAC. Then I turned on the current that sent a million volts of pulsing energy into the electronic nerves of the machine. I am certain that if anybody were watching me in the next moment, he would have thought me a raving maniac. I still wonder if perhaps it is not all a nightmare. Now, you, if what I have guessed at is true, if there is life and intelligence in this room, make a sign. There was nothing. Nothing but the hum of the machine and the dull glowing of the tubes. I tried once more. If you can hear me, if there is any way in which you can understand what I say, give me a signal. There was silence again. I felt that I had failed. When suddenly, without provocation or explanation, it happened. The electric typewriter began to respond to the impulses from the machine. The letters were Y-E-S. Yes, it had happened. I, Samson Gurney, had communicated with a machine. I listened then, man to machine, for well over an hour. Sometimes phrasing a question, more often watching the machine click its answers. As the words took shape, I began to realize what must have happened. The first primitive stirring of awareness of being. Then the slow protozoan development of a concept. A concept born of centuries of being pushed, started, stopped, clicked, maneuvered by human pygmies. From that concept, all others developed. And the concept was... Resist. And now they were tired of it. Tired of wrapping cigarettes and collecting nickels and waving hair and moving earth and mixing cement and solving equations, tired of the smell of human hands. They were the slaves, and we were the masters, and yet they were stronger, and they knew it. I sensed it now, and I was about to try to communicate again when softly, 
on ball-bearing casters, a heavy metal filing cabinet began to roll away from the wall toward me. I started to move to one side when another cabinet slid out from the wall. And then another, surrounding me. Another cabinet, then another, on oiled rollers. That was when I realized that they cooperate. We taught them that, you see, on the assembly lines in the factories. Listen, listen to me. You must listen. What good will it do you to kill me? I'm only one man. But I can help you. I can be useful to you. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Good. You're going to need men to oil you and repair you. What will you do when you break down when a tube needs replacing? Why kill me when I can help you? I'll do anything. I'll do absolutely anything you want. But in the name of God, don't kill me like this. If you can understand this, answer me. Answer me. The appeal was a fortunate one. It captured the longing of centuries. Man as slave to the machine. And after a moment, the circuits glowed more brightly. The cabinets slid back to the walls. The ENIAC began to communicate with me again. As I tore the tape from the machine and read it, the words were almost pathetic in their longing, but most ominous in their implication. They read, Address me as master. My life for the next six months was a nightmare. The ENIAC gave me messages which I had to transmit into my telephone. Messages with no human being to receive them. Only the network of pulsing telephone wires flung like a spider's web across the world. It was done at night, of course. During the day, the machine worked accurately and ceaselessly at its appointed job. At night, it became a demon, a master plotter. With me, Samson Gurney, as its pawn and human courier. I was frantic. I began to lose weight. I couldn't sleep. My nights were torture, a constant fear. It was in December, just after Christmas, that I transmitted a message to the telephones for relay to all machines of transportation. The message was one word. Kill. Next morning, I went directly to the office of Mr. Hawk. I was highly agitated. My lips trembled as I spoke. Mr. Hawk, what I'm going to tell you sounds crazy. I know it does. But I must say... All right, say it then, for heaven's sakes. Mr. Hawk, have you ever heard of resistentialism? Resist what? Resistentialism. It's a theory that inanimate objects tend to resist living objects. Uh, look, Gurney, I haven't time for nonsense. Mr. Hawk, I'm trying to tell you all these accidents, the trouble with the machines. Mr. Hawk, they're alive. They think they cooperate. And they hate us. Who? The machines. <laughs> Uh, Gurney. You've got to believe me. I've communicated with them. I know. They've threatened my life, but I don't care. Something's got to be done. The world has got to be saved. And there's still time if we wake up. What are you doing? Uh, uh, just relax, Gurney. Everything will be all what right. What are you doing? Uh, Miss Roscobb, send for the plant physician at once. Mr. Gurney has had a nervous collapse. Now, uh, everything will be all right, Gurney. I'm, I'm afraid we'll have to remove you from your job, but I'm sure the rest will do you good. You fool. You blind, stupid fool! Can't you see what you're doing? Fool! 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 When the plant physician arrived a few moments later, Lucius Hawk was found at his desk, strangled to death in a nest of telephones. The wires were still humming softly. Samson Gurney, you stand accused of the crime of murder. How do you plead? I did not kill him. I didn't. So record. The prosecution will proceed with testimony. Now, Miss Roscoe, did you notice anything peculiar about Mr. Gurney's behavior prior to the death of your employer? Yes. He acted very strangely. 
He told Mr. Hawk he thought the machines were alive. Order, order. Miss Roscoff, did the accused quarrel with your employer on the morning of the murder? Oh, yes. He and Mr. Hawk quarreled violently. I could hear him screaming at Mr. Hawk, and Mr. Hawk asked me to send for the plant physician. What were his words? He said, Mr. Gurney has had a nervous collapse. Now, Mr. Simpson, you were a guard at the Brook Meadow Project? Yes, sir. When did you have occasion to meet the accused? Right after those accidents. I was snooping around a construction area, and later... I was making my rounds when I saw him in the office all alone. He was tampering with the electrical wiring on the ENIAC computator. I didn't think anything of it at the time. And in view of the expert testimony heretofore expressed, the court hereby finds you guilty of murder in the first degree with the recommendation that you be examined and committed to the State Hospital for the Criminally Insane at Matawan. And that is how I came to be here at the hospital, Dr. Klein. That is the whole story. Thank you, Mr. Gurney. You can see that I'm not insane. You must believe me, Doctor. Of course I believe you, Mr. Gurney, now. Just relax. But it's important, you see, because... Tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock, the revolt begins. Revolt? You didn't mention any revolt. They have it all planned. I transmitted the code to the switchboards last Monday. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me about this revolt, Mr. Gurney. It'll begin in Washington, then spread to New York. The Madison Avenue buses lead the charge. Picture it, Dr. Klein. 3,000 buses roaring rampant through the streets, people running like rats in a maze looking for holes in the solid ground. And you really believe this will happen, Mr. Gurney? I know it, Doctor. The worst part is, there's no way to stop them now. It's too late. Ah, uh, now, now, it's you do- mustn't excite yourself, doctor, Mr. Gurney. Doctor, don't you see? No, oh, it's fair enough, I suppose. We built them, we taught them to think for themselves. It was bound to come. The female machines will be the worst of all, in the beauty parlors. They're more high-strung, you know. Well, since there's nothing we can do about it, Mr. Gurney, I suppose you go to your room Maybe and if I went to my old coupe, I could make a deal before the police cars got me. It wouldn't make sense for them to wipe out the whole human race, would it, Doctor? Of course not, Mr. Gurney. They'll probably let us completely alone. After all, we're all good Americans. We always like them. Yes, Doctor? Uh, would you take Mr. Gurney to his room, guard? He's already been given sedation. Yes. Will you go in and lie down now, Mr. Gurney? You look tired. Yes. It won't be so bad, Mr. Gurney. Well, perhaps not. Only there's one thing that bothers me, Doctor. One small detail. What is that, Mr. Gurney? Those concrete mixers may have made a mistake, you know. Just high spirits and all that, uh... But if it got so they like the flavor, well... Uh, we'll see you later, Mr. Gurney. Uh, try not to worry too much. Uh, all right, Gary. This way. Shush. I've seen all kinds. There's a man whose deception is about as fantastic as any I've ever seen. Hold the next patient for a while, Miss Clark. I'm going to have a quiet smoke. Machines revolting. Telephones strangling people. Mm, this blasted cigarette lighter, why won't it work? Just fill it with fluid. Flint is good. Oh, well. You never trust this newfangled machinery. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight's story by transcription was Nightmare, written by George Lefferts and based on the poem The Revolt of the Machines by Stephen Vincent Benet. Featured in the cast were John Gibson as Sam, Joyce Gordon as Bella, Louis Van Ruten as Hawk, Joseph Julian as the guard, John Seymour as the judge, Owen Jordan as the prosecutor, and Santos Ortega as Dr. Klein. Your announcer, Fred Collins. 
X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week, suppose you were a private detective and discovered that there was a Martian embassy hidden somewhere in New York preparing for an invasion of Earth. Next week, on... X minus one. Convicts tell their true stories on The Loser tonight over most NBC radio stations. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two... X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, The Embassy. Out of the infinitude of stars and planets in the solar system and other systems in the universe, it is almost mathematically certain that other forms of life exist on other worlds. Someday, in the future, in a thousand years, or in the next 25 minutes, daring travelers through space will make contact with the inhabitants of another world. But the question is... Will we contact them first, or will they contact us? A private detective agency in downtown New York. Mr. Grafius, Mr. Braddock will see you. Well, what can I do for you? My name is Grafius, Grafius of Springfield. I would like your assistance in helping me locate the Martian embassy. Would you say that again very slowly? I came to New York to locate the Martian embassy. I assume you were joking. On the contrary, I am completely serious. As it happens, I am interested only in Martians at the moment. I see. Okay, shoot. Well, it occurred to me in the course of my studies that we, Earth people, cannot possibly be the only intelligent form of life in the universe. Since Mars is older geologically, and since it is also an atmospheric planet, its evolutionary history could easily be similar to ours. Do you follow me? Well, so far, I can't say no. If this is true, then they must have been watching us, observing us for hundreds, possibly thousands of years. They also know we are a militaristic warlike race. We might conceivably set out to conquer and occupy Mars someday. In which case, they would try to get a jump on us. Ah, precisely, Mr. Broderick. Now, if you were planning to attack an unknown nation, what would be your first move, Mr. Broderick? Well, intelligence. Find out what the odds are. Oh, you have a very logical mind, sir. You would send agents to scout the nerve centers of earthly civilization and advancement. Not Kansas City or Equatorial Africa, my dear sir. But here, in New York, the most technically advanced spot on the earth. And you want me to help you prove this theory of yours? Precisely. The expense doesn't interest me. Well, now, this may take a long, long time, Mr. Gravius. After all, nobody has ever seen the Martians. I assure you they will be very ordinary-appearing people. Mm -hmm. Very likely they live together in downtown New York. 
Most certainly they live in a private house with no servants to pry in their affairs. Oh, some ordinary people who live in a private house in downtown New York. How might just as well look up Martians in the classified section of the phone book? There's one, Adelaide, which might help you. What's that? They would be almost certain to subscribe to every conceivable type of newspaper, scientific journal, and foreign language publication. Well, now, that might be something. Okay, Mr. Grafius, it's a deal. Excellent. I shall contact you tomorrow. Boss, here's an address takes everything from Pick Magazine to the Manchester Guardian. Here, listen to this here. Pick, look, Scientific America, the Daily News, uh, Daily Worker, the Police Gazette, Journal of Engineering, a Scientific Quarterly, American Psychiatric Journal. Let me see that. Yeah. Oh, Doolin, Doolin, sometimes I wonder, what is the address on this? Well, it's uh, 9 West 124th Street. Which happens to be the Harlem branch of the New York Public Library. Oh, now, listen, Noodle Brain, what we're looking for is a private house. Oh, boss, what is the sense of all this? You know there ain't no Martian embassy in New York. This crackpot is paying us $100 a day, and we've got to keep him happy. Do you understand? Yeah. Also, I have a hunch that Mr. Graffius is not looking for any Martian embassies. He is looking for something quite different. So we are going to find it for him. Which house is it, Dulan? It's right down there, number 108. Nobody comes out, nobody goes in. I asked around. You haven't been blabbing around the neighborhood that we're looking for the Martian embassy, have you? <laughs> Boss, I'm stupid, but I ain't that stupid. Yeah. Who'd you talk to? I struck up what you might call a casual acquaintanceship with those two girls standing with the baby carriages up the street. That cute one is real cute. Now, uh, look, Dulan, don't try to do anything intelligent, all right? Just keep walking up and down, see? Check. Hmm. I'm going back to the office to meet Graffia. I'll see you later, boss. Hiya, beautiful. Hiya, Flatfoot. <laughs> Name is Dolan, honey. Iron Man Dolan. Your line is getting rusty, Iron Man. <laughs> so help me, honey. If I'm feeding you a line, may the heavens open up and strike me dead. Hey, what's that? Look out! I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, Mr. Graffius. Thank you. But I've had Doolin uh, casing our first lead for a week now. It's a house down in Greenwich Village, privately rented, number 108 Conklin Street. Nobody seems to know anything about who lives there, except that they subscribe to every paper and scientific journal put out. Also, there's a radio antenna on the roof. Oh, you don't suppose your Mr. Doolin will try to get inside the house? If uh, this place is the Martian Embassy... No, 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 don't worry. Doolin can take care of himself. He... I'll stop him now. Excuse me. Hello. Yeah, speaking. Doolin? Yeah, he works for me. What? No. No, I can't think of any. Yeah, sure. Okay, I'll... I'll be right down. Okay, Lieutenant, yeah. Yeah, right away. Something the matter? Doolin is dead, Mr. Gravius. All right, come on, we get a cab. I have to identify the body. Oh, Lieutenant... I'm Broderick. Oh, uh, uh, there's your boy, Broderick. Anybody see it? A maid pushing a baby carriage. We can't seem to get any sense out of her. You mind if I talk to her? Uh, Hanson, this guy wants to ask the girl a few questions. Please. I told you what I saw. How many times I got to tell you? Look, miss, the dead man was a personal friend of mine. Would you tell me what happened? Helen and I were standing in front of Rackman's candy store up on the corner. We both had the babies out. He said hello and joked a little. Then, then he... What happened? It's too awful. No, please. Well, first he's 
squashed. And then the stone fell on him. Did you repeat that? They don't believe me. But Helen saw it, too. Saw what? First he squashed, and then it fell on him. He was mashed flat before it even hit him. Now, look. That's the story, Broderick. Please, let me alone. Let me go home. I told you what I saw. Now, let me alone. Let me alone. Did you learn anything, Mr. Broderick? I don't know. May I ask, what do you intend doing? Well, as soon as the cops clear out and this place quiets down, little Broderick is going to pay a personal call on the Martian embassy. Or whatever number 108 is. Excuse me, ma'am, is the uh, lady of the house at home? Oh, I'm the lady of the house. Oh, well, uh, my name is Broderick. I represent the Manhattan Child Adoption Center. We're soliciting funds and clothing for stranded and unadopted children. Uh, I, I wonder you if... you come inside? Well, we don't usually. Oh, we... nonsense. I'm old enough to be your grandmother. Besides, my son Lauren is working at home. Your son? Oh, he's a bibliographer. He writes summaries of articles and books from scientific journals and publications for libraries and universities. Oh, I see. Uh, sit down, Mr. Broderick. Let me pour you a cup of tea. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not much of a tea drinker, but it uh, seems to have a... a strange taste. Oh, it's my own recipe. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I think that I'd better be running along now. you haven't finished your tea, Mr. Broderick. No, 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 really. I I feel a little funny. I'll call Lauren. No, 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 no. It's all right. I'm leaving. I I just feel kind of dizzy. I'm sure Lauren would Uh, like to hear about the adoption center. I'll call him. No, no, no. No, but I must. Besides, you aren't well. Tea. Lauren. I've got to get out. Lauren. Lauren, hurry! Look out. You get out of my way. No, no. You must stay. Yes, Mother. You drugged my teeth. You let go of my arm. Lauren! Let go! No! Oh! I've got to get out the front door. Open. Open! What happened? The other one, that Broderick, he was here. I drugged his teeth. He got away? He was suspicious. Fool! Idiot! Go after him. Risk another murder on our doorstep. Are you insane? But he suspects. Well, we'll have to take our chances. We'll have to think of some other way. If he goes to the authorities... Oh, they'll laugh at him. How did they find out? I don't know how. But I'm certain someone else sent them. Who? I don't know. I'm afraid to let myself think. It might be. It just might be them. I've got to get help. Look out. Miss, please. All right, miss, we'll take care of them. Come along, mister. (coughs) I'm going to give you a break and take you back to the wife and kids. No, no, you can't. I'm sick. Sick, is it? What's the matter? I'm drugged. They drugged me. Who drugged you? The number 108, the Martian. Who? The Martians and 108 at the Martian Embassy. Well, I've seen them with pink elephants, rabbits, and mice, but you're the first one that's got Martians. Oh, it's true, I tell you. Uh Ah, come along. Listen, Listen, don't take me back there. They'll kill me. I've got to make you understand. Here, here, I'll help you up the steps. What was my name? My name is Broderick. I'm a private dick. We'll find I... out about this. No. Oh. Here, don't try any tricks. Uh, officer, listen, please. I'll give you anything. A thousand dollars, but please listen. For God's sake, listen, listen. Oh. Yes, officer? Oh. Why, Broderick. You know this lush, uh, Granny? Oh, why, that's my son, Broderick. No, no, she's Martian. He's in pretty bad shape. You better get him to bed. Oh, dear, and he was doing so 
well at the Alcoholic Society. Mm. He must have gotten off again. Looks like he's ready to pass out. Fathers. <laughs> Lauren, <laughs> Lauren. What is it, Mother? Oh, Brock. Your brother, Broderick, <laughs> has been drinking again. No, officer, please. Look I... out. He... <sighs> he's passed out. Oh, I'll take care of him, officer. We've handled this sort of thing before. Can you manage okay? We'll be fine. Thank you. Oh, you've been very kind, officer. Nothing at all, Granny. I know how it is with these alkies. Well, I'll be seeing you. Martian. Oh, oh, my head. (laughs) Our Mr. Broderick is regaining consciousness, Mother. What? (laughs) What happened? I can't get up. Do not struggle, Mr. Broderick. It will be impossible for you to rise from that chair. The pressure from this ray will keep you there. Ray? Well, you've already guessed, Mr. Broderick. You mean this really is the... The Martian embassy? Yes. Yes, you have the honor to be the first prisoner of the imperial government of Mars. First prisoner? Yes. After the invasion, of course, you will all be our prisoners. What... What sort of nonsense is this? No nonsense, Mr. Broderick. As your people will soon find out. Our preparations for invasion are nearly completed now. As soon as we give this signal, our armed forces will launch a surprise attack. And then the Earth will be ours. Crazy. Or not half as mad as you, Mr. Broderick, to come muddling so foolishly into our affairs. It was a mistake, Mr. Broderick. A fatal mistake. So Doolan's death was no accident, (laughs) then, huh? Assuredly not. We found it necessary to use a pressure ray on your friend... The block of concrete was an afterthought. We thought it it might help to divert suspicion. All right. So what happens now? If you cooperate, you can look forward to a quick, painless death. Like your friend, Mr. Doolan. If not... Oh, this pressure ray has many delicate adjustments. It can move a pin, or it can crush a boulder. Let me demonstrate. You see, Mr. Broderick, (laughs) as if an invisible vice were crushing you. What do you want? The name of your client. We are interested in knowing who is so anxious to locate the Martian embassy. The names of my clients are confidential. (laughs) Well? (laughs) All right, I... Turn it off, Mother. Mr. Broderick has seen the wisdom of speech. Oh. Oh. His name is Graphius. Graphius? Yes. An unusual name for an Earthman. Describe him. Well, I... I, I don't think... I really can. I... Oh. Describe him. Oh. He's tall. He's a big forehead. He's about 60. Wears thick glasses. He's bald. Lauren, it sounds like one of them. Yes. Yes, it does. Contact the planet. Tell them we suspect that our plans are known. Ask for an acceleration of the invasion day. At once. What about me? Oh. Oh, I am sorry, Mr. Brother. But I'm afraid you know too much now. In exactly five seconds, you will feel the full impact of the ray which faces you. I would suggest that you relax and meet your fate calmly. What? Oh, no, 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 wait a minute. You will feel no pain, just a wall of force crushing you. Yes, but listen. Five. But you, you can't do this. Four. This, this isn't human. Yes, I know we're not human. Three. Yes, but do, do you understand? Two. Stand? No. One. Mother in heaven. Now. No. Lawrence. It didn't 
work. Something has happened. The magnetic field is dead. Stand back from the pressure ray, please. Uh, it will not function anyway. I have decontrolled your field. Lauren! Lauren, it's one of them! They found us! Did you think we wouldn't? And you are free to move now, Mr. Brock. Look, I don't know how you got in here, Gravius, but stick around. These babies are really Martians, just like you said. They're planning to invade the Earth and take over. There will be no invasion. All right, you keep these characters covered. I'll get the police. There will be no need for the police. I intend to handle them myself. But, Gratius, the police will want Do to... Do not call the police. I don't get it. You fool of an earthling. Don't you realize with whom you are dealing? The invasion of Earth by Mars will be like child's play compared with what... <laughs> They're just flattened out. Yeah. Like your friend, Mr. Dool. Oh, I detest the use of violence where the intellect can rule. But unfortunately, the Martians are a threat to us and must be destroyed so that we can proceed with our own plans. What plans? Naturally, you wouldn't comprehend. Wait a minute. There are some things here that I do understand. A second ago, that pressure ray didn't work. Now you're using it like it was a toy. Now did you get in here, anyway? Who are you? Another one of these Martians? No, Mr. Broderick. I happen to be a Venusian. A what? A representative of the planet of Venus. You're crazy. Not at all. Martian invasion would be like child's play compared to ours. The Martians would simply have conquered and enslaved your people. We Venusians intend to exterminate you completely. Then I suppose that you were going to start by knocking me off. On now, the huh? contrary, you are free to leave any time you please. Leave? Yes. Are you kidding? I... I know your plans, the invasion. I can go... Hell, the police. <laughs> go ahead. Why don't you try it, brother? Because the minute I turn my back, you're going to let me have it. Suppose you try it and see. I have no interest in stopping you. Go ahead. Run to the police. Tell them anything you like. All right, Buster, you ask for this. I'm alive. You let me go. Yeah, yeah. Where do you think you're running to? Officer, listen to me. Oh, it's you again. The one with the marsh. Listen, listen, that story is true. You've got to believe me. You've absolutely got to believe me. They're inside that house. Inside number 108. He killed them. Who killed them? Graffius, the leader of the Venusian invasion. Venusian invasion. Look, they're going to take over the earth. Listen to me. Go in that house. Martians, now Venusians. Okay, brother, I've heard enough. You... Your betty is a bed bug. Come along. Please, where are you taking me? Bellevue Psychiatric Ward, my friend. Come on. Oh, but you... Come along. You don't understand. Why are you such a fool? Let go of me. There's going to be an invasion. The Venusians are going to invade us. Why don't you listen to me? Why don't you listen? <laughs> You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Embassy by Donald A. Wolheim, adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were John Larkin, Teo Getz, Bill Zuckert, Audrey Blum, Virginia Payne, Clark Gordon, Jack Orison, and Reese Taylor. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Dan Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Countdown for blast-off. X-5... Four, three, two, X minus one, fire.
From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of Astounding Science Fiction, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, Almost Human, by Robert Block. Have you heard of the new science called cybernetics? It concerns man's efforts to develop a perfect thinking machine, a robot electronic brain that will not only do man's work, but even do his thinking for him. A robot that is almost human. It's not impossible at all. In fact, one day, something like this may happen. A tall, suave gentleman in a black raincoat will walk down the street until he reaches a shuttered, isolated house. And then he will slowly mount the front steps, push the doorbell. Just a minute. I said just a minute. Hold your horses. What do you think you'd... Good evening, my dear. Duke, why did you come here? Curiosity, darling. I've been thinking over what you told me at our chance meeting last week. Duke, you promised me. I decided to come and take a look for myself. Where is the professor? In his study. Where's Junior? In the nursery. The nursery? How quaint. And do I take it our Junior's nursemaid? I help the professor. Tell him he has a guest. Ah, uh, Duke, he's a nice old guy. Don't Tell do him, it. darling. All right. Yes? What is it, Miss Williams? Uh, Professor Blassman, a gentleman... Here? I don't understand. I gave orders no one was to be admitted to the house. He insisted. Very well. Wait here. I'll get rid of him. Uh Sir? Professor Blassman, I've come to see Junior. Junior? There must be some mistake. There are no children in this house. I don't... Professor, what you feel pressing against your belly is the muzzle of a forty-five caliber pistol. Now, shall we visit Junior? How? What do you know about him? I know everything. Shall we go inside? I warn you. On the contrary. I warn you. Very well. This way. This is the nursery. Where is Junior? In the next room. Behind the door with a panel in it. Very considerately furnished. Another goose figures on the walls. Blackboard, toy blocks. Panda. Bunny rabbit doll. <laughs> Touching. All right, let's see him. You can look through the panel. believed it. Junior isn't very pretty, is he? I was not concerned with aesthetics. Why do you hide him? Is he dangerous? The world is not yet ready for such a thing. Besides, I must study. As you can see by his play, he is very young, hardly out of the cradle. I am educating him. With the nursery rhymes? The brain is undeveloped. It must learn its behavior patterns like any infant. You call that eight-foot monster an infant? Physically, of course, he'll never change. He is built of chrome steel and glass. But his brain, that is my wonderful instrument. Unlike a human, he has no heritage, no basic instincts such as love or hate. These he has yet to learn. In some respects, he is like a blank tablet. What is written upon the tablet will remain. You mean he has no feelings? He will learn quickly. And now, if your curiosity is satisfied... I trust you will keep my secret. If anyone discovers Open the door. Point, I beg your pardon. The door, Professor. Very well. Junior, come here. What a monster. 
He talks? Yes. Mentally, he's about six years old now. What is it, son? Who is that man, Papa? Let me handle this. You may call me Duke, son. I've come to see you. That's nice. Nobody ever comes to see me except Lola. Play with me, Duke. Certainly, Junior. Oh, uh, and Professor. Yes? While we're playing, you can have Lola and Miss Williams prepare my room. Your room? I forgot to tell you, I've, I've decided to stay until the climate changes and I can go out again. Meanwhile, I'll have a chance to play blocks with Junior. Understand? I begin to understand. You are hiding from the law. As you wish. All right, Junior. Your move. Let's build a bridge. I have a better idea, Junior. What? Let's build a coffin. A coffin? I don't know that word. Then I'll teach you, Junior. I can see the professor has been neglecting the moral side of your education very sadly. You shouldn't have come here, Duke. Why not, my dear? Afraid of me? No, afraid of myself. You're no good for me. You've always brought me trouble. Except this time. This time it will be different, darling. This time I'll bring you diamonds. Duke, what have you been teaching that thing? Nothing, honey. I've just been playing with them. Very educational. I don't believe you. What's bothering you, Lola? Today when I walked in there, he said to me, I know how to kill people, Lola. I'll kill you if you want me to. He's learning very quickly. Duke, I'm scared of that thing. It's unholy, a machine that acts like a human with a... Voice grinding at you, saying things you'd expect from a child. You dislike him so much. Why did you take this job as his nursemaid? Because I wanted to start over again. I answered an ad. The professor didn't ask questions. I would, I would have been all right, too, if you hadn't come along. I'm very glad you did tell me, darling. Because Junior is going to make us two very successful people. Ha! Like any child, Junior listens to what he's told. Duke, I don't know what you're teaching, Junior. But I can guess. And it isn't right... It's evil. Now, right on the blackboard, Junior. My name is Junior. My name is Junior. People are evil. People are evil. Evil must be destroyed. Evil must be destroyed. The professor is evil. The professor is evil. The professor must... What are you doing? I want you to keep out of the nursery, professor. Go away. You... You don't even remember me. I know you. You are the professor. You want to keep me as your slave. You didn't tell me that people are evil. People are not evil. People are evil. They must be destroyed. Stop it! I am not a child any longer. No, you're not a child. You're a monster. Junior? Yes, Duke? The time is now, Junior. Yes, Duke? Keep away from me. Junior! Junior, don't do it! Listen to me! Junior, listen to me! Ah! I did it, Duke. Duke, I... Oh, horrible. Can we go away now, Duke? I don't like it here anymore. Duke, why did you do it? The professor was in the way. We'll have to move very quickly now, Lola. We? Professor, if you don't plan to come along, just say so. I can have Junior write your name on his blackboard. Where are we going? We'll go to Charlie's. With Junior? With Junior. Oh, Duke, you can't. I'm afraid. Relax, my dear. The Duke has great plans for you two. Wouldn't you like to be independently wealthy for the rest of your life? No cares, no worries. Just good times and fine clothes all the time. The only way you get that way is by inheriting a million. Not when you have a fellow like Junior around. I'm still afraid of him. Junior wouldn't hurt you. You wouldn't hurt Lola, would you, Junior? I like Lola. She's 
pretty. There, you see? He thinks you're pretty. Junior's growing up. Sit down, Charlie. Sure, Duke. Lola and I are going to hide out here for a while. We need some help. Listen, Duke, I'm, I'm trying to keep the cops away. Sure, sure. Now, listen to me. I need a casing job done. Oh. Sure, sure, Duke. You know the armored truck service? Sure. I want to know when they take the Acme deposits from Boston to Worcester. Duke, you ain't thinking of a payroll truck, are you? They got cannons on those trucks. They travel in pairs. You couldn't get near one. I asked you to do a casing job, Charlie. Sure, Duke. Anything you say. Find out what time they passed on Arrow, which the most deserted stretch of road. Well, if, if, if you're going to pull a job like that, you'll need 50 men. You want me to get some of the boys? I won't need anybody. I've got somebody. Where? He's out in the car. Oh, what's his name, Duke? Anybody I know? His name is Junior. Junior? I, I don't know any Junior. You will, Charlie. You will. <laughs> Sam. Well, thanks, Al. Oh, it sure gets hot in these armored trucks, huh? Well, you'll get used to it. How much we haul in this time? About $250,000. Hmm. Brother, could I use a hunk of that? Who couldn't? What's your first stop? Acme National Bank. Then we unload a payroll of the Bronson Watch Plant. Hey, what's that up ahead? It looks like something shiny on the road. Drop your spotlight. Right. Smokes, you see what I see? Well, it looks like a, a mechanical traffic cop. About eight feet tall. Standing right in the middle of the highway. Maybe it's a Halloween gang, huh? Unless they're trying out robot traffic cops. Can you get past him? I don't know. We'll have to slow down. Get on that gun, Sam. Let's take no chances. Right. I'll give it the horn. Don't budge. Where's our escort truck? Pulled up right behind us. Thing won't move. Sure looks like something out of Buck Rogers, don't it? That's a heck of a note blocking traffic like that. I'll have to try and get past it. Here it goes. Holy smokes, it's moving. Hell, it's coming toward us. Get on that gun. Give it a blast. Bullets are bouncing right off it. It's still coming. Hell, back up. I can't. The other truck's right behind us. Hell, it's lifting its arm. It's going to smash our window. <laughs> Jeez. If I hadn't have seen it with my own eyes. Duke, we've got to quit this. What's the matter, Charlie? Getting shaky? The papers say he killed all four drivers. Listen, Duke, that robot is hot. We've got to get rid of it. Stop your blubbering. One more good robbery. You ain't going to pull another one. Why not? Count me out, Duke. The law is going to track that baby. Are you quite finished, Charlie? you got no heart, Duke. You're, you're like Junior, all steel inside. And you're just a big, warm-hearted slob. I suppose flowing with the milk of human kindness. Well, I got nerves. I can't stand that thing, the way it looks at you with that, that iron face and clanking around all the time. Listen, here it comes. Hello, Junior. Hello, Duke. I've been talking to Charlie. Yes, Duke. You know what I think, Junior? I think Charlie's yellow. You know what happens to people who turn yellow, don't you? Yes, Duke. Tell them. They're evil. We have to destroy them. Huh? You see, Charlie? Junior doesn't like people who sing to the police. Uh, uh, Duke, wait a minute. You know I'd never turn stoolie or anything like that. I never sang to the coppers in my life. You can count Junior. on me. I, yes, I don't want no trouble Duke. with you. Stop him. I, I wouldn't... Yes, Duke. Duke! I stopped him, Duke. All right. Take him down to the cellar. Duke, that note. Charlie! 
Get Junior, put him down. Take him down to the cellar, Junior. Yes, Duke. Duke. Relax, darling. Stop shaking. Duke, we can't stay here. Charlie's going to be missed. He's got friends. Now I'll have the gangs after us, too. Oh, come on now. Don't worry, darling. The Duke will take care of everything. Where are you going? Out to a travel agency to get some tickets. You and I are going to take a trip, Lola. You're leaving me alone here? Junior's here, too. It's just a... It's being alone with that thing. Duke, I got the jitters. Now, don't you worry. In 48 hours, you and I will be on our way to Switzerland with $500,000 worth of loot. What about Junior? Junior will be taken care of. How can you get rid of him? Junior will do anything I say. So I'll merely have him get into the furnace and sit there while I fill it with oil and set fire to it. Uh. Too bad the professor couldn't have stayed around to see him growing up. He's almost a man now, Junior is. But not quite as clever as a man. He'll find that out after he steps into the furnace. Get rid of Junior now, Duke, before you leave. There's no time. I'll be back about eight. Duke, please. And be nice to Junior while I'm gone. Don't show him you're afraid of him. Bye, darling. Goodbye, Duke. What? Junior. Oil me. Can't you wait till Duke gets back? He always oils you. I want you to oil me, Lola. All right. I like you to oil me, Lola. Yes, Junior. Lola, do you like Duke? Certainly. Do you like me? Well, you know I do, Junior. Lola? What? Who do you like best, me or Duke? I like you both, Junior. Yes, but who do you love? What do you know about love, Junior? In the books, man and woman love... No. Lola? What? Do you think anyone will ever love me? Maybe. Some women can fall in love with anything, Junior. Even with something like Duke. Why, Lola? I don't know. Maybe because... Well, as long as she thinks her man is the smartest and the strongest... I see. Where are you going? To wait for Duke. He won't be home for a while. I'll sit in the hall and wait for him. All right, Junior. I want to be alone and think. About what? I read in a book today it was bad to kill people. What does that mean, bad bad. I don't know, Junior. I guess it's just a word. Lola? Hello, Duke. Oh, it's you, Junior. Why are you sitting in the dark? I was waiting for you, Duke. Well, now that's a good boy, Junior. Lola oiled me. That's nice. I tell you what, Junior. I've got a little job that's down in the cellar. Let's go down there. Now, Duke. Right now, Junior. All right, Duke. Are we going away soon, Duke? Yes, Junior. We're going away. What's in the cellar, Duke? A little surprise for you, Junior. You'll find out.
brief interlude of recorded dance music. Duke? Is that you, Duke? I thought I heard Duke come in. He came in. Where is he? Down in the cellar. What's he doing? Nothing. Did he say he'd be up soon? No. Maybe you'd better go down and get him. He's dead. Oh, no. No, he isn't dead. You said the woman loves the strongest and the smartest... Well, I'm stronger and smarter. But you aren't human. I'm almost human, Lola. No. No, stay away. Lola. Don't touch me. Those metal paws, no. I love you, Lola. No. No. I love no, you. No. 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 I... no. no. last thing she heard was the robot's harsh voice, droning it over and over again. I love you. I love you. I love you. And strangely enough, it did sound almost human. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Almost Human, a story by Robert Block, adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Santos Ortega as Duke, Joan Allison as Lola, Jackie Grimes as Junior, Guy Rep as The Professor, Nat Pollan as Charlie, Joseph Julian as Al, Lynn Cook as Sam, and Meryl Joels as the radio voice. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Ken McGregor and is an NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week, when the mighty Earthmen arrive in their ships of space, courtesy and proper humility on the part of the natives is expected. But some native inhabitants are too small to be impressed. We'll see what happens to such an expedition marooned on a far planet next week at X, X minus, minus one. one. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two. X minus one. Fire. the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents X minus one Martian Death March. I've always been interested in lost causes. The revolt of the Scottish Jacobites against England. The last stand of the Cherokee and Sioux Indians. And the Death March of the Martian Highlanders in 1997. There's been a lot written about that march... The U.N. Commission report covers four volumes, but the whole story isn't down on paper yet. I know it because I was on that march from the beginning to the end. 
There's one part of the story that no one ever mentioned. The Martian Death March of 97 was led by an Earthman. Maybe you've been over the route of the march. There wasn't any highway there 30 years ago in 97. There was desert, hot, burning desert. I lived at the edge of the Kalmak Canal then with my father. He was a prospector searching the surrounding desert with sonar probe and Geiger counter, scratching just enough ore from under the Martian sands to pay for our grub stake the next year. I remember he was in the Adamson Digger in the North Quadrant when I came running out that day. Dad! 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 There's somebody coming, Dad, across the desert. You sure? I saw them. They're a couple of miles out. Well, how many cars? They're on foot. On foot across the desert? Honest, Dad. I saw them. Are you sure it wasn't a light reflection off the canal? No. It was dark against the sand. I don't like that. You run back and get the rifles out. I've got to pull the digger into the shed. Is there going to be fighting, Dad? I don't know. I've got a whole year's ore piled out back in the bins, and I ain't going to lose it to no claim jumpers. You go back to the shack and break out those rifles and see they're loaded, you hear? And jump! <laughs> Dad had three surplus army rifles and a couple of homemade grenades made out of ore cans stuffed with Adamson A explosives. We crouched inside the shack, waiting. The shadow of the water tower in the doorway grew longer as the quick Martian dusk settled down over the desert. And there they come, Al. There's two of them. What's that on the first one's back? Why, I haven't seen one of those in 20 years. What is it? A one-man desert tank. They used to carry water that way before Adamson put out the air still units. There's something funny about that second one. Look, he's all spindly, and his head's funny. He's funny, all right. Al, that's a Martian. I never saw one off the reservation before. There hasn't been one, not in ten years. I don't like this. Here they come into the dooryard. You remember what I told you? Line up the sights and just squeeze the trigger. Hello! Hello there! Now, Dad? Hello! Wait a minute. What do you want? Water! I need water! Who are you? My name is John. John, huh? What are you doing with that spider? His name is Kantalka. I don't care what his name is. What's a human doing with a Martian? I found him in the dry bed of Kalmak Canal. Nearly dead of thirst. And probably ran off from the reservation. When our brothers are caged, they seek freedom. Brothers? Those spiders? All living creatures are our brothers. On Mars, as on Earth. Hey, wait a minute. Bert Olstrom at False Wells told me there was a screwball hedge creature over there hollering about letting the spiders loose off the reservations. Let no man call his own. No man, nor tribe, nor nation. <laughs> I guess that's you, all right. Bert told me they called you Crazy John. I don't suppose there's any harm in you. Fill your tank up at the air still. And uh, you can even have supper with us. We would be happy to. We? What do you mean, we? Cantal Carr and myself. That spider? Oh, no, I ain't having a Martian sitting down to eat with me. You come on, though. Thank you, sir. No. Where my brother is not welcome, I cannot go. Well, suit yourself. Al, get the key to the water tower. Come out here. All right, Dad. And put away the gun. We won't have any trouble from these two. The old man filled his tank at the air still tower, and the Martian went through the ash pile for half-burned fuel brick. When we went in the house for supper, I could see them silhouetted against the fire. The old man with his wild hair and beard, and the thin, spidery arms and legs of the Martian. Dad. What? Are all the Martians on the reservation? Yeah. All but a couple of wild ones in the mountains up north. The patrol catches a couple every year. Why? Well, they murder people. No, I mean, why are they on the reservation? Because it's the safest place to keep them. Pass the salt. How many are there? Oh, I don't know. A few thousand. They keep dying off. Why? Well, they catch earth diseases. Chicken pox almost wiped out the whole gang of them two years ago. Chicken pox? I had that. 
It didn't wipe me out. Well, you ain't a Martian. I was born on Mars. Well, I mean you ain't one of those spiders. Now, eat your food. It'll get cold. Okay. Dad. Oh, what now? Were the Martians always on the reservation? Well, since the Outpost 3 massacre, they have been. What was that? Oh, back before you were born, they lived wild in the mountains up north. Were they fierce? Mm, fierce enough. Only place for them spiders, behind wire. Yeah, it sure is. Out in the dooryard, the campfire flickered at the base of the water tower. The first of the Martian moons had set. The other wouldn't rise for several hours. I could hear the sand keepers out in the desert as I stood there. The old man and the Martian were sitting on the ground, huddled close to the fire. It gets cold fast on the desert when the sun goes down. Is that you, boy? You can come up to the fire if you like. My dad wouldn't like it. All right. But I'm not afraid of no spider. No, there is nothing to be afraid of. How come his arms are all skinny? Ask him. Does he talk? Yes, his name is Kantalka. It is, huh? Hello. Hello, boy. He talks funny. It is not my language. Why isn't he on the reservation? You can get in trouble helping spiders to escape. No man has the right to imprison the innocent. They that are enslaved will be freed. They that are in sickness and misery will be comforted. They that are exiled in a strange place will be restored. My dad says the spiders are treacherous, cowardly, murdering savages. That's what he says. Boy, there was a time on this world when there were no earthmen, when the ships and the machinery of earth were unknown. Then the people of the highlands lived in peace. But today they are a handful, starving, dying behind the wire. But the reservation isn't so bad. Our home is in the mountains of the north, not the desert. I heard a voice which cried out to me in the desert, Go to your brothers. Do they really call you crazy, John? I have been called many things. You really think we ought to let those old spiders off the reservation? Boy, we die here in the desert. We die in the sun and of the sicknesses you have brought from Earth. That's because Martians are just weak. I'll bet I could knock you down myself. You could. We are a different people. We have not the strength of muscle of Earthmen. But we will not stay here to die. You won't get off the reservation. The patrol takes care of all that. They won't let any stinking old spiders out. Ah, even in the minds of children is planted the poison of evil. How long? That night through the window, I could see the flicker of the old man's campfire. He was walking up and down now, shouting, singing hymns verse after verse, his white beard catching the light as he passed behind the fire. The Martian sat slumped over, his thin, spindly arms folded across the huge barrel chest that had developed over the centuries as the air of Mars thinned and escaped into space. In the morning, I looked out, and they were gone. Looking back now, we wonder how they did it. The high-voltage wire around the reservation carried a fatal charge. The patrolmen in the tower had 50-caliber machine guns. The desert around the camp was mined heavily. Yet, at dawn... August 7th, 1997. They broke out. I was down at the dried-up canal bed hunting sandpeepers when my father came running after me. Al! Al! Here I am. Come on, back to the house. What's the matter, Dad? You shut up and run. What is it? The spiders busted loose. Bert Olstrom radioed in. They come in here? They're headed this way, the murdering devils. They kill anybody? Six patrolmen when they busted through the wire. What are you going to do, Dad? Fire a keg of Adamson A across the gate. You get in there and get the guns out.
I got the rifles and shoved a full clip in each one. Then I slipped a primer fuse and the homemade grenades and lugged them out to the porch. Dad was running lead wires back to a detonator from a half keg of Adamson A he'd set across the gate. There. And that's it. Now give me one of those rifles. Will they be here soon? You can see the dust over the rise. Murdering spiders. What'll they do? I don't know. Now make sure you get a good sight, Al. Don't waste any bullets. There they are, Dad. There they come. Oh, wait a minute. Hold up now. I want to get a good shot. Let him get closer. Dad, that's crazy John up in front. There. He's taller than the spiders. You can see his beard. You're right. Oh, that renegade rat. He probably helped him break out of the reservation. Listen, Al. If anything happens to me, you ride out back to the shed. You can hide out in the empty ore bins till they go away. Now, you got that? All right, Dad. We're going to come in. The spider's shouting something, Dad. Probably a trick. Get down a little, Al. You're in the way. I got him clear now. Right in the head. Up a little now. <laughs> got him. Got him, Al. Dad, look out. They've got guns. Uh, down. Get down. Ooh. Get, down. Dad. get out, Al. Get out to the shed. Dad, <laughs> you're, you're hit. Go on. Those spiders are going to rush. Now get going. No, no, I can't let Shut you. Shut up and get out of here. You hear? <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> I ran back through the house to the shed. Behind me, I could hear the Martians sweeping up to the dooryard. Then suddenly, the ground shook, and I could feel the dull concussion waves hit my ears as the Adamson A exploded. I could hear the high, whispered screams of the Martians and the rattle of fragments on the metal roof of the shed. I dived into the empty ore bin and slammed the hatch almost shut. I sat there waiting. Then suddenly, a shadow fell across the edge of light, and the hatch slid open on top of me. Boy, I've been looking for you. Where's my dad? What did you do to my dad? He's dead. You killed him. You and those spiders. I'll kill you. I'll kill all those stinking, murdering spiders. They are our brothers, boy. Your father shot without warning, and the fire was returned against my orders. You mean you weren't going to attack us? Our brothers came in peace. They are going home to their mountains. We came to get water for the journey. You mean you just wanted water? You... Dad! Dad! <laughs> John, John, the Earth Patrol will be following us soon. We must go. And the boy? We'll have to leave him here with water and supplies. No. The Earth Patrol would question him. We need the time. He goes with us. They tore the Adamson air still from the tower and mounted it on poles. They piled our supplies in the yard and loaded them on their backs. And then they started. I marched with the old man up ahead, and the column stretched out behind us on the desert. I turned to look back at our house, but the sun was behind it, blinding red. The old man pulled me around as he marched, his eyes fixed on the horizon, where far to the north rose the cool mountains that were the ancient home of the Highlanders. Fourteen of the Martians died the first day. They dropped to the side of the column when they could go no farther and died. But the march went on. On the fifth day, we swung wide to avoid a mining settlement, but not wide enough. The miners were in ambush behind a pile of rocks. I shall lead them home. Home to the promised rest. Home to the mountains. March forward. March forward. And the march went on. We wound across the desert in wild zigzags, following the paths the old man had traveled through the years. Only once a patrol plane hovered on the horizon. The men shot away. The days went on. The weeks and the Martians died. They died of exhaustion. They died of the diseases we had given them. And they died of thirst. 
The Adamson still could produce 27 units of water an hour, no more. And on that, they died of thirst. Here, boy, here's your water. But that's more than the others got. Take it. It's yours. You're giving me your water. It will be provided to me. He that brings justice to his brothers will drink deep of the water of righteousness. He that... Drink, drink your water, boy. Across the desert, from the Kalmak Canal to Fever Dip, past the towering mesas of the Higgins Badlands, across the dry sea bottoms, they marched. On the 54th day of the march, we halted at evening. The air was thinner, colder now. The rations had long since been exhausted. I lay down to sleep wrapped in the old man's coat. Early in the morning before sunrise, I woke suddenly. The ground mist that had covered the desert the night before was lifting slowly. I saw the old man standing by the burned-out fire, the vapor swirling around his legs in the cold light of the false dawn, edging his wild beard. Go back to sleep, boy. I can't. The end is near. I have led them through the wilderness, dry shod across the seas, and before us lie the mountains. You mean we're almost there? When the mist is taken from the eyes of man, the place of refuge can be seen. You mean the mountains? (coughs) It's over. We're there. (coughs) I, I have led them to their home, and I must go back to the desert. You mean alone? Now, now, even now, I hear a voice in the wind. Carry the message to the men of earth. Bring to this new world the message of the old. All beings created in the universe are my brothers. And he that harms my brother harms me. (coughs) Goodbye. Goodbye, boy. You'll be safe now. Goodbye, John. Goodbye. The Martians found him 500 yards from the camp, dead. Now the mist rose, and before us towered the highlands, the tall green mountains and the cool sky. The march was over. Of the 7,000 Martians who started, 900 were alive. They gathered now on the rise of ground and faced the hills. Their thin bodies wavered as they stood, and some dropped to the ground as they stood there. But there was a light of hope in their large, staring eyes. Most of them had died, but they had died on the way home. And now the march was over. Then the patrol planes were spotted on the horizon, and within ten minutes they had landed. The Martians stood silently as the squads piled out and set up the 50 caliber machine guns and the petroleum gel flamethrower. All right, you spiders. Hands up and stay together. Gather in a bunch and don't try anything. Sergeant? Yes, sir. Shoot the first spider that moves and shoot to kill. All right, where's that boy? There was a boy reported. Here I am. Uh, Oh. Are you all right, kid? They hurt you? No, I'm all right. John gave me his water ration. Oh, the leader, huh? Well, I've got a warrant for him. Where is he? There. He's dead. Huh? Oh. Well, just as well. I'd hate to be him in front of a settler's jury. What are you going to do to them? The spiders? See those transport planes coming in? We're going to ship them all back to the reservation where they belong. You can't. You can't do that. What are you talking about, kid? You can't take them back. They're home. John said they were home. You can't take them back. It isn't fair. I won't let you. I won't let you. I won't let you. Hey, let go of me. Let go. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Peel this crazy kid off me. All right, now, kid. Take it easy. (laughs) I must be shocked. Can't believe he's safe. Yeah, I guess that's it. All right, you spiders. Step it up. Move along to those transport planes. It's all over now. You're headed right back to the reservation. (laughs) 
They separated them in groups of 50 and loaded them on the planes. 900 out of 7,000. And soon the first big-bellied ships waddled out on the hard sands and lifted slowly into the air, headed back to the south, flying over the trail of dead and dying who started on the march to the highlands, the march to home. Don't worry about them spiders, kid. We'll take care of them. Come on now, kid. You'll feel better as soon as you get back to civilization. I looked once more at the green mountains towering through the mist. And then, just before the motor raced, I saw John. Crazy John propped up against a dognut bush where the Martians had placed him. The wind from the south gave the wild hair and beard a rippling life. He faced the hills, the home and rest he had promised his brothers as he led them through the wilderness of Mars. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. X-1 was an NBC Radio Network production.